The first bill on the calendar for today is Senate File 20. The clerk will report the bill. Senate File Number 20, an act relating to state government appropriating money for environment, natural resources, and tourism. The first engrossment. I recognize the author of the bill, Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, friends, legislators, Minnesotans, I uh, come here not to praise this bill, nor to bury it. I come here to ask you to vote for it. And I ask you to vote for this bill, this compromise bill, because we are a few days from the end of the fiscal year. We're a few days from when the outdoors that Minnesota enjoys, that Minnesotans enjoy, could be put at risk by closure of state parks. During the regular session, during open committee meetings, closure of the parks was used as a bludgeon, a potential bludgeon to achieve policy. There's not a lot of policy in this bill except for that policy that was same and similar or generally agreed to. Now, before I get into the bill, I want to make sure I thank our House staff, Janelle Taylor and Bob Eliff from House Research, Fiscal Analyst Brad Hagemeyer, Committee Administrator Peter Strohmeyer, and Committee Legislative Assistant Adam Kilpel, Partisan Researchers Molly Peterson and Amy Zipko. I'd also like to thank Ms. Becca Nash and her staff from the Legislative Citizen Commission on Minnesota Resources. I want to thank our conference committee members, Representative Wozlowick, Morrison, Fisher, and Heinzman. This is the Environment and Natural Resources Omnibus Agreement reached with the Senate after weeks of very, very, very difficult negotiations. It deals with a number of agencies, the Department of Natural Resources, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, the Board of Water and Soil Resources, the Minnesota Zoo, Metropolitan Council Water and Parks, Explore Minnesota Tourism, Conservation Corps, and the Science Museum. The joint budget target for the committee was set at $361.98 million from the general fund for FY 2022-23 biennium. That is $30 million over the base. This amount was increased by $3.5 million from the end of session to accommodate additional funding for farm survey day oversight dealing with the, the chronic wasting disease crisis that we have in our state. It was further adjusted for, by $1.591 million for conservation officer salary increases. The total general fund spending is $367 uh, million, which is 35 and some change million above the base. Now, when you're dealing with natural resources, there are a lot of acronyms. EAB, CWD, AIS, PFAS, and this agreement makes advances in each of those. Emerald ash borer and tree planting. Now, we've been dealing with the emerald ash borer crisis for almost 10 years. This is the largest investment, $2.4 million for emerald ash borer response, grants to local communities, $2.5 million for accelerated tree planting. AIS, aquatic invasive species, $850K for AIS prevention grants. I should note, there is no delay in the clean car standard. And in exchange for that, there are no fees for watercraft surcharge, for AIS, or for conservation districts. But instead, because we have a surplus, the additional dollars are prioritized for EAB, AIS, CWD, and PFAS. Instead of a surcharge for aquatic invasive species research, there is $1 million in general fund appropriated to the University of Minnesota to help with research to unlock the keys for grappling with AIS. 
300K for a grant to the Red Lake Nation for dealing with AIS. Chronic wasting disease, $3.5 million to respond outside the fence, $3.5 million in addition for responding inside the fence. With PFAS, PFAs, Representative Wazalek's food packaging ban effective January 1st, 2024. In addition, 600K for the PFAS source evaluation and 500K for identifying potential sources of PFAS contamination. With passage of this bill today and sending to governor immediately, there will be money to help the state parks. There is not a state park fee, but there's money to help state parks. The shutdown planning will stop and the reopening planning and the opening planning and the preparation for the 4th of July holiday will begin. No child left inside. 400,000 for no child left inside. This is something that helps folks who haven't usually been involved in the outdoors to get them in involved. It's a nation leading program. Thank you, Representative Becker Finn for your initiative here. It establishes an outdoor engagement account for the purposes of providing funding. So not just one-time money, but making sure we have an account for the future. Soil health, 1.35 million to the Board of Water and Soil Resources for cover crops and soil health. Two million to the Board of Water and Soil Resources for water storage, keeping water on the land. And right now we need to make sure we're keeping water on the land. It's pretty dry out there. Septic grants, 1.4 million for septic replacement grants. Tourism grants, as we come out of COVID, all of us have events in our communities. And this is $1 million that can help jumpstart those community events to help them promote. And I encourage all of you to make sure you get your communities to apply for those grants. I think they're really needed and very helpful. And I want to thank uh, Representative Christensen and Representative Eklund for that effort. Uh, other items, the agencies get their operating adjustments to fulfill the contracts, and we finally solve that inequity with the MLEA contracts that we've been dealing with for the last, since October. Again, the LCCMR recommendations are restored. The Senate had proposed cutting pollinators. They had proposed cutting microplastics. They had proposed cutting STEM projects. They had proposed cutting uh, funds for the Science Museum. All that is restored. All that is restored. So with this, and again, the urgency of passing it, that 2020 bill that was held up for a year, we need to get that passed and get that money encumbered before the year end. We were able to find project money that had been canceled. And rather than going back to the corpus of the fund, we captured that for initiatives such as wastewater pond optimization helping do research on pristine lakes, chloride pollution, uh, chronic waste and disease research. Again, back to research to help problem solve for the future, not just respond and react, but research for the future, and for lawns to legumes. The 2022 bill for LCCMR is as it was passed by the House. A couple notable policy items. Uh, we protect the GAR. I know Representative Heinzman's excited about that. Uh, uh, we are, uh, it's a uh, very unique species, and now instead of having an unlimited take on GAR, uh, there will be daily possession limits, daily and possession limits for GAR. Carbon sequestration, Representative Lippert, uh, in our forestry efforts, uh, trying to make sure that we promote forestry for carbon sequestration. A couple items that, uh, that were the Senate, the Senate adopted and we had to take a manure provision. I'll talk a little bit about that on third reading. Um, there is an effort to make sure that there are initiatives on the range with Cleveland Cliffs uh, that are supported, the Cohasset OSB board, um, and no more shooting a firearm or an arrow from a motor vehicle at a decoy of a wild animal. So stop that. Um, and with that, that is the policy and the finance for the, uh, this bill, I would ask for your support. I recognize the representative from Crow Wing, Representative Heintzman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
I would motion that this uh, bill be re-referred to the Environment Committee. And I would ask for a roll call. The clerk will report the motion. Oops. Uh, Heinzman moves that Senate file number 20 be re-referred to the Committee on Environment and Natural Resources, Finance and Policy. Roll call having been requested. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I do have a few things I would like to quickly bring up that I think support the argument to re-refer this bill back to committee. We did have an informational hearing, and I thank Chair Hansen for that. It was nice to get a rundown on what was involved, and uh, we had an opportunity to speak to a few of those issues. But unfortunately, many of these new provisions that we see jumping into the bill, and I'll use uh, Representative Hansen's term, that uh, jumped in, it's seemingly in the dark of night, negotiated by a very small group of folks. We aren't entirely sure who was in the room. I certainly wasn't there as the minority lead. Uh, but after conference committees went away, these provisions suddenly found their way in. New provisions at MPCA requiring MPCA to do analysis of programs. Uh, new provisions at MPCA that prohibit them from imposing uh, some restrictions on agriculture and, uh, and uh, a number of provisions that also showed up affecting DNR. I don't know necessarily that I'm in support or against these provisions. I'm probably going to support them, but I would have liked an opportunity to hear more about them, and I really believe the place to do that is in committee. So that is uh, my reasoning. and. Uh, I hope that members would support my motion. Further discussion on the motion to re-refer the bill to the Committee on Environment and Natural Resource Finance and Policy. Further discussion. Representative Hansen. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I would ask members to oppose this motion. Uh, the provisions that were referenced, uh, a number of provisions came from the Senate. Um, and uh, again, I mentioned that it was very difficult negotiating with the Senate. Um, sometimes you had to accommodate plans from the Senate that would force you to meet at night. So um, I think we, the provisions from the House, I think the only thing that appeared uh, at the end that had not passed uh, at the end and it was not accepted was a provision on uh, allowing rifles uh, statewide, and that had passed neither body, so therefore it was not accepted. But other than that, there was uh, something from either body, and then the same and similars uh, with the policy. And if you look, uh, the Senate probably received more of those financial and policy items uh, than the House did. But again, it is important to get this deal done. It is important to save our parks. It is important to provide certainty to the state employees who work in the outdoors for all of us to make sure this happens. And we do provide essential funding for EAB, CWD, AIS, and PFAS. I'd ask you to oppose the motion to re-refer. The representative from Traverse, Representative Backer. Yeah, Mr. Speaker and members, I stand to support the motion. Um, you know, we heard the chair talk about there's a lot of important things. What we've not been able to do is hear from every part of the state. I know up in northwestern Minnesota, they have different um, geography up there, just like on my end of the state, which is the western part. We go down to the south, it's different. And so when issues are brought in up, that's why we have committees, so we can learn from all aspects um, how it's going to affect. I know, for example, drainage law in my district where basically you can st um, stand out in the middle of my area and you can see a deer four or five miles away because we are so flat because we start the Red River Valley. Those uniqueness needs to be vetted completely. And when you only have a few people put together a bill, 
they just don't know every aspect of the state. I'm not familiar with all the stuff up in the Iron Range. I've never lived there. Just like I would suspect the representatives from the Iron Range probably don't understand the, every aspect of West Central Minnesota that borders the Dakotas and, um, and the Red River Valley. So I stand to support this motion just for that reason. Good, our founding fathers wanted these things to be vetted. And we've not seen that in the House. We've heard a lot of times about agencies. Um, us in the minority has been, um, a lot of our bills have not been brought in up and heard. We also have good ideas. So this needs to go back to the committee and I support this motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Further discussion? Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would just go on to uh, speak to support this motion to re-refer by pointing out how difficult this process has been underneath COVID and all of the restrictions here in the Minnesota House of Representatives. Uh, the leadership here in the House has, I think, attempted to try and create a process where input would give uh, our constituents around the entire state an opportunity. But unfortunately, it's been extremely limited. And we've talked a lot about process over the last few months and how difficult that has been. And then once we've gone past uh, our normal session and the process that was there to work through the differences, the conference committee process, that too is now gone. And it was under these new circumstances that this bill was negotiated and why I'm asking to re-refer. Normally that conference committee would be there of members uh, who are very clear on the differences around the state and at least those members in that conference committee would have an opportunity to speak to the changes as they may come from the Senate. Or as negotiations might move forward as we propose ideas and bring them to those negotiations, that process is gone. Now we have this, uh, I don't know what you even call it, where now we no longer have members uh, allowed to participate from the minority and these new provisions that have found their way into the bill, uh, maybe they're great, but we, like I said, haven't had the opportunity to evaluate them. There hasn't been opportunity for the public to weigh in. Some have described the process, a process that comes to a tribunal of sorts. I haven't visited the tribunal, so I wouldn't even know what that looks like. So I would suggest and continue to ask members support the motion to re-refer back to the Environment Committee. See no further discussion. The clerk will take the roll. Members, please vote. I'll give it a few more seconds. Okay, all right. Uh, will the clerk please call the names of those members who have not voted yet? <clears throat> Bernardi. Bernardi. Christensen. Christensen. Franzen. Thank you, 
Franzen votes yes. What was that? Franzen. Franzen votes yes. Franzen, aye. Frazier. Frazier votes no. Yes. Frazier, no. Frederick. They won't. Frederick. Frederick votes no. Frederick, no. Grunhagen. Grunhagen, aye. Grunhagen, aye. Hamilton. Hamilton votes aye. Hamilton, aye. Houseman. Houseman, no. Houseman, no. Hollins. Hollins, no. Hollins, no. Keeler. Keeler. Kegel. Kegel, no. McDonald. McDonald. Moran. Moran, no. Moran, no. Morrison. Morrison, no. Morrison, no. Murphy. Murphy, no. Murphy, no. O'Driscoll. O'Driscoll, I. O'Driscoll, I. O'Driscoll, I. Pier Pearson. <laughs> Pearson, I. Pearson, I. Sandstead. Sandstead, no. Sandstead, no. Scott. Scott votes yes. Scott, I. Swazinski. Swazinski, I. Swazinski, I. Thompson. 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 Thompson, no. Thompson, no. Zhang Jie. Zhang Jie, no. Zhang Jie, no. Clerk will close the roll. Bernardi, no. Bernardi, no. You got to add one. There being 62 ayes and 68 nays, the motion does not prevail. There are amendments at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Heinzman moves to amend Santa file number 20, the first engrossment. The amendment is coded A2. To the author of the amendment, Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My amendment is pretty straightforward. Uh, the appropriation of this section is available upon certification that the commissioner, by the commissioner, that, that the proposed rules published in the state register December 21, 2020, relating to vehicle greenhouse gas emission standards uh, are withdrawn and that the commissioner long, no longer intends to pursue adoption. So obviously that's been a, uh, yes, I just read the amendment. <laughs> Uh, obviously, there's been a contentious discussion about this issue, and uh, hopefully during the debate and uh, discussion on this motion, we can uh, have a th thorough opportunity to uh, get to some of the facts. Discussion to the A2 amendment. Representative Hansen. Thank you, members. Uh, the deal is done. This decision has been made. Um, the amendment, I'd ask you to vote against the amendment. Uh, we have to get this bill done. Uh, we have just a few days left. We need to get the bill done. Adopting this amendment will send it back over to the Senate to an uncertain future. So I'd ask for a no vote on the amendment. The representative uh, from Olmstead, Representative Qualm. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Minnesota is a sovereign state equal to every other state. When federal regulations are passed, we have a voice through our elected officials to subjugate Minnesota to another state's bureaucracy voids the voice and authority of our citizens through the vote. It's undemocratic and makes Minnesota subservient to another state. I find this abhorrent. I support this amendment. 
to the representative from Sherborne, Representative Novotny. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I would like to uh, correct Representative Quam uh, in his thing. We are not equal to all other states. We're equal to some states, but we're better than most. <laughs> the other thing I'd like to point out in my continuing theme of we can't make it up fast enough, during the recreational marijuana bill, I pointed out that we don't have enough electricity if we use all the grow lights that we were talking about being available and being used for the, uh, the uh, growing during the recreational marijuana. And I had made reference to the fact that you're not going to be able to plug your Tesla in. So what does Newsweek come out with an article with yesterday? California, the shining light on the hill, is encouraging people to monitor when they charge their electric cars. Because as they're tearing down hydroelectric plants and going to their standards, even they admit that they don't have enough power to support their plants and to charge all their cars. Members, I urge you to vote for the Heinzman Amendment. Uh, the representative from Traverse, Representative Backer. Mr. Speaker, members, I rise to support this amendment. One of the things in our, um, the district I represent, again, that's on the western part of Minnesota, outside of emergency powers, this is the number one, number two issue after emergency powers. We are a very ag-related um, district. Just to give you a little information about my district, from north to south is 120 miles, Kitty Corner is 84 miles, and east to west is 67 miles. So we put on tremendous amount of miles. I heard, a, especially in the wintertime, if any of you have any dealings with batteries, batteries do not like the cold. Um, for example, um, I'll use a story of what Representative Polston shared with me. He has a constituent in Wadena that in the wintertime, he travels from the Wadena area to Clearwater. For those of you who are on the western part of Minnesota, west of Clearwater, there's this a big truck stop out there. And um, he hopes that one of the plug-ins will be available. He hopes in the wintertime, because he cannot go from Wadena to Minneapolis and back without being plugged in. And um, so we don't have the technology just for us to drive. Um, Mr. Speaker, point of order. State your point of order. It's a little noisy in here. Could you please if, um, direct the other members to take their conversation? Members, if we can quiet the chamber, please. and. Take your conversations either to the alcoves or outside the chamber. Thank you. Uh, Representative Backer. I, I was corrected. That was personal privilege. Thank you. Um, but thank you. I appreciate that um, and so forth. So just the communicate, uh, just communicating from a person's district to the metro area or across the, the state does not make sense with the current technology. Plus, if we look at individuals, students who are graduating and getting new jobs, for example, I will use my daughter as an example. Um, she just graduated with a pharmacist major from NDSU. Um, she has a job in um, Representative Keel's district. Um, but right now, until she finds a home in Crookston, which we yesterday talked about the difficulty of the housing market, and um, my wife and I, my daughter, are experiencing trying to find her a working with her to find a home to purchase, because you can't find nothing to rent in Crookston right now. But up in Grand Forks, East Grand Forks, Crookston area, it gets 20, 10, 20, 30 below zero. And what happens during that time, batteries just don't work. So we cannot be working on California emissions, and we definitely cannot have an agency to determine this. So. Um, I could go on and on about the EMS challenges when um, um, you come on a scene with battery vehicles, which I've been on, and the amount of water it takes out to put a, out a fire on a battery vehicle compared to a car, but I won't because um, I want to be respectful of other members' time. So these are just some of the reasons it don't make sense 
to follow California standards and also technology that's not up to snuff for Minnesota weather, along with farming, agriculture, and us folks who have to commute so many miles in um, west central Minnesota and throughout the states. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The representative from Roseau, Representative Burkle. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Um, I'll con concur with uh, Representative Backer's uh, assessment of cold weather in northwestern Minnesota. Uh, I can assure you that members uh, in northwestern Minnesota aren't going to appreciate uh, charging batteries in 40 below, where I'm at. Um, but uh, raising the cost of new cars for Minnesotans by $1,000 per at least, if not more, and dictating to auto dealers, especially along the border where I live, um, what cars they must keep on their lots, mandating what folks do. Uh, it seems like that's what the DFL, just it's the fallback position, mandates. So putting unelected California bureaucrats in charge of our policies in Minnesota is the wrong answer, the wrong, the wrong avenue. And um, I'm, I'm, I would urge you to vote green on this amendment. Thanks. The representative from Isanti, Representative Johnson. Mr. Speaker, members, I also rise in favor of the Heitzman Amendment. California is a lot different than Minnesota. In western Minnesota and northwestern Minnesota, the ground is so flat, you pour a glass of wa water on the ground, it spreads out for a mile. California, they're on the ocean with westerly winds. The ocean's on the west side. Guess what? They have a huge mountain range that holds the lower level air in. We don't have that here. Now, California doesn't have uh, polar vortexes coming in with 30 to 40 below weather. We went through that a couple years ago where we actually had our natural gas in some of our communities turned off at 40 below temperatures in order to keep the power plants running. That's not good. That was caused some serious issues in the Representative Erickson's district in the city of Princeton. They literally turned off their heating gas. Now, we don't need a bunch of uh, legislators from California telling us what to do. We've seen the mess in California. It's almost as bad as the mess in Minneapolis, done by the city council. Met Council had to cancel their electric buses because, the char because it was so cold, the chargers melted. They didn't charge the buses. That's going to work real good for the cars sitting in the garage in the pole sheds, start melting and causing a fire. Temperatures make difference. Ge geographical locations make difference. What works in California might not work in Minneapolis or in Minnesota. Just like things that might work in Minneapolis don't work in Baudet. We're vastly different areas. We have to look at the whole state as a whole. And to have the legislatures from California telling Minnesotans what to do is absolutely insane. It's giving up our responsibility to a different state. Minnesota is a sovereign state, one of 50 in this country. California can do what they want to do, but in Minnesota, this body should tell us what to do, not the legislature in California. Please support the Heitzman Amendment. The representative from Hennepin, Representative Robbins. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, members. I'll be brief. I support the Heinzman Amendment, and I urge everyone to do so. Members, the argument that was made against this was that if we adopt this amendment, it will blow up the deal, and then, you know, everything will unravel. Well, there's an amendment coming up on the next bill that I'm assuming most of my friends on the other side will support that could also blow up the deal. So if you're worried about blowing up the deal as your reason for not supporting this, I just don't think that's the best argument. So 
I encourage you members, this is important. This will cost all of our taxpayers money as they look to replace cars. Cars, as you know, inflation on cars is already through the roof. This will only exacerbate it. And it's not a short-term problem. It's because we are having trouble with the supply chain on chips. We're having trouble with the supply chain on other elements. And this is expected to be a pretty significant long-term problem on inflation in the car market. So we are exacerbating that by doing this, members. And so if you plan to support the later amendment that could blow up a deal, um, there is no reason why you shouldn't also be willing to support this. Thank you. The representative from Aiken, Representative Lewick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, my uh, uh, fellow uh, legislators made a good job of uh, identifying the issues with uh, the California car standards. Uh, so I won't belabor the, the point, but the follow on uh, with the uh, previous uh, uh, speaker's comment that uh, Chair Hansen made uh, probably a just an outstanding argument uh, for actually passing this amendment. And that is, if we do this, it's going to have to go back to the Senate. And uh, so far, uh, I see a lot of great things that uh, the Senate has put into this bill uh, that are in the, to the benefit of uh, Minnesotans. And I see a lot of unnecessary, unwarranted things that the Senate stood fast and made sure it weren't included with the bill. So that's just another reason to put this uh, amendment on is let's uh, let's send it back to the Senate and uh, and uh, see if we can improve this bill a little more. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The representative from Douglas, Representative Franzen. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. And I too rise in support of the Heinzman Amendment. Uh, briefly touching on what Representative um, Backer said regarding the fires from electric vehicle fires. Um, so there was an article, June 20th, 2021, that touched on this. And this the first paragraph reads, it's the kind of blaze that veteran Chief Palmer Buck of the Woodlands Township Fire Department in suburban Houston compared to a birthday, a trick birthday candle. It took, I think the article reads seven hours. Yep, seven hours putting out this fire. So they would think that they, they got the fire out, it started up again, and they used 28,000 gallons of water. <clears throat> that same volume of water serves an average American home for nearly two years. <clears throat> Article says, by comparison, a typical fire involving an internal combustion car can often be quickly put out within approximately 300 gallons of water. All discussions that we should have had through the legislative process so that we can hear public input. We can talk to our fire departments. The article also says that training, uh, there's a lack of training in this area when it comes to the electric uh, vehicles. So that is also something, something to think about, making sure that our, our uh, cities are well equipped. Now, back to control your own destiny or somebody else will. Members, on the, on the topic of clean energy cars, California is driving our destiny all without the legislative process. If we had a legislative process to discuss this, we could then discuss the human impacts of electric cars. Members, those car batteries are not made with union workers, they are made from and mined from slave labor and child labor. Children as young as seven and sometimes even young as four years old digging in the mine for cobalt and other precious metals, harming their own health so that we can create a California energy first policy here in Minnesota. Members control we have to control our own destiny, which part of that controlling our own destiny means bringing legislation back through the legislation, legislative process. Governor Walls and the administration 
They are not the legislative branch. It is the, they are part of the executive branch. Branch. We here in the chamber have the ability to move this topic through if that's the way um, you believe Minnesota wants to go. But I can tell you what, um, people are not exactly excited that California is driving this, um, this bill um, over to us. So I want to just thank you for your time. These are some things to think about as you make this vote on this amendment. Ask yourself, do you want uh, human rights? Do you want to stand up for human rights? Or are you going to uh, vote for uh, increasing child labor and slave labor so that we can have a clean energy car mandate here in Minnesota? Thank you. Further discussion? Representative Heinzman. There's more discussion, yes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, I, I brought this motion forward for a number of reasons. Oh, yes. I'd also request, Mr. Speaker, a roll call. Roll call having been requested, seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, so there's a, a number of things that I think we need to talk about before we go to a vote on this issue. And number one is, I think, a, a real messaging issue that I have with how this whole discussion has been brought to the people of Minnesota. When Democrats have discussed California's emission standards coming to Minnesota, California isn't messaged at all. The Walls administration has been pushing Minnesota clean cars, as if Minnesota is somehow participating in their own process or creating their own standards. That is completely false. We only have two options, okay? You either can do as we're currently doing here in Minnesota. We're opted into the federal uh, emission standards or any state can opt out and opt into as the Walls administration is pushing into California's standards. That's completely disingenuous by those that would say, Minnesota clean cars. Why would you do that? I, I don't understand why anyone who supports this would want to disassociate themselves with the reality of whose standard this is. This is California's standards we're trying to bring to Minnesota. I have a real problem with that. We should at least be able to use uh, the words that are accurate when describing what we're doing. This is not Minnesota cars. This is California's emission standards. As I was uh, doing some work trying to figure out, you know, exactly what this does and what's happening in California, I was uh, shocked to see, you know, the process there is actually, and by there I mean in California, is about to adopt new standards. So that process begins in, uh, let's see, just a, a year's time. And then their revised standards will then be mandatory in 2024. Does anybody in this chamber know what those standards are going to be? No, nobody here can tell you what they are. If you've been watching California, you might, you might have noticed that they have recently been forced to adopt a standard outside of the process we're describing that prohibits the sale of some internal combustion powered vehicles. Well, that's not yet a part of the, the current discussion, but who's to say that isn't there in 2024? The governor and Commissioner Laura Bishop at MPCA have started this process and quite honestly, they couldn't answer that question, what are we gonna be looking at in 2024? But we're just gonna go ahead and yield our responsibility as the legislature apparently to decide whether or not this is something that is good for Minnesota. And as we've heard already in a number of different comments from Republicans today, there's no question that our 
climate is going to affect this equipment differently than it affects batteries, for example, in California. They have a moderate climate. We can, we can at times see a polar vortex with temperatures between 30 and 40 below zero. What are the people of greater Minnesota going to do if rules change and limits their ability to access the vehicle that will get them to and from wherever they need to go safely? We have no assurance of that under this process currently pushed by the Walls administration, MPCA, and Democrats. That's lunacy. You know, even as this discussion was moving to an administrative law judge, issue after issue came up in MPCA's uh, arguments as to why we should be moving forward. Much of their data related to how many EV vehicles were available across the state came from, I think, cars.com. I mean, I'm sorry, but the information that we are using to make a determination on something this big should be verifiable, something that all of us can point to and say, well, okay, that's, that's exactly where we are in the state of Minnesota. We can agree. We also found out they can't do math. There's been a few discussions over the last week as it relates to math. I guess math is hard. But if you can't get a decimal point in the right place, guess what? I'm sorry. I don't think that the agency has the credibility to push something like this forward when we can't get some very simple things straight as it relates to the potential health impact, which is a part of why this process goes to an administrative law judge. We can't even get the math right, let alone our sources for information, verifiable facts. So those are, those are a few things that I think are absolutely critical. And, and uh, to Chair Hansen's point that this would upset the deal, I can guarantee you, Chair Hansen, the Senate would take this amendment. <laughs> this would not upset the deal. I think we all know that. I'm also seeing that there's a few out there saying today that this would uh, potentially cause Minnesota's, uh, let me get this right so I don't misquote, ruling out clean cars rules would save Minnesotans tens of millions of dollars. I mean, are you kidding me? Absolutely not. This is going to cost Minnesotans this is going to cost Minnesota businesses to push these standards, California's standards, down our throats. This is going to increase the cost of vehicles around the state. If someone can show me the math otherwise, I would love to see it. Because everything that we see points to increased costs as dealers are forced to carry inventory that their consumer base does not find desirable does not fit their family's needs as it relates to safety, reliability. This technology is going to get better. That's a good thing. But trying to force it through mandates as opposed to allowing the market to meet those needs and expectations is the wrong way to go. My amendment gives us the opportunity to back up and continue allow Consumers to drive this. Consumers get to decide what's the best fit without having to pay more in case an EV vehicle doesn't fit their needs. Because that's what Democrats are doing by voting against my amendment today, is they're voting, Democrats would be voting to increase the cost of vehicles in the state of Minnesota. So, I would continue to ask for a green vote. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the A2 amendment.
Members, please vote. Give it a few more seconds here, and then we're going to have the clerk call on those members that haven't voted yet. It's pretty good, 16. Okay. All right. Will the clerk please call the names of those members who have not voted yet? Bernardi. Bernardi, no. Bernardi, no. Bo. Bo votes aye. Bo, aye. Frederick. Frederick votes no. Frederick, no. Grunhagen. Grunhagen, aye. Grunhagen, aye. Hamilton. Hamilton votes aye. Hamilton, aye. Houseman. Houseman, no. Houseman, no. Hollins. Collins. Howard. Howard, no. McDonald. <clears throat> McDonald. O'Driscoll. O'Driscoll votes aye. O'Driscoll aye. Pearson. Oh. Pearson votes aye. Pearson aye. Sandstead. Sandstead, no. Sandstead, no. Scott. Scott votes aye. Scott aye. Swazinski. Swazinski aye. Swazinski aye. Zhang J. Zhang J, no. Zhang J, no. The clerk will close the roll. There being 63 ayes and 68 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment, There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Novotny moves to amend Senate file number 20, the first engrossment. The amendment is coded A3. To the member from Sherburn, the author of the amendment, Representative Novotny. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, before I start out, I will ask for a roll call on this. A roll call has been requested. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Novotny. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This uh, bill is just an opportunity to let the members of this House show their support for the conservation officers that represent uh, us out in the field and protect our natural resources. Uh, every year, every legislation, there's uh, new addition, additional responsibilities and things that we expect the COs to do. Uh, just the bill that we have here is several more things that they need to do. We ask the COs to do so many things, and we need to give them the support. Now, a little bit about myself. Some people have uh, recently tweeted out that uh, they think I'm privileged. and. And as I think about that, I, I do think I am privileged. I have had the privilege of knowing conservation officers since I was a little kid. And I had the privilege of knowing a conservation officer by the name of Wayne Forsythe. And I will, I will tell you that my decision to go into law enforcement may have something to do with watching him blow up a beaver dam when I was about eight years old. It was pretty cool. We expect the conservation officers to be jacks of all trade and the Lone Rangers. By that I mean they're patrolling your lakes and your rivers and your national and state forest. They are on their own and they do it in, in remote locations where they, they have to use their wits. I urge you to vote green and make sure that we keep the staffing levels at the DNR with the conservation officers at our current levels, and we do not allow those levels to go below 
what they are now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Further discussion to the A3 amendment. The representative from Dakota, Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And members, I'd ask for a no vote on this amendment. Um, the best way to support conservation officers is to vote for this bill. Dispense with the amendment and vote for the bill because the bill has fair pay for conservation officers that we have been fighting for. And in my discussion with conservation officers, it's what they've been looking for and that they've been waiting for for too long. So voting for this bill is the vote for the conservation officers that are working for Minnesotans and that need to keep working on July 1st, July 2nd, July 3rd, July 4th for Minnesotans and to protect our, our outdoors. Voting for this amendment sends the bill back over to the Senate and an uncertain future. So vote no on the Novotny Amendment. Further discussion? To the author of the amendment, uh, Representative, wait a minute. Oh, I'm sorry, Representative Johnson, you did stand up to speak. Uh, Representative Johnson. Mr. Speaker, members, I do support this amendment. We have some great conservation officers. I've worked with many of them over my career in law enforcement. And unfortunately, we lost one earlier this year. These men and women, they're out there working alone, out, out, in the, out in the field, and at least in greater Minnesota, the law enforcement community back them up whenever they're needed. They're highly trained and, and uh, very much needed in our communities. I don't want to see their numbers be de depleted. Yes, we have the provision in this bill to get their pay where it belongs. It's still not high enough. Our off, and that, and it's go, that goes with every single peace officer in this state. They're underpaid. But I do know that that language is still being worked on to make sure things are done properly. Um, that is going to be probably in the final bill that we do to get the exact language done correctly to make sure every peace officer that's licensed that's a state employee is going to be paid equally and paid properly. But I want to make sure, with it, like with this amendment, that we don't cut the number of our conservation officers. To be honest, we don't have enough yet. There's enough to get by, but we could still use more. Please support this amendment. The representative from Crow Wing, Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just want to quickly make the point, I know that uh, Chair Hansen suggested that sending any changes over would uh, create an uncertain future for this bill. Once again, there is no question where Republicans stand in this chamber and in the other chamber, the Senate, on their support for law enforcement. There is no question that Senate Republicans would agree with the House if this amendment goes on. The Novotny, Novotny Amendment is our opportunity in the House to say yes and support our law enforcement community in a very meaningful way. It will not upset any kind of uh, future place for this bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The representative from Aiken, Representative Lewick. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I certainly speak in favor of Representative Novotny's amendment. Um, yes, uh, there's a significant uh, improvement on uh, bringing the uh, conservation officers' salaries uh, uh, up to snuff. It's unfortunate uh, that uh, they were left behind uh, here for uh, a portion of time. Uh, and I just want to reiterate uh, the importance of our law enforcement team, particularly in rural Minnesota. Um, they're definitely jack of all trades. Uh, and frequently, you know, when 
a lot of folks they get a little edgy if there isn't somebody there within two to three minutes of a 911 call. Well, where uh, where most of us live uh, uh, in uh, outstate Minnesota, uh, it's significantly longer than that for anybody to show up. And regardless of whether it's a traffic accident, uh, a disturbance, a heart attack, uh, just a, a call for help, quite often the first vehicle in the yard or up to the, uh, the scene is going to be a conservation officer in a pickup truck. Uh, before the state highway patrol gets there, before county sheriff gets there, quite often, uh, uh, even before a first responder who may just live down the road a couple miles, uh, that jumps in their car and races to the scene uh, to provide assistance. So this business of uh, not keeping that complement of conservation officers uh, at, at absolutely uh, full strength uh, year in year out is is critically important for uh, for particularly for Greater Minnesota, uh, and we've got uh, continuing uh, drain on our law enforcement across the northern part of the state with the antics and uh, I'm not going to call them demonstrators, uh, but protesters, mayhem, rioting, destruction of property, threatening people. Uh, they're the peacekeepers. They're the folks that get right in the middle of this uh, and, you know, ensure that we have uh, uh, a level of uh, public safety uh, as uh, uh, we work toward completion of line three across uh, 14 counties in northern Minnesota. So, uh, again, as Representative Heinzman spoke to, uh, I guess the only one that fears sending this back to the Senate is uh, Chair Hansen, because uh, they might improve this bill a little more. They already made good progress. So uh, I certainly uh, uh, support a green vote on, on this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The representative from Itasca, Representative Igo. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Um, I just wanted to rise to talk a little bit about what COs are in the Northland West, what conservation officers are. Um, I speak for many of us, I think, when we don't even see them as law enforcement officials. Your CO is your neighborhood community watch. Um, I'm going to tell a few stories about that um, and just kind of what they mean to our communities. Um, you know, there was a time where I was driving some of the rural back roads of my county and I uh, broke down because an alternator went out. The first person there was a CO to sit there and wait while I was working on my car and luckily my dad was able to show up with an alternator and I was able to put it in on the side of the road. and but she was there to stand there with me and you know, make sure everything's okay and set up some markers and, and call it in so no one else would show up. Um, another way I wanna talk about what, what conservation officers are to the Northland is, and I don't know, I, maybe not everyone thinks this way, but when I see a CO's boat coming across the lake at me, I get excited, because that means I'm gonna find out where the fish are. Because <laughs> I tell you what, they're better guides than, than most of them up there, and if any guides are listening to us right now, I apologize, they probably agree with me though. They know all the hunting and fishing spots, and they're there to educate about how to use our outdoors properly and, and be responsible stewards of our environment. This is a great amendment. So Representative Novotny, thank you for bringing this forward. I hope we can support this, because our COs need our support. They do a very tough job, but they offer a great service to all of our communities. To the author of the amendment, Representative Novotny. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, uh, Chair, for speaking about your support for the DNR officers. And uh, I hope that keeps up. I, I appreciate the raise that they have in this bill. Um, and help me uh, pay tribute to the my childhood hero and uh, vote in support of the CEOs of the state of Minnesota. Vote green. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the A3 amendment. <laughs> Members, this is your chance to vote.
couple more seconds, and then we're gonna have the clerk call the roll. Let's see if we can get this down to even lower number. Pretty good. Almost forgot to vote myself. See? All right. Uh, will the clerk please call the names of those members who have not voted yet? <laughs> members, if you can please mute yourself, that would be appreciated. We can uh, hear you over the speakers in the chamber. Bo. Bo votes aye. Bo aye. Frederick. Frederick votes no. Frederick no. Grunhagen. Grunhagen aye. Grunhagen aye. Hamilton. Hamilton votes aye. Hamilton aye. Houseman. Houseman no. Houseman no. Hollins. Hollins no. Hollins no. McDonald. McDonald, Pearson. Pearson votes aye. Pearson aye. Sandstead. Sandstead votes no. Sandstead no. Scott. Scott votes aye. Scott aye. Swazinski. Swazinski aye. Swazinski aye. Zhang J. Zhang Jay, no. Zhang no. Jay, no. McDonald, aye. McDonald, aye. Have all members that wish to vote uh, voted? Okay, the clerk will close the roll. There being 63 ayes and 70 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. There are no <laughs> further amendments at the desk. Third reading. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. The, I'm sorry, the clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, Senate file number 20. Third reading. <clears throat> Discussion. All right, Representative Heintzman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just have a couple of questions and uh, hopefully uh, Chair Hansen would yield. He will yield, Representative Heintzman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So Chair Hansen, uh, over the course of session, there were some provisions that were in and out. And of course, the bill has changed massively from the time it left this chamber and uh, went to negotiations. Uh, after, uh, the, after our members in the conference committee had some opportunity to weigh in. But uh, a number of things that I thought were very much mutually shared uh, issues or, or uh, issues that I thought we had some real agreement on are, are some issues relative to a pretty important Minnesota company, Federal Ammunition, being one of them. And in committee, I heard many of your members, as well as my members, speak up and support this. And in fact, I think that the provision went to the General Register uh, in one way or another. So I have a pretty good idea where the House stands, and I, I know for sure where the Senate stood on this issue. I know that there was broad consensus on this as well, and that we were in a great spot to uh, work on something for muzzleloader uh, hunting here in Minnesota, time-honored tradition. And uh, mysteriously, that provision, along with a few others, is gone. And we're quite often talking about uh, how important the outdoors is to us as sportsmen and women. And this is something that I heard from many uh, groups around the state. Uh, something, like I said, had broad bipartisan support. So if you could help us understand what happened to that particular provision, and I have some questions about some others after this one. To the author of the bill, Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and to Representative Heinzman. Um, the conference committee and working group process was unique, so to speak. 
Uh, I want to follow up on Representative Backer's question because uh, during the debate, uh, I actually listened to his presentation uh, before adjournment, and there was a Boys to Sioux watershed uh, proposal, and we actually there was a Senate provision, and we offered to take that over and over and over again, and the Senate refused to take their own position. Kind of like uh, two years ago when we had a provision on banning insecticides uh, on wildlife management areas that had passed both the House and the Senate, and we tried to move it and move it and move it, and the Senate refused to take the language that had been same and similar. So with the muzzle loader provision, which was a House provision, it was added on the floor, it was not in the Senate, there were a number of firearms provisions that we accepted, and there were a number of firearms provisions that we did not accept. If you look at the overall tally, and I think Representative Lewick actually referenced this, um, you've got a lot of House environment positions that were not accepted, and a number of Senate positions that were. So the balance we were actually told during the conference committee working group process that every DFL policy provision was controversial. Every DFL House provision was controversial. By virtue of it being, I guess, a House DFL policy provision. So there was precedent in the process for each body not taking provisions that were passed in their own body. In a compromise bill, you win some and you lose some. And we need to get the bill passed. We needed to come to an agreement, therefore we did. Representative Heintzman. If Chair Hansen would continue to yield. He will yield, Representative Heintzman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Chair Hanson, I'm, of course, hearing a different story on the other side. I'm hearing that uh, there was uh, similar uh, difficulties coming from the, the Senate negotiation. And uh, one of the other things that was, was brought up, and I know a big priority to a lot of deer hunters around the state, was portable deer stands on wildlife management areas. And that, too, was uh, a uh, a position that was brought forward in a bill. I think uh, Representative Burkle had that, and it found its way to the General Register, maybe Representative Eklund's bill, and uh, gone after negotiations. We thought that it would surely be there, and deer hunters were talking to me and talking about a number of these provisions, along with the federal ammunition issue and muzzle loaders. And everybody was convinced it was going to be in the final, final package. So you had mentioned, Chair Hansen, that there was a number of firearms provisions that were rejected. That was a House position. And this is obviously one that's very specific to deer hunters and, and uh, not a part of maybe the uh, issues that came forward relative to the firearms issues. So maybe you could explain to us how this particular one, super important to deer hunters around the state, uh, didn't make it across the line. And, and the buck stops at the chair's desk, so that's why I'm asking uh, you, Chair Hanson, to help me understand why you weren't able to get that across the line, because it was really important to, I can include myself, us, deer hunters around the state, be able to have that option to uh, have a portable deer stand. Representative Hanson. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and Representative Heinzman. We felt it was more important to protect the health of the deer We're in the middle of a crisis relating to chronic wasting disease. We had in the House, I think, eight to 10 policy provisions, all rejected by the Senate, every one of them. Moratorium on new deer farm registrations. First was brought up in the Minnesota House in 2017. If we had passed that then, we wouldn't be in the mess we're in now. So if it's a choice between deer stands and deer, we'll take the deer because you can sit in the stand all you want if those deer are sick. 
Good luck. 450,000 Minnesotans deer hunt. And if the deer are sick because the disease is being spread, you can sit in the stand all you want. You can have all the guns you want. It won't do any good. So we prioritize the health of the deer because the health of the deer leads to the health of the hunting community. It's it lonely in that stand when no deer come by or if they wobble by. But not one policy provision. Not one policy provision. So what does the Minnesota legislature usually do? Throws money at it. And I'm very skeptical of the conclusion that we have for co-management. Have members ever had to work for two bosses at the same time? We needed that policy. I see Representative Drazkowski's up. One of the provisions he's fought for many years is for the repeal of antler point restrictions. That is in the bill. Representative Drazkowski, that is in the bill. Something I didn't want to take. Something that I passed 10 years ago. There aren't a lot of winners in this bill except Minnesotans because the deal got done. Now I can go through each of these policy provisions that the House didn't get, but I won't. Because if it's a choice on whether we are going to protect how we protect the hunting opportunities, we have to have the health of the deer herd. The prions last in the soil. They're brought up by the plant. The deer eat the plants. We've invested in the research that tells us that. We're putting more money into the research for that. So we have to respond and we have to react. And we felt that was more important than the deer stands. Uh, Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Chair Hansen. And while I would like to accept that it was simply a choice between two things, I think what we're hearing today was a false choice. If deer hunters around the state, and this isn't what this entire bill is about, but just these questions are centering around some of these things, are asking for help on these particular issues, we had a powerful opportunity to work on some things that people like when they're out in the field. The truth is, is that Republicans and Democrats are working together to solve the problems on CWD. This is not a one-sided issue. There's been a, a process in place that restricted opportunity to really debate this issue thoroughly as bills and ideas came forward in committee. You know, I hope next year we have a better process in place where the public can engage and those stakeholders who or have concerns on these issues can weigh in. That really didn't happen this year. And I'm glad that you brought up the CWD issue, Chair, issue, Chair Hansen, because we can work together on this. And we have. We've been working with the University of Minnesota to bring forward uh, live testing. And I think uh, well, he's not on the floor right now, but a number of our members have proposed making sure that the research is there to back up our policy. The science has to be there to back up our decision making on that issue. And in many cases, there's more questions than answers. And in the meantime, there's a lot of finger pointing when we could be working together. And one of those issues was portable deer stands on wildlife management areas, something that we could agree on and while the, the story is being painted today, I can see, you know, kind of where this is headed. The discussion is going to be that the Senate screwed this all up. But, you know, the Senate actually helped work through a number of very controversial positions that were in the House language, language as it left. And thankfully, a lot of those things didn't come back. 
what we have today is actually a pretty good bill, and I'll talk more about that at the end of this debate, but I'm going to support this bill. It's a pretty good bill. But these were some things that uh, I wanted to bring up, and I thank you for your answers, Chair Hansen. The representative from Traverse, Representative Backer. Mr. Speaker, members, um, probably the greatest thing um, in this bill that concerns my constituents, and we've talked about it before, is that there is zero language to delay the California emissions thing. Um, I know we had an amendment out here. It's on the floor. It's, it's disturbing that it didn't pass because it's a common sense amendment. Um, you know, for example, even though I have identical twin brother, we're not the same. Minnesota is not the same as California. So that, that's a concern. Also what's a concern is in committee, we heard a lot of things about water gremlin this year um, and what it looked like that the MP, MPCA did not do their duties. You know, um, one of the interesting things in the district I represent is um, the landowners, um, farmers who are excellent stewards of the land, best in this nation to take care of those resources are constantly, um, maybe not constantly is the right words, but frequently gone after by agencies and held to extremely high standards over and beyond what is reasonable in some situations, in several situations. I talked about one incidence here um, during the Ag Bill, I think last Saturday, about a farmer, or farmers in Big Stone County. But it doesn't go back on the agencies. Um, we had another situation, um, Senator Westrom and myself here, um, up in Norman County, even though um, I do not represent Norman County, but the, the constituents were part of a permit process in Norman County, and we caught the MPA, MPCA not sharing accurate information. So I'm really challenged that there was no accountability in this um, bill with that. I am, the one thing I am very pleased that we did see the high water level determination in the bill. That's something that's very important to constituents, especially the county um, in my district and so forth. So um, I do appreciate um, your time there, members, and Mr. Speaker, thank you. The representative from Itasca, Representative Igo. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. So yeah, I just want to take some time to talk about this bill because there's some really great things in it. You know, uh, I guess I want to start with the $850,000 for AIS for our lake associations, and I just want to talk about that because I'm directly affected by that in my district. The Wabana Chain of Lakes Association has actually utilized those funds um, and just recently opened up a water decontamination site for um, lake association uh, members who can go to the local town hall for Wabana Township and clean their boat to make sure we don't have aquatic invaders entering our lakes in the area, which is just great. So that's a great program. It creates local partnerships with townships um, and lake associations. Those are the kind of things that we want to see, be seeing around the state. Um, I also wanted to talk about um, the, the language for the OSB plant, uh, which is just fantastic. That is a huge, um, you know, once in a generation project coming um, to my district. Uh, it's going to be offering about 157 jobs. You know, it's $430 million, uh, $439 million project. Uh, you know, the, the average per, or the median per wage is $31 an hour plus benefits. It's a 400 acre campus with an 18 acre enclosed space. It's just crazy, 150 logging trucks a day, uh, and, it'll, and it'll take uh, years of construction with three to 400 workers. Just a great project. I'm glad that we can have this in the bill for them today. Uh, another good thing was um, the hold on the Masabi Metallics permits for two years. That gives the state of Minnesota uh, and our, uh, our mines time to evaluate so that that mine can continue, because like I've said on the South floor before, mining is our past and present and future, so that's just great to see. Um, and it's also good to see the raises for our COs. We already talked about it today, and I won't uh, begrudge on the point, but great to see that those, those officers are getting the pay raises they deserve. Unfortunately, there is a few uh, bad things that I wish would have been added in the bill. Uh, the first is there is no plan for, for the wolves uh, in the state of Minnesota. Um, you know, I had a bill that would have uh, mandated a wolf hunt be had this year to get our wolf population under control. 
Uh, as I've said before, we're about 1,000 wolves over the DNR set number, uh, and we, we just need to get that under control. And we see that a lot in the Northland. Um, like I said, wolves are coming in closer to town. We're seeing more and more stories of you know, people's dogs getting taken, um, you know, threatening children, coming out on ice fishermen. We, just, we need to have this issue under control. We need to have the DNR do their job and manage our populations of animals. Um, another thing I was disappointed didn't make it into the bill today was there is no plan for wild rice standards. The, the Wild Rice Stewardship Council wasn't included in this bill. Um, it's a total bipartisan uh, initiative to have people from all around the state coming together to make sure that we have abundant wild rice populations and that it's managed the right way. And I guess the only way I can see why it wasn't included is the MPCA doesn't like anyone stepping on their toes when it comes down to things like this, and that's just ridiculous. Um, we need to make sure that the people of Minnesota have their voices heard on these issues. That's what the task force would have done. I'm hoping that we can continue uh, to work on that and hopefully get it added in next year. Um, you know, the other thing I, I'm disappointed in, and I think uh, members of the Iron Range in Northland, Minnesota are disappointed, is that the Mining Friendly State bill wasn't included. Um, again, total bipartisan bill in motion uh, that would have just made the uh, appetite of the state that we are mining friendly. And like I've said, we've been mining friendly for 130 years. Let's let the state use that as we have more mining companies coming here to look at using our resources that we have been so lucky and blessed to be given. Um, and then finally, I'll conclude with uh, California cars. It's been said in here, it, it's just a major disappointment that we don't have any language in there to uh, push that off and, and make sure that the legislature and the people of Minnesota write their own car standards. Uh, you know, the average commute in my district is probably about 20 to 23 miles. Um, people, if you can't, and you can't increase the cost, you can't increase electric vehicles. The technology's not there. The proper sourcing of these minerals is not there. California cars doesn't make sense. It's not fair to the people of Minnesota. Let their voices be brought into the room. At least have the conversation on California cars when people can come back into this, this capital and come back into the state office building. So with that, um, I, I will be voting for the bill today, though, with, with those good provisions. I thank Chair Hansen for his great work, and I thank all the members. It was a great conversation this year. Uh, thank you. The representative from Wabasha, Representative Draskowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you, members. Um, would the chair yield, uh, Mr. Speaker? He will yield. Representative Dreskowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for your comments earlier, Representative Hansen. Um, uh, maybe somebody can find the uh, repeal of the DNR's authority to um, do antler point restrictions. I don't see it in the bill. But maybe, I, obviously, Mr. Chair, if you said it's in the bill, it's in there somewhere. I'd, I'd be curious to where it is as we, as we continue the discussion here. Um, wondering, uh, Representative Hansen, uh, Section 133 in the bill, amending feedlot permits. I'm trying to discern what this means. I read, uh, I began reading the reference in there, 11607, subdivision 7, paragraph H. I'm wondering what new authority that is uh, or new um, procedure or uh, other uh, direction that uh, government has been giving given that we are giving the MPCA commissioner the authority to amend these feedlot permits in the bill. So I'm wondering if you can tell us what that is. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, if Representative Dreskowski could give me a page number. Representative Dreskowski, page number. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 152.11, Mr. Chair. 152.11. Okay, uh, Representative Draz, Mr. Speaker and Representative Drazkowski, uh, this was the provision relate that was added from the Senate as a compromise. Uh, I think it relates to the federal uh, general feedlot permit. And so this is actually, uh, the key part is the effective date. So it's uh, saying that the uh, general feedlot permit, uh, the commissioner where necessary may amend the general feedlot permits. So this was what the Senate insisted on to amend the existing permit that went through extensive uh, public hearings and the federal permit was issued. This provision in section 133, I actually think uh, has great consequence because it may result in uh, us losing delegated authority from the federal government relating to feedlots. The general permit is something that 
we get from the EPA through that delegated authority uh, that provides uh, instruction in terms of how the uh, feedlots are managed. So the, the, this is a provision that came from the Senate. It was uh, modified uh, and it was part of the, the ending deal. I am very concerned about this as the author of the bill. If it was up to me, I wouldn't include this in the bill because I think it has a, a great consequence. Uh, but again, to get this bill done, this was accepted. It was a Senate provision. Representative Dreskowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would the chair continue to yield? He will. Representative Dreskowski. Thank you, Representative Hansen. So, Representative Hansen, if you don't like it, I probably do. Um, could you tell us what, what this means for uh, my farmers in Wabasha, Goodhue, Winona, and Dodge counties? What, what does it mean for the holder of a feedlot permit? Representative Hansen. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker and Representative Dreskowski. I think you're probably right. If I don't like it, you probably do, because it is providing more discretion, but that the what does it mean for your feedlot operators? It could mean federal control if we lose the delegated authority. So instead of having the MPCA do the regulation, you'd have uh, the EPA doing the regulation. That's the risk for having this in the bill. Representative Dreskowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would the chair continue to yield? He will. Representative Dreskowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Hansen, I can talk to you more about it, maybe offline. Uh, obviously, this bill is going to pass. If it came from the Senate, it's probably a good provision. Uh, but I just want to find out what it means for my... Uh, we've, we've got very heavy livestock in my part of the state, and uh, those farmers, um, hopefully this is going to grant them more freedom from this huge oppressive government that we've built over the top of their heads uh, over the last couple of decades. Um, the, um, the section about, there's, there's several things uh, in here. Um, I'll talk later about emerald ash borer, and I guess that's just uh, some thoughts I had that I'd want to share. Uh, the shotgun zone change, uh, Mr. Chair, why did that not make it into the bill? Uh, the science supports the fact that rifles are safer to use in deer hunting in all topographies uh, safer than shotguns are. Uh, we've got the research to show that. I know there was discussion about it in the House and Senate, trying to bring it forward and create uniformity throughout the state and bring more freedom for hunters and more safety for deer hunters and their families. Uh, why did that not get added to the bill? Are you asking Representative Hansen to yield? I am, Mr. Chair. I, I thought I had asked. He will yield. Representative Hansen. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker and Representative Drazkowski, and I would be happy to talk with you later on the, on the feedlot permit. Um, the reason that the uh, uh, shotgun zone elimination was not in the bill is it didn't pass the House or the Senate. So we felt it wasn't appropriate to insert something in that had passed neither body. Representative Drazkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Chair Hansen, that uh, answers it for me on that one. Thank you. Um, um, I, I, I do see in the bill that we did uh, make infrared illuminators uh, capable for people to use night vision equipment so people that uh, don't have big bucks can actually, um, I should say big dollars, Mr. Chair, uh, can actually participate and use their, their cheaper night vision equipment and it'll be much more accessible for people rather than people who don't have big bucks. Um, but uh, as we know, night vision equipment is not for, um, for acquiring big bucks, but killing coyotes and other, um, and other species. Um, so I was glad to see that in the bill. That's a good piece. Um, the uh, antler point restrictions, we're going to talk about that later, or maybe if research or somebody can show me, Mr. Chair, where that is, um, uh, that would be helpful for me. But... Uh, as we look back at APR, the antler point restrictions in southeast Minnesota um, that we have, and this is only for several counties members in southeast Minnesota, this has been going on. Uh, some of us have been fighting this for uh, a decade or more, and uh, Chair Hansen and uh, people who were advocating for this, including the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, um, were able to get this enacted uh, back in um, the... Uh, uh, time frame of 2010 or 2012, somewhere in that area, 
And what it does is it limits the ability uh, for people to shoot bucks that are not of a certain size. You have to have um, four points, I believe, on one side or the other. And what this did, and members, this is what happens when you get government that believes that it's, it's the all answer to everything. Government has exacerbated or, or to a large extent caused our, our chronic wasting disease problem in this state, at least in Southeast Minnesota. Certainly helped cause the spread by bringing forward with uh, the advocates of these antler point restrictions in the past, because guess what? As the antler point restriction policy provides for bigger mature bucks, which is the idea of the advocates for the antler point restrictions, we want these big monster bucks and we're gonna not let people shoot them when they're younger so that they can grow longer and be bigger. Guess what? The bigger bucks accumulate and spread chronic wasting disease at a much, much higher rate than small bucks do. So government's causing the problem here. And so I was glad to hear Representative Hanson, I wanna see where it is in the bill, uh, but I'm, if this gets rid of it, uh, I'm glad to see that because we need to get government out of the business of doing harm to Minnesotans and to, and to our natural resources. That's what happened here. And I'm wondering, uh, Chair Hanson, uh, have we seen any? Have we seen anybody at the DNR uh, that lost their job over this, or that doesn't happen in government? Maybe that doesn't happen in government. Yeah, I guess it doesn't, and it should. And with COWD, now we've got, um, and and those those people have been chasing this policy around CWD for the last several years. They're catching up with the deer that they can catch up with, and that's the ones in the pens. The ones that the farmers have in the pens, because they can actually go out and catch up with and regulate them. They can't catch up with the ones in the wild. Members, Mr. Chair, Mr. Speaker, the problem is not the deer in the pens. It's the deer outside of the pens that are the CWD problem in this state. We gotta leave the guys and gals who are raising deer in the pens alone because they're highly regulated. We need to support the Board of Animal Health. They've been doing a great job making certain that the ones in the pens are healthy. They've got the ability to do that. They can just go walk right in the pen with the farmer. There they are. Let's test them. Let's run them through the chute or whatever we do. But the problem is the great bulk of the deer are outside of the pen. And that's where the problem is, that's where the disease is. But our policy is focusing on farmers who are following the law and who are highly regulated. What are we doing? First of all, the government helps cause a disease and then it's going around pestering and maligning farmers who are, who are trying to bring forward their livelihood and their families who are following the law, being responsible stewards. We gotta get the government out of a bunch of this stuff and redirect the remaining government that's there in a positive direction, because the negative direction they've been going is not being helpful, members. I'm curious, uh, well, I, I don't have a question for the chair on this, but we're appropriating, I thought it was $500,000, Mr. Speaker, for no child left inside. Okay. So I don't know whose bill that is, a Republican or a Democrat. Should we be using government money to tell people what they should do with their recreational time? Representative Lilly's nodding yes. Well, that's what we do in your bill, Representative Lilly, all the time, isn't it? But $500,000 to tell people that they should get in the woods instead of, instead of on their video games. Now, that's the job of our parents in this state. That's a parent's job. We don't need big, big brother and big government and big mom and daddy government because that's not the role. 
government is stepping out of bounds. And all the feel good we have about it, authors who brought this forward, whoever you are, I have no idea. But go bring the idea to the parents in your district and have them work with their kids. And let's leave government out of this because it's not its role. Um, lastly, um, maybe I'll get back to uh, the chair on, on the discussion about the APRs, uh, but I do have a, another question, Mr. Speaker, for the chair if he'd yield. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, chair Hansen, I, I did see the LCCMR part of the bill. I haven't been able to fully digest every project in the bill, but we're spending millions and millions of dollars from the state lottery and in the bill. 30 million is for land acquisition. At least that's what I read from the spreadsheet. How many acres are we buying with this bill, Representative Hansen? Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and Representative Drazkowski. We've been working on this bill so long, I forgot the numbers. Representative Drazkowski. Okay, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, well Chair Hansen, uh, we got another pile of acres of state land to add to the 10,000 we buy each year in the other bill that passed here last week. And the chair doesn't know how many acres, he forgot. Um, another question uh, for the chair, if he would yield, Mr. Speaker. He will yield, Representative Drazkowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Chair Hansen, we see throughout the bill, both in the LCCMR portion and in the other portion, we see all kinds of money going to the University of Minnesota. We think the University of Minnesota is going to reach, research us into prosperity, I believe. It, it sure appears so with this bill. Can you tell us, uh, Representative Hansen, Chair Hansen, how, many, uh, how much money do we give to the DNR in, or to the U of M in this bill? Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and Representative Jaskowski, I don't have the top, that uh, amount off the top of my head, but what I knew, do know is what was referenced earlier, the money that we've invested in the University of Minnesota for the Center for Prion Research has yielded results faster than we thought. And I do know of one appropriation that was added in there, I think it's 384,000 that we gave to the University of Minnesota if this bill is adopted for the Center for Prion Research to look at chronic waste and disease in soils. And what we did and how we achieved that money is we looked at money that was being returned back to the corpus, canceled money, so money that wasn't spent, not new money, but money that hadn't been spent. And so we captured those funds and allocated them to the Center for Prion Research. That's just one of those amounts. Representative Dreskowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Chair Hansen. Well, that's encouraging. I mean, we spent millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars over the years that go to the University of Minnesota. This is the first time I've heard it actually yield something. So I, I don't know how much we spent chasing the emerald ash borer or, uh, you know, or, or any of the other invasive species because um, most of us that have been observing these invasive species realize that they simply run their course and Mother Nature is in control or God is in control in that situation. And uh, so in this case with CWD, that's encouraging. Um, I did see, and, and I was listening to your introductory speech, you talked about two things uh, we're doing with emerald ash borer which is not going to be grinding them up uh, in St. Paul and, or hauling them, grinding them up out in rural Minnesota and hauling them wet to St. Paul and incinerating them and taxing Minnesotans through their electricity bill. Thank God that that improvement was made in this bill. Uh, but we're still giving grants to municipalities and planting trees. Now, we should have been planting trees years ago instead of being in denial and believing we were going to somehow outsmart Mother Nature and God on, on emerald ash borer. Um, so we're finally there. Our denial session is done, apparently, and we're actually uh, encouraging people with the money we do spend to plant trees because people in Minnesota, that's what you need to do about emerald ash borer. The ash trees are going to die. They're going to be dead. 
okay? They're going away. They did in every other state they've been in for decades before us. If you have an ash tree in Minnesota, it's going to be dead. And you'll, you're going to lose your ash, yes. And so when you lose your ash, you need to figure out a different tree to plant. And you can even start early. You can plant the new trees before the ash dies. And so we actually have government finally harmonizing with reality, which is encouraging. I'm encouraged, uh, Chair Hansen. But we got another $700,000 going to the U of M. I don't know if that's still denial money that we're sending to the U of M, believing they're going to somehow bail us out of a natural course of nature here or not. But um, there's thousands and thousands and millions and millions of dollars going to the U of M in this bill. Um, Mr. Speaker, would the chair yield again, please? Yes, Representative Draskowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Representative Hansen, any, uh, did you track down APR yet? Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and Representative Draskowski. You are correct, and I stand corrected. The provision on repealing APR, which I thought I had agreed to, is not in the bill. There you go, Representative Draskowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'm remiss, Mr. Chair. I, I guess I should have brought the amendment. <laughs> well, members, uh, the process has, uh, for those of you that have been standing up and complaining about the process, here's an answer for you. The chair of the committee in the House that brought the APR into existence a decade ago, Mr. Chair, something like that, who uh, him and I have been fighting about this back and forth forever, and he's won so far. But he was ready to concede today and, and uh, align with the, Demo or with the uh, Senate on this provision, and it failed to get in the bill because of this expedited process. So there you have it. Mr. Speaker, members, uh, this bill spends uh, nearly 11% of an increase over the base in the last biennium. I don't have actuals. And members, I will just outline one of my frustrations as I've seen these bills come through. Not only, not only do we not have actuals listed in this spreadsheet, I want to see in these spreadsheets how much it is we've spent actually in this budget area up to this point or projected for this fiscal year, it's not in the spreadsheet. As a matter of fact, I, unless I overlooked it, I don't believe in this spreadsheet we even have the base from the current biennium included in the bill or in the spreadsheet. I would encourage us, chairs, as you talk to uh, your uh, fiscal staff, your nonpartisan fiscal staff that you work with, we need to have more details because I can't even find some of that in this, this spreadsheet that came forward. Uh, we can try to do some, some uh, uh, mathematic manipulation in some of it, but we need to have that information in here. I did discern after bringing my calculator out nearly an 11% increase over the current biennium. And so um, a full 10% or 11% increase I don't know that families are doing that, members, in their two years that they're going to be going ahead as they look back on their last two years. How many families in your district are getting 5% or 6% increase in their revenue in their family each year? How many? Not many of them in my district, I can tell you that. And so here we have it again. Government has already grown at 50% over the past eight years. We're on track to give it another 50% eight years from now. With this type of expenditure, government is continuing to grow many times, as I've outlined earlier in this discussion, off course and doing damage to the people of Minnesota and to the natural resources of Minnesota. But it's so big and all-knowing that it just continues to do it. We got to slow down and decrease the spending in some of these areas. This is one of the areas in government we can start to decrease, and we need to really get to that because um, our families are getting run over and they're struggling through this, this uh, disease we've had for the last year. And 
government doesn't seem to have missed a step. As a matter of fact, many of our 35 or 37,000 government employees in this state, most of them spent most of their work days the last year in their basement free from any exposure to the disease, got paid full, full wages, many times increases in their wages over the last year. What of our families that are paying the bill? What's going on with them and your communities, members? Our government and our decisions around future spending of government seems to be out of touch in this bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Chair Hansen. Thank you, members. Uh, I'll be voting no on the bill. The representative from Carver, Representative Nash. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Like a lot of you, I go to NCSL meetings and you meet legislators from all over the country. And I happened to meet some uh, legislators from California. And they were asking, well, tell me about Minnesota. They said, I, you know, I've never been there, probably won't ever go there, know nothing about it. Let me say that again. Never been there, probably aren't going to go there, and know nothing about Minnesota. But we're going to join the California Compact for Clean Cars. So we're going to let somebody who doesn't know anything about us, doesn't care to know anything about us, probably will never come here to figure anything out about us, we're going to let them decide how things go. Does that strike you as a little outrageous? It does me. I, I think that that's really an insane proposition that you're forwarding to say, well, we're going to let the, the people out in California, we'll, we'll let them set things out here. And when they make changes, we will then have to abide in them again with people who have never come here, won't come here, and could really care less. That's odd. And again, I'm sure they're well-intended people, and I know many of them, and I go to cybersecurity task force and other meetings, and on issues that are not geography-specific, uh, they have some, some good ideas. We don't try to tell them that too much, because California already thinks a lot of itself. But you're going to cede your ability as a lawmaker in the state of Minnesota, because your, your pin doesn't say the House of Representatives of California. But I would actually encourage you, if you're going to put up a vote for this, take your pin off and randomly select somebody from the, Minnesota, or from the California legislature, mail them your pin, because that's what you're doing. You're going to let them dictate policy for the state of Minnesota. I think that's preposterous. Secondly, to the chair, uh, the desk gets in our way of, of making eye contact, but I will tell you, Mr. Chair, uh, there we go. I appreciated when you took my amendment for the federal technology on the floor, but I'm deeply disappointed that it was not fought for in conference with the Senate. Because federal, in conjunction with the partners that are making that technology possible, they're a Minnesota company. They employ Minnesotans, many of them in all of our districts. They are a staple for Minnesota sportsmen. And if you use their ammunition and you use their technologies and you didn't fight at all for them to stay in the bill, I think they should know about that. And I'm going to make sure they're aware of it. And I believe, according to staff, they're well aware of this and deeply disappointed that a Minnesota company with a great innovation. And, and for the, again, for those of you that have never muzzleloaded, this is a safety issue. This is a great piece of technology because unloading your muzzleloader, you do it two ways, as I had said earlier. You either fire it and discharge the weapon and, or you take off the cap and then you can uh, remove the, the sabot and the bullet and the powder charge, which is kind of clunky. But this new technology goes completely past that. It makes it so it's safe to unload the muzzleloader. And I, I will tell you, and I've, I told the chair, muzzleloading is my favorite season. Because all the people who like to sound shoot and they're kind of twitchy and sometimes brand new hunters, they, they go to the rifle or the shotgun season. Uh, and then they're out of the woods. And I feel way better. But it's also quieter. And I, I enjoy sitting. Uh, in my tree stand and I, I actually enjoy when the snow falls on me because I stand up and the snow falls off. It's kind of a neat thing. Uh, but if you go to my office, uh, you'll see a deer that I have hanging on my wall that I took up. I believe it's in Chair Murphy's district in uh, Floodwood. And that was done during the muzzleloading season. Muzzle season. But uh, I, had to, I had to 
unload my weapon a number of times, and this would have just made it a lot easier. Would have made it much cleaner, much safer, um, and honestly save the hunter money and prevent there from being, as you all are, are very focused on removing lead from the environment, well, when you shoot that to discharge your weapon to make it safe to take back, you're actually, if you don't do this new technology, you're gonna be putting lead downrange. So, very disappointed that we capitulated on that because that, that's good for Minnesota. It's a Minnesota company that will, will be able to employ more people as a result of that. It will make muzzleload hunting safer. So I, I am deeply disappointed that that was not fought for and that we folded like a cheap suit to, on that. Similarly, I live in the shotgun range. And because I, I, uh, I, I load and reload my own rifle shells, again, yes, another nerdy thing that Nash does, but I focus on precision and I know the ballistic tables and I understand all the things that go into that. And it, it is, I think Representative Heinzman or Representative Igo said uh, very appropriately, there's really, there's no compelling reason to have those zones. And this was a simple thing, a simple thing. And you couldn't fight for it. Very disappointed. So uh, I'm gonna end very disappointed. And, and again, when you put your yes vote up, take that pin off your lapel and find a random California legislator to mail it off to, because that's what you're gonna be doing. You're gonna be saying, hey, you know what? I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna let you do my job for me. And welcome to the legislature in Minnesota, Californians. So thank you, Mr. Speaker. The representative from Meeker, Representative Erdahl. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker and members. And uh, you know, I, I think there are a lot of good things in this bill. I uh, plan to, uh, to vote for it. I understand, uh, having been a chairman in the past, how difficult it is to, uh, to put a bill together, uh, particularly one like this. Uh, but I do have a little problem. And that is I had a provision that I thought was in this bill. Uh, it was... Uh, a simple little thing. We have loose line trail that extends out into my district. And where the trail ends, well, we could cut off and go up to Greenleaf Lake State Recreation Area. I mean, this would be a good thing. It would actually provide a destination for folks in the Twin Cities who wanted to bike out on loose line. They could go to Greenleaf. And so uh, I had a... Uh, a, a draft, a bill draft uh, done for that. Uh, there was no cost. It was supported by the DNR. Didn't even authorize building a trail. It just said that sometime in the future uh, they could do it. It had a hearing in legacy. It was in the legacy bill. And then in their discussions there, the Senate said, well, we don't need to do it because it's in the environment bill. Representative Hansen put it in, and I, I called Representative Hansen about that, and I, you know, thank you very much for putting that in. And in fact, today before session started, I went over and I asked, "Is it in the bill?" And Representative Hansen said, "Yes, he believed that it was." And again, I understand this gets complicated as you go through a bill, but it's not there. So would Representative Hansen yield for a question, please? He will yield. Representative Hansen. Representative Hansen, what happened? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Re Speaker. And Representative Re Hansen. Representative Erdahl, uh, Chair Lilly and I will work with you next year to achieve your goal. Representative Erdahl. Thank you. That's pretty much what I was getting at. The representative from Hennepin, Representative Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, I rise in support of this compromise environment and natural resources bill. Chair Hansen deserves our sincere and deep gratitude for his able and tenacious leadership on behalf of the environment of our beautiful state. Our environment doesn't have deep-pocketed stakeholders to speak and lobby on its behalf. It just has people to lend their voices and their advocacy to protect it. It's for all of us. Our air and our water belong to all of us. 
Our state faces many serious and potentially devastating crises simultaneously. Chronic wasting disease threatens our wild deer herd with still unknown effects on human health. Emerald ash borer threatens trees all over our state, including our northern forests. Aquatic invasive species continues to spread through our lakes, threatening our waters and the aquatic life in them and our ability to enjoy them. Water pollution threatens our most precious life-sustaining natural resource. And climate change threatens our very existence. The collapse of our pollinator populations is another threat our state faces that I want to focus briefly on. Members, this week is Pollinator Week. The reason we have a Pollinator Week is to highlight the importance of pollinators and the dangerous decline of their numbers. Pollinators are key to our food supply, they prevent soil erosion, and increase carbon sequestration. We don't have a pollinator week because bees are cute, though they are. Our pollinators are threatened and their populations have declined precipitously. Pollinator week is an effort to ring the alarm bell about pollinator collapse. The reasons for their decline are many and include the stressors of loss of habitat and fragmentation, pesticides, climate change, diseases, and parasites. Solving this problem will require research and resources and a multifactorial approach. Minnesotans seem to understand this complexity and have stepped up to do their part in many ways, including through the Lawns to Legumes program that was implemented in the last biennium. Pollinators have benefited from the microgrants and educational seminars that help people transform their traditional lawns into pollinator-friendly habitats. This is a science-based approach to supporting pollinators, as there is research that shows that even small areas of pollinator-friendly plantings can support pollinators and create corridors that multiply that effect. It is great news that there is ongoing support for lawns to legumes in this bill. It is great news that pollinator provisions in the LCCMR bills were largely protected. Members, we have work to do going forward. If we want Minnesota to remain the beautiful and plentiful state of more than 10,000 lakes that it is, this work needs to be in the front of all of our minds, or we risk losing much of what makes our state remarkable. So I want to reiterate a heartfelt thanks to Chair Hansen, to Vice Chair Wozlowick and to all the members of the Environment and Natural Resources Committee and the incredible staff who make it all possible. Members, please vote green for our environment. The representative from Ramsey, Representative Wozlowick. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, my colleague, Representative Morrison, did a good job of highlighting some of the issues we're facing as a state when it comes to our environment and natural resources. I want to highlight um, another issue that we're facing across the state, and that is um, contamination by toxic chemicals. Um, there's many, many toxic chemical sites across the state um, that have been uh, cleaned up by the MPCA that continue to have ongoing efforts to clean them up. Um, TCE is one of those chemicals. PFAS is another one. Um, for those not familiar with PFAS, um, these chemicals are um, man-made chemicals. They're called forever chemicals because they don't go away. Um, and they're found in a variety of consumer products, including nonstick cookware, stain-resistant carpet, and food packaging. And they have um, negative impacts on human health. These, chemical, these chemicals have been found um, recently. There were research that showed these chemicals found in breast milk as well as rainwater, indicating that this is a widespread issue across the country and across the world. In Minnesota, these chemicals have been found um, in groundwater in cities in the East Metro and in other parts of the state, and were recently detected in groundwater at 97% of closed landfills that were tested by the MPCA. These closed landfills are across our state. Um, at 59 of these landfills, PFAS detections exceeded Minnesota Department of Health drinking water guidance values, some significantly. I am uh, glad to see um, that our bill provides funding for a number of initiatives to address this issue. Um, given the nature of these chemicals, it's an ex expensive problem to address, and so I'm glad to see that we're doing some work on this issue. Our bill provides funding to develop and implement an initiative to uh, reduce sources of PFAS um, in the environment that eventually get to our municipal wastewater facilities, which is a big concern for communities across our state. 
It also provides funding to help identify potential sources of um, PFAS contamination and to implement a ban on PFAS in food packaging, which can lead to human exposure um, to PFAS through contamination on food items and um, in our environment as it goes to landfills and compost facilities and gets to the environment through there. There's also some funding in our LCCMR provisions um, to develop strategies to address PFAS in land applied biosolids, which we know is an also a big concern in our state, and to work on new technology that would help to protect our state's drinking water and our resources by eliminating PFAS from point source discharges. There's a lot of good stuff in here on PFAS in this bill. Um, I'd encourage members to vote in support of this bill so we can prevent our constituents from being exposed to these toxic chemicals and to address those chemicals that are already in our environment. The representative from Stearns, Representative Tice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm really glad that we're seeing this bill and I'm glad that we're seeing the LCCMR portions in this. There are a lot of good projects that are funded in it and next year I know we'll be seeing Representative Erdahl's in one of the bill. But I also want to talk about something I thought was really troubling that we didn't see in the bill and that's more accountable, accountability for the MPCA. We're giving them a whole lot of money. But when we started our committee this year, we heard from the Office of Legislative Audit. And this was one of the pieces that I thought was really interesting. In our view, the MPCA must be accountable for the failure to respond to Water Gremlins 1995 permit application. While Water Gremlins operations may not have been as complex as those of some of the other facilities that were seeking permits, the company was classified by federal regulations as a major source, source of pollution, emitting more than 10 tons annually for a chemical that is federally classified as hazard, hazardous. That's concerning for me. And yet we didn't do anything to hold them accountable for it. And now we're looking at a lot of the PFAS regulations and there's a lot of science out there. In fact, I've been doing a little research on it, and the Center for Truth and Science says that we should pay close attention to a recent environmental research study of 18 of the most comprehensive studies addressing the possible links between PFAS and cancer that should influence our actions and pave the way to sound regulatory and judicial decision making. The study founded by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention found that evidence of an association between exposure to PFAS compounds and cancer is sparse. We don't have the science yet. I don't doubt that we might get there. But, but as now, as, as we're making uh, these rules, we don't have it. And that's concerning for me because in the bill we're saying that the commissioner may enforce from folks intentionally producing materials, but we don't have the science that says it absolutely does. That is concerning to me. I really dislike legislating that it may, it might, it could, we should know for sure. We can send the alarm out there and say, hey, this is, this is what we think is happening, and we can certainly cut it down. And I know some companies are already cutting it down but when we have the MPC in charge of this, MPCA in charge of this, uh, I'm a little concerned. We did nothing to say, hey, what was going on? Why didn't you do this? We heard about Water Gremlin almost every committee meeting, and yet we're doing nothing to hold them accountable. We would do that if it was private business. We should expect more from our agency. We should expect that when we say, hey, there's an issue, or you issue a permit, why aren't you checking on it? and not look at, point the finger at Water Gremlin. I'm not saying that what they did was entirely great, but by gosh, if they're getting a permit from MPCA, MPCA should be looking at it. And we're giving them an awful lot of money. $112,420,000, that's a lot. We should expect that they're gonna do the job. And it's always, oh, we didn't have this and we didn't have that. In my company, I wouldn't, get I wouldn't get by with that. In this legislature, I wouldn't get by with that. Our agencies should not get by with that. There should be some accountability. And I would hope that in the coming year that we look at some of this, some of these issues and say, hey, 
If the Office of Legislative Audit gives me recommendations of what we need to do to make sure that the MPCA is held accountable, we should be doing it. We should have more legislation. It just really scares me. We can make all the rules we want, but if we don't have an agency that is enforcing this and making sure that everybody's following the rules, then why even do it? On the other hand, like I said, I'm very glad to see that we are finally moving forward the LCCMR provisions in this bill. They need to get done. We've had to cancel several of our meetings already this year, and I actually look forward to the meetings. They're a lot. They're time-consuming. But gosh darn it, we got to make sure that when we make legislation that our agencies are taking care to making sure that they're doing the job. Thank you. Let's see, where are we at? Uh, the representative from Hennepin, Representative Elkins. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With great fanfare, Ford recently introduced the Ford F-150 Lightning pickup, which will become widely available over the coming year. If you're a pickup guy, you're going to want one of these because this pickup is faster and has more towing capacity than any F-150 currently on the market, along with a range of at least 300 miles. In 2023, the all-electric version of the Sil Chevy Silverado will also be available with similar performance characteristics. I've been driving an electric car for four and a half years, and yes, based upon my own experience, you can expect that the range will drop by about a, a third in the depths of the winter, meaning that an electric pickup with a normal range of 300 miles will only have a range of 200 miles in late January. But what many skeptics overlook is that you will charge that pickup in your own garage every night using an ordinary 240 volt outlet like the one that powers your stove, washer, and dryer, and it will be drawing on an overnight late baseload power that is abundant and almost entirely generated using carbon-free nuclear and wind power, and only costs about five cents a kilowatt watt hour at off-peak rates. Every morning you will come out and to a fully fueled pickup truck without ever having to visit a gas station. My own electric bill only went up by about $10 a month when I bought my EV and went on to Excel's peak off-peak rate plan. So ask yourself how much you spend on gasoline every month. Your maintenance costs will be next to nothing because your e-pickup will have few moving parts and there are no oil changes. And if the power goes out in your house, you will actually be able to plug in your house into the F-150 Lightning and power your home from the battery in the car. The clean car rule will ensure that you will be able to buy one of these pickups at a Minnesota auto dealer, but not until the rule becomes effective in 2024. Until then, good luck getting your hands on one of these pickup trucks in Minnesota. Thank you. The representative from Ramsey, Representative Becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I wanted to uh, set the record straight on a couple things. Um, first, um, the Ford F-150 Lightning is maybe exciting for pickup guys, but uh, maybe exciting for women who like to drive pickup trucks as well. Um, next, uh, the Wild Rice Stewardship Council was described as a uh, non you know, a bipartisan, uh, non-controversial measure. In reality, it is not supported by tribes or many indigenous people and undermines the protection of wild rice by giving priority to limiting the burdens on industry instead of placing the priority on the protection of our natural resources. Um, as far as uh, the problem of chronic wasting disease, as mentioned by Chair Hansen, we have been trying um, to address this problem more strongly for, for years. Um, I believe we passed a moratorium off the House floor back in 2017, and much of the problems we have right now could have been avoided uh, had we been able to get that past the Senate. The problem isn't the deer. Uh, it's the people who don't accept science or reality when it comes to chronic wasting disease. The problem is the Senate. Um, and I want to be clear about that, that the House DFL are the ones fighting for our deer hunters and our wild deer herd, and the Senate, uh, they're the ones obstructing our ability to address, meaningfully address, chronic wasting disease. 
Um, further, I just want to make sure that the public is aware that you know some of these farms that we speak of are actually facilities where you pay big bucks to shoot a big buck um, in a pen and pretend that it's hunting. And so that is one of the reasons these animals are moved around um, is because you want the big buck in the place where you want to shoot it and uh, it takes moving those animals around uh, to, to do that in the place where you prefer to do it. Uh, finally, on the uh, No Child Left Inside provisions, uh, we first passed that bill in 2019, has been an extremely successful grant program in the DNR, and I, I would encourage folks to read the bill uh, before you go off about what the bill does, and would especially encourage the member from Wabasha to speak to the St. Charles Trap Team as they received a grant from the No Child Left Inside program uh, to get that program off the ground for the students in St. Charles. Uh, so just wanted to set the record straight on those things. Obviously, this is a compromise bill. It doesn't have everything that we wish that it had, um, but it's a good bill, and we can feel good voting for it. Thank you. The representative from Crow Wing, Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We're kind of winding down, and I had a few comments I wanted to make before we go ahead and decide we're going to vote on the bill. There are some things that I, I wish, like other members, were in the bill. I think all of us, you know, have a wish list of sorts. Um, you know, but there are some things that I'm glad are no longer in the bill. Like fees for every transaction when a deed or, or mortgage is recorded, raising the costs of owning a home in Minnesota. Before uh, this bill also had fees on boats, park entrance fee increases, permit increases. All those uh, extra costs for Minnesotans are out of this bill. One of the things that really was uh, disturbing to me when this bill left the floor, a number of well, over a month ago now, was an expanded MPCA authority provision. And I've talked a lot about MPCA over the last year, and I'm going to talk about some of the issues at MPCA briefly again. PFAS was brought up, and I'm glad it was, because Minnesotans should know that currently the way we handle PFAS, if, for example, it's in a leachate pond, is dilution and discharge. That's how Minnesota's PCA handles PFAS. That's parafluoral alkali substances. That's how we handle that in Minnesota currently, is we just dilute it at a permitted facility, and we discharge it directly back into the Mississippi. Mississippi. And in most cases, that, that point of discharge is ahead of the water systems here in the metro. Why would we give MPCA more authority if after, like Representative Tice was talking, we have right here in an OLA report, their recommendation is that MPCA should be held accountable. This bill doesn't do that, it doesn't hold and PCA accountable. On issues of PFAS, uh, we don't have the kinds of solutions that we really need, and, and part of those solutions, unfortunately, are going to come through research. It's one thing to identify the sources of PFAS, and I agree that's an important uh, provision in this bill, Chair Hansen, glad it's there. The current version of the bill today contains provisions that will look for upstream sources of PFAS, but it's going to be another thing to figure out what to do with it, because the current plan at MPCA to dilute and discharge directly into the Mississippi is a bad plan. That's a terrible option. I got to talk about a few things I really appreciate about this bill. I'm glad that we finally have our LCCMR bills 
Moving forward, Chair Hansen, we've been trying to get this done for a long time, and there's, like I said, on a number of other issues earlier, a lot of finger pointing, but it's getting done right now in this bill. Uh, Representative Brindley's work is expanded upon, you might remember little Allen's bill, excellent provision, young man, life cut short because of abuse of uh, intoxicating substances. And our laws had a loophole, and that loophole was closed under Representative Brindley's language, and now we're going to expand that, so not just snowmobiles, but also off-road ATVs and other vehicles are, are also included in that. So, Chair Hansen, good job. Thank you. We have uh, funding for a number of really important agencies and provisions for funding in a uh, number of categories that I really appreciate. Explore Minnesota Tourism, funded. State Parks, fully funded. We talked about this earlier, $12.4 million for CWD research and work. It's an important issue. Appreciate those provisions, Chair Hansen. Accelerated tree planting. And finally, one that I'm especially proud of is this funding for law enforcement. A bipartisan effort to make sure that our conservation officers pay is on par with other agencies and other places that they could have gone to work. It's important that we have the best of the best in these positions and underfunding our law enforcement is the wrong thing. This bill does the right thing and provides law enforcement funding. So I'm going to support this bill and I hope that the issues that weren't resolved in, in this legislation can be considered in a future legislature and we can get back to making sure that good companies like, like Federal have the technology and the legislation working together, that deer hunters are better represented in future legislation, and that MPCA is held accountable. So uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I'll be voting green on this bill. To the author of the bill, Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Uh, I would invite you to join Representative Heinzman and I in voting for this bill. It's an important bill for Minnesota. We are a few days away from the end of the fiscal year. And again, let's remember that the LCCMR and many policy provisions were delayed for essentially 14 months by the Senate, holding them hostage for a delay in the clean car standard. Unprecedented. Unprecedented. We had provisions in the bill for environmental justice. You won't find the word environmental justice in the bill because the Senate wouldn't agree to it. For justice to occur, you need to acknowledge that there is a problem, and there is, with pollution, where it occurs and who it occurs to. Climate. We were able to pass provisions that relate to carbon sequestration, but that didn't say the word climate. It's 2021. I heard earlier about concern with batteries catching fire. I'm concerned about the planet catching fire. Temperatures going up, the weather becomes more erratic, we have to do something. Those are crises that are here and now. So this budget addresses some things in the short term. I do want to correct uh, Mr. Speaker just to provide uh, Representative Draskowski with an answer to two of his questions. Representative Draskowski. Um, so for acres in the LCCMR, fee title acres in the 2020 LCCMR, 824, and the 2021 LCCMR, 476. Non-state fee title acres, 2020 bill, 234, 
in the 2021 bill, 279.25 acres. Easements in the 2020 LCCMR bill, 130 acres. In the 2021 bill, 96 acres. And I have uh, colorful maps if you'd like to see them. Um, University of Minnesota appropriations. U of M totals in the two Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund bills. FY21, 16.221 million. FY22, 17.773. I would invite you to join Representative Heinzman and I in voting for science. That research is essential. Minnesota has a strong history of innovation. The opportunities that, are, that come from public investment and research. That loon on the lottery ads helps invest in that. And I want you to join us, I ask you to join us in voting for this bill. Much of the discussion has been what's not in the bill. I'm very disappointed as well. Representative Vang had uh, provisions relating to controlling insecticides in cities, a local control provision, not included. There were provisions, years of debate about uh, pr uh, having non-toxic ammunition on selected wildlife management areas, having no insecticides, neonicotinoids, or chlorpyrifos on wildlife management areas, not included. I could go on and on just as other members have about what's not in the bill. But what is in the bill is funding that provides money for our agencies and it deals with EAB, CWD, AIS, PFAS, and other priorities. And if you want to support the conservation officers that work for us, you vote for this bill. I ask for your support. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the bill. Members, this is your reminder to vote. A couple more seconds, and then we're going to have the clerk call the roll. Or at least says it. Okay, will the clerk please call the names of those members not who have yet. not voted yet? Bo. Bo votes aye. Bo aye. Christensen. No, that would, no that, this would be just perfect. Okay. Christensen. Christensen, aye. Christensen, aye. Franzen. Franzen, both aye. Franzen, aye. Grunhagen. Grunhagen, no. Grunhagen, no. Hamilton. Hamilton votes no. Hamilton, no. Houseman. Houseman, aye. Houseman, aye. Hollins. Hollins, aye. Hollins, aye. Katiza Watoon. Katiza Watu and I. Katiza Watu and I. McDonald. McDonald, no. McDonald, no. Pearson. Pearson, I. Pearson, I. Ryer. Ryer, I. Ryer, I. Scott. No. Scott. Scott, no. Scott, no. The clerk will close the roll.
There being 99 yeas and 34 nays, the bill is passed and it's titled agreed to. The next bill on the calendar for today is Senate File 9. The clerk will report the bill. Senate File Number 9, Number 1 on the calendar for the day, an act relating to state government establishing a biennial budget for the Department of Employment and Economic Development, the fourth engrossment. I recognize the author of the bill, Representative Noor. Represent Representative Noor, you are up. Please find a microphone. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let me begin by thanking our incredible staff for doing an amazing job, working day and night to get the jobs and labor bill done. Mr. Speaker and members, this is a work that many of our staff who we don't see every single day for their commitment to public service. Let me begin by thanking our nonpartisan staff, Ms. Anna Sholin, Ms. Solve Beko, Ms. Martha James, but also our partisan staff, beginning with Jason Chavez, Grace Doyle, with our amazing house researchers, David Sullivan, Bill Glunn, and the last but not the least, the committee administrator, Travis Reese. This, quite frankly, was a labor of love that they put in into this bill to get it ready for us to vote for. Mr. Speaker and members, I wanted to th thank our team, our incredible team from Chair Eklund to Representative Liz Olson, Representative Berg, our lead on the other side, Lead Hamilton, who were part of the conference to get this bill done. Thanks to the Chair Pratt, and Rarick and their staff for collaborating on this bill. Quite frankly, we met every single day, almost every single day in person to get this work done. Members, last year was a difficult year. We understand the challenges our families, the workers, and our small businesses faced they have endured one of the most significant challenge in their lifetime. COVID-19 pandemic created struggles, challenges, and opportunities for all of us. But the, we see what has happened as we have seen the vaccines come out. And as we get back to normal, we need to start doing what is right to allow a significant recovery for our state. Mr. Speaker and members, this bill comes from the main streets to the spreadsheets. This is the work of all the advocates of our communities around the state asking us to take action. We do recognize the small business as the anchors of our main streets. They're the foundation of our economy they are the engine of our state's economy. This is not about the Wall Streets. It's not about those who are well connected. It's not about those who are wealthy, who can afford to get their lives done. Quite frankly, this is about the workers and businesses who have been on the front lines on every single day. This bill, Mr. Speaker and members, provides the much needed support for our commercial corridors, for projects that are ready 
for the economic impact that we have seen and the devastation. This bill will help revitalize our main streets. It provides an $80 million for corridors like Lake Street, Broadway, Midway, and across the state so that we can provide them the help that they need. This will address a significant need based on what has happened since March 15, 2020. Mr. Speaker and members, this bill provides hope where people have been left out. This bill is in a way of us saying we can do it, and we will do it. Mr. Speaker and members, the $80 million in this bill for the Main Street revitalization is to provide for those who have been impacted by the civil unrest and also COVID-19. We provide up to 750,000 per project, which is a grant program, with a leverage, because we know this amount that we have isn't enough. This is to call for public, private, and nonprofit partnership to rebuild our economy. Programs like Restore, Rebuild, Reimagine that has helped many of those who had given hope that they have done what is necessary, it's time for us to show we're willing to stand with them shoulder to shoulder. We call upon those who are willing to continue to support those entities and businesses impacted to please join our hands so that we can help the economy for the state of Minnesota. We also provide a $2 million loan guarantee program on top of the 750,000 grants. This is a historic investment, but it's not all that we will be getting for those who need the most. Just to give you a number for Minneapolis and Paul, the need is $160 million. Imagine if we could have provided all that in one bill and to be able to say we are ready to help and continue. This is the beginning, but not the end to the businesses who have been talking to us. To the furniture store owned by Abe, or to the restaurant that is owned by Rahul Islam, who literally said that whatever happened, happened, we need to start coming together. We're there for you, and we'll keep on fighting for you. We also have a $70 million that is dedicated to supporting our Main Street's COVID relief program. This is similar to the program that we did previously by providing grants to businesses that have been left out. Those who had no opportunity at all, we're telling them if you were left out during the previous grant program, we're ready to help you with 5,000 or up to 25,000 through a random process. We're here to help not only the small businesses who have been left out, but we also have carve outs for the veterans, for women, for BIPAC, and including the cultural centers that provide the economic engine for many of our com communities in the state of Minnesota. That's a significant investment, Madam Sp uh, Mr. Speaker, for us not to look into. Quite frankly, this bill addresses some of the need in the economic engine by providing resources for businesses to come and expand and stay here in the state of Minnesota. We are funding the Minnesota Job Creation Program, Minnesota Investment Fund, so that businesses like the Duluth Paper Mill that we know provides a significant job opportunities to the communities around that area continue, continues to thrive. Mr. Speaker and members, we know the need for small businesses, especially for those who are doing a startup programs, that we do not want to forget about them. This bill provides a historic 
$10 million for technical assistance so that those businesses that have been impacted can have a place to go to. And that will ensure that we don't give up on supporting small businesses. We also continue to provide the $3.6 million for Greater Minnesota Business Development Public Infrastructure, the BDPI. We continue to fund the Emerging Entrepreneur for $2 million. We also have 4.25 for contaminated sites, but we are also investing in TV and also film in the state of Minnesota. Mr. Speaker and members, we know that childcare is a critical need in the state of Minnesota. Having accessible childcare, especially for our children, is critical for the workforce development. Indeed, we are doing another historic investment in childcare business development for $8 million and $5 million in details to make sure that those industries that have been impacted in the childcare industry, we can provide them the hope that they need and get many individuals, especially mothers who have quit working because of COVID-19 and lack of access to quality childcare is a major challenge. We wanna make sure that communities that are underserved and communities that don't have access to childcare can take advantage of this program. Mr. Speaker, in this bill, we continue to fund Launch Minnesota, which is an essential component of our technology startup programs by providing them $5 million. This program was created last session. As you have seen, our lives have been impacted by tele-everything. When we zoom in, when we go to the hospitals, when our children go to schools, when we do everything, including the e-commerce, we know how technology is critical. This bill will ensure that we invest in a startup programs. Mr. Speaker, if I may have a... Representative Noor, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hope all is well on the other side. Mr. Speaker, as we continue to address the challenges that we've seen in workforce development, this challenge has provided us an opportunity to invest in workforce development. Although we could not get reforms of the workforce development, we're investing $85 million to support the future workforce development in the state of Minnesota. These programs are essential and critical to getting the workers back to work. Mr. Speaker and members, this bill ensures that the UI benefits that, has been, that have been essential to our communities continue to exist, especially ending the prohibition for the high school students who have been ineligible for a long time to be included effective July 1, 2022. I mean July 3, 2022. This is great news for those youth who came before us and asked us to fix a 1939 era in our law. It also includes the left out groups for individuals who've been receiving social security who are only receiving half of what they were entitled to. It also changes the shared work program by ensuring that the three months goes to, uh, rather than uh, 12 months, it goes to 90 days. We're also including the reemployment training program and minor changes to the UI program. 
Mr. Speaker and members, as I stated earlier, this is a good bill. However, we had some challenges. Those challenges included by not allowing us to continue to support workplace benefits. This bill does not include the paid family medical leave. It does not include unsafe and sick time. It does not include rehiring hospitality workers. And it does not include some of the worker safety provisions in the bill. Although we're disappointed, we're not giving up. We did not also include the hourly workers, the school bus drivers, who have been critical to support our kids and ensuring that we include them in the UI will have been a significant win for all of us. Mr. Speaker, finally, we rejected the changes that were proposed for the wage theft. That will have been a step backward for many of those who fought so hard to get the wage theft in this bill. With that, Mr. Speaker, I would like to yield to Chair Eklund. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Representative Eklund. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Thank you, Chair Knorr. What a, what a great opening to tell how good this bill is. I'm going to briefly run through just some of the labor provisions that we worked so hard on this bill. And I, I might add, when it left committee, one of my committee members said, what you're doing is negotiating from weakness. Well, members, I, know we, I negotiated quite a few union contracts when I was in the mill. And we did not negotiate from weakness. When you take a look at when I run through these provisions, we took both GOP and DFL initiatives to this bill. That's not uh, negotiating from weakness. That's negotiating to get a good end product that we can all live for and vote for. Starting off labor standards, the bill includes funding for 51,000 in FY22 and 101,000 each sub subsequent fiscal year, which will enable labor standards to continue education and outreach, outreach activities. Apprenticeship. The apprenticeship unit will receive $276,000 in increased funding each biennium from the Workforce Development Fund to fund an additional full-time equivalent FTE to continue extended, expanded program activities and strategies to grow the program. The position currently funded by an expiring federal grant is critical to uh, Apprenticeship Minnesota's roles as a meaningful connector to drive greater participation and inclusion in registered apprenticeship. Minosha, an operating increase of 1.806 million each biennium will enable Minnesota OSHA to increase the number of safety and health investigators, investigators by 9.5 FTE. This operating increase will help ensure Minosha can respond promptly to complaints, conduct inspections, and address workforce, workplace safety and health concerns. Nursing pregnancy and workplace accommodations. This is a Kegel bill. Effective January 1, 2022, the bill strengthens workplace protections for expectant and new parents. It requires nursing and lactating employees to receive paid break time to express breast milk at work and ensures more employees have a right to request and receive needed pregnancy accommodations in the workplace. The bill includes $118,000 in FY22 and $34,000 in each FY23 and FY25 through FY25 for outreach and compliance activities. Department of Labor initiatives, uh, the policy provisions carried by Representative Frederick. This bill includes three of the agency's policy proposals. Apprenticeship at federal conformity, construction codes advisory council membership. It requires appointees to have expertise in their industry and occupation and as an energy member and an accessibility member to the CCAC. Child labor data protection. Certain personal data collected about minors in child labor matters is deemed private, not public. The purpose of this legislative change is to safeguard all minors who enter the workplace in Minnesota by preventing 
their personal contact information from being released. Contract recovery fund changes. The bill increases the frequency of payouts for the agency's contract recovery fund and the amount of funds available to homeowners who have suffered a financial loss due to licensed contractors' fraudulent or deceptive or dishonest practices. It provides for two yearly payouts instead of one and raises the maximum payout limit for each licensed residential building contractor from $300,000 to $550,000. The bill also prohibits spending or transfers from the fund outside of its statutory uh, purpose. This was a Mecklen bill. Fee reduction for the construction trades. The bill will save the construction energy $4.5 million in FY 22 and 23 by extending fee reductions for licenses. Work, work comp campus technology funding extensions. The, uh, the bill ex extends information technology funds remaining from the $3 million appropriated in FY20 for D uh, Department of Labor Industries Workmen's Compensation Modernization Program. Dual training pipeline funding appropriates $200,000 annually from the Workforce Development Fund to the Department of Labor and Industry for the dual training competency grant program. Under current law, this funding is appropriated to the High Office of Higher Ed Education for interagency transfer. The grants fund the related instruction com um, component of the Minnesota Dual Training Pipeline Program, which supports employers in creating competency and based dual training models where workers receive a combination of related instruction paired with on-the-job training. Uh, helmets to hard hats. This was uh, both Representative Fre Frederick and Representative Haley introduced the same legislation. $225,000 in FY22 and FY23 from the Workforce Development Fund in grants to the Construction Careers Foundation for the Hel Helmets to Hard Hats initiative. Funds must be used to recruit and support National Guard and veterans participation into the re registered apprenticeship programs training and employment in the construction industry. Uh, virtual canopy, this is a Liz Lagarde bill. $100,000 in FY22 from the Workforce Development Fund for a grant to Independent School District 294 for the Minnesota Virtual Academy's Career Military pa uh, Career Pathway Program with the Operating Engineers Local 49, leading to eligibility into their apprenticeship program. There's $1 million for a logger safety grant. Uh, the logging industry has taken a lot of uh, hits in the last year, and with new technology and that sort of thing, we're upgrading the logger uh, training grant uh, program. Sprinklers in existing public housing buildings. Chair Knorr, we've heard this bill several times on the floor in the last few years. Uh, certain existing public housing buildings must install automatic sprinkler systems that comply with the state fire code and state building code and be fully operational by August 1, 2033. Rural events, venues, uh, wedding barns, this is a Marquardt bill. Places of a public accommodation now defined as buildings with occupancy of 100 or more instead of 200 or more, sprinklers are now required in places of public accommodation including rural event venues or wedding barns at 300 capacity or more instead of 100. This change will provide clarity and consistency for the industry and remove an economic hardship without compromising public safety. Continuing education requirements for certified building codes, another Mecklen bill. Certified building codes, uh, certified building officials will now be required to take 35 hours of continuing education in a two-year per period instead of 38. And plumbing license exemption for, on certain commercial equipment, uh, Baker bill. It's an Ecolab proposal. The bill provides an exemption from licensing requirements for certain individuals servicing or installing a commercial chemical dispensing system or servicing or replacing a commercial dishwashing machine. Provides for training insurance and enables and ensures the devices include integral backflow protection. Members, this is a good labor bill, good jobs bill. Did we get everything we want into this bill? No, we didn't. We didn't get earned sick and safe time. We did not get paid family leave. These are DFL priorities. We were, we were successful, as Chair Norris said, in keeping changes to the, the wage theft bill that was passed just less than two years ago. If changes need, need to be made from that, then let's work on them. But we can't change a bill that's barely been, barely gotten started. So with that, 
Mr. Speaker and members, I ask for your support for this bill. We are moving forward with a good jobs and labor bill, and I will stand for questions. I recognize the member from Cottonwood, Representative Hamilton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to re-refer this bill back to committee and I ask for a roll call. A roll call having been requested, seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Hamilton moves that, oh, uh, the clerk will report the bill. I'm sorry, the motion. Hamilton moves that Senate file number nine be re-referred to the Committee on Workforce and Business Development, Finance and Policy. Yep, he did request a roll call. Uh, Representative Hamilton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I was honored to be um, assigned as a conferee to this conference committee. And as Chair Norris said, uh, we did a meet initially and in person during regular session, and we adopted the same and similar. Uh, then what took place is as soon as we addressed any of the provisions that had any type of controversy around them, we stopped meeting. In fact, Mr. Speaker, we did not meet, conferees did not meet the last week and a half of regular session. We had a lot of time left, and I believe that had we met, we could have came together as a conference committee and been able to get this bill done in regular session. And then, Mr. Speaker, during special session, we didn't meet, not once. And I know Chair Noor um, and Chair Eklund were meeting with uh, the Senate chairs, but the conference committee did not. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I was wondering, um, would the majority leader please yield for a question? Majority Leader Winkler, will you yield to a question? He will yield. And Representative Hamilton, if you could speak clearly, um, more clearly, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Representative Hamilton. Okay, Mr. Is this better? I'm hoping this is better, Mr. Speaker. Much better, thank um, you. Representative, Representative Winkler, um, you know, we've been seeing this trend take place now, and I'm not being uh, critical so much for one party or the next. My question is this, what's the point of assigning conferees to a conference committee if we are not going to allow them to participate in the conference committee process? Representative Winkler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Hamilton, uh, well, first of all, we don't have conferees at this point in time. The regular session ended without final uh, passage of a budget. And when the regular session ended, we then shifted to a working group format uh, to try to negotiate a final package of budget bills that would put into place the uh, bills that effectuate the targets uh, negotiated by the governor, the speaker, and the Senate majority leader. The working groups uh, had to come up with uh, bills that would uh, work through a lot of provisions. The jobs bill, for one, had an enormous number of provisions and a huge set of differences between Senate and House priorities. And I think the negotiators uh, have done their work to try to pull this together in the best way they possibly can. Uh, when we were reconvened on the 14th of June, which was because of the extension of the governor's emergency authority, the uh, process became similar to a regular session in that we came in and uh, met every day. We sent bills to committee. They had their first, second, and third readings, uh, whereas typically if we were in a uh, special session, it wouldn't even be called until there was a global agreement and an agreement to suspend the rules and pass the bills immediately. So we're in kind of a uh, hybrid session in a hybrid year in the sense that we're doing it uh, similar to regular order, uh, but we're doing it in a special session. On top of that, uh, we have uh, added additional hearing steps for the bills and have, are taking amendments on the floor and having long debates on the floor over these bills, none of which would happen if we were in a uh, regular session and these were conference committees. So the conference committees would meet in regular session, they would uh, report out and adopt same and similars, they would report out agreements and have those adopted by the conferees, and then they would come straight to the floor for a final vote. So there's a lot more involvement and process for a lot more members the way this session is playing out. But it's playing out this way only because we were guaranteed a special session because of emergency powers. 
uh, because the global agreement came in late. And as a result, we are trying to create as much public process and involve as many members as possible. So I don't know uh, in every case, in every committee, if every conferee felt they were uh, fully included. We did encourage chairs to try to reach out and include uh, conferees and working group members as much as possible. But as you know from your long years of experience, Representative Hamilton, sometimes negotiations have to be with a smaller group in order to get anything done because having too many people in a room makes it very hard to reach agreement. So it's not perfect from a process standpoint, but it's certainly, I think, as transparent and more open to more members' participation in the way it's playing out this year than it would under a regular end-of-session conference committee format. Representative Hamilton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Majority Leader Winkler. I'm just uh, very concerned on what has been uh, moving to becoming more of the norm where fewer and fewer people are making the decisions on the final omnibus bills. And I would just like to uh, make my point and say that we, every member, we need to all work together to figure out a way to, to correct this. Uh, because we all have election certificates. Uh, we all have just one single vote here in this house. And again, it's going to take every single one of us to be engaged to where we can uh, uh, basically change or correct this trajectory which has taken place. So again, thank you very much, um, Majority Leader Winkler, for addressing my concerns. And once again, Mr. Speaker, this is my motion. Thank you. Representative Noor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you, Representative Hamilton. What I know of during the discussion about this bill, we shared the conversation that was happening between the Senate and the House with you directly. Because we believe that we have to work together. But this bill has been negotiated. We've had the opportunity to adopt same and similar. At this point, there's no need to re refer this bill back to the committee. It's almost the end of the month, and we want to make sure that we are sure our public servants and the communities that we serve, we will get the job done. So, Mr. Speaker, I, I urge members to vote no. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the motion to re-refer Senate File 9 to the Committee on Workforce and Business Development, Finance and Policy. The clerk will take the roll. Members, please vote. All right, uh, will the clerk please call the names of those members who have not voted yet? votes aye. Bo aye. Christensen. Christensen no. Christensen no. Franzen. Franzen. Franzen votes yes. Franzen aye. Garofalo. Garofalo. Grunhagen. Grunhagen aye. Grunhagen, aye. Hamilton. Hamilton, aye. Hamilton, aye. Hassan. Hassan. Houseman. Houseman, no. Houseman, no. Hollins. Hollins, no. Hollins, no. Katiza Watoon. Katiza Watoon, no. Katiza Watoon, no. Krisha. Krisha, aye. Krisha, aye. McDonald. McDonald, aye. 
McDonald, aye. McDonald, aye. Miller. Miller. Miller, aye. Miller, aye. Miller, aye. Murphy. Murphy, no. Murphy, no. Ryer. Ryer, no. Ryer, no. Richardson. Richardson, no. Richardson, no. Schumacher. Schumacher. The clerk will close the roll. Oh, they didn't even call me. There being 61 ayes and 69 nays, the motion does not prevail. There are amendments at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> <clears throat> Jurgens moves to amend Senate file number nine, the fourth engrossment. The amendment is coded A6. To the member from Washington, Representative Jurgens. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. In this bill, there is a $3 million forgivable loan to the paper mill in Duluth to retrofit the, the project to support the conversion uh, to new paper grades. In bonding bills, when general obligation bonds are used for uh, something that would improve or purchase a property, that cannot be resold unless the bonds are paid back. This is not what this project is. This is not in a bonding bill, and this is not a general obligation bond. But I think that the same rules should apply. This is a private entity that would receive $3 million from the state of Minnesota. This will improve their business. And I think that it's only fair to the taxpayers of the state of Minnesota that if the current owner of that business ultimately sells the paper mill within the next 30 years, that they should pay back that $3 million. The way that the proceeds in the bill are written out is uh, forgivable at 25%. 25% uh, of the proceeds would be forgivable over a five-year period. And we heard in committee that if those provisions are met, that it could result, would result in uh, that $3 million loan being completely forgivable, turning it into a grant. So I, again, I just think it's fair to the state of Minnesota that if the owner of that business would then ultimately sell it, uh, that the taxpayers of Minnesota would be repaid that $3 million. Thank you. Any discussion? Representative Ag Eklund. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, uh, Representative Jurgens, for bringing this up. As most of you know, I retired from the paper industry, and if most of you don't know that yet, I'll let you know again. I retired from the forest products industry. So use all the paper you can when we're doing this job. I appreciate it. Representative Jurgens, I'm going to run some names by you. Boise Paper, Madison Dearborn, Office Max, Package Corporation of America. I retired from the paper mill after 29 years, I worked in the same building for 29 years. Those were the four companies that I worked for, in the same building, in either the oldest or the second oldest paper mill in the state of Minnesota. So we need to make sure that we can make this industry work, and this loan is gonna make sure that the paper mill in Duluth can stay functional. Members, Madam Speaker, I ask for a no vote on this amendment. Any further discussion? Representative Jurgens. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And, and I respect the work that you did, uh, Representative Eklund. And I think that the paper and the uh, uh, logging industry and the paper industry in northern Minnesota is a valuable part of our economy. I'm not disputing that one bit. I just think it's only fair to the uh, taxpayers in the state of Minnesota uh, to be repaid if the owner of that paper mill uh, or paper, the Duluth paper mill ultimately sells it. Thank you. Any further discussion? See no further discussion. All those in favor of the amendment say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. 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 
The no. motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Hamilton moves to amend Senate file number nine, the fourth engrossment. The amendment is coded A2. I recognize, I recognize the author of the amendment, Representative Hamilton. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, this is uh, the A2 amendment. Uh, this is letting Rosemont repurpose the $700,000 grant. And I uh, brought this up before. I believe this sets a bad precedent of letting money dedicated to job creation be used for local government for other purposes, and specifically for wastewater treatment facilities. So I simply ask for your support. Thank you. Any discussion? The member from Hennepin, Representative Knorr. Um, Madam Speaker, thank you, Representative Hamilton. I think we had these discussions when we were in session. The 700,000 that was uh, designated for the Rosemount wastewater treatment, if we don't use it now as written in Senate File 9, we'll go back. This is quite frankly supporting our industries who need the help, and this is a significant investment for that community, so I'll urge you to vote no on this amendment. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Any further discussion? Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of the amendment say aye. Aye. Those aye. opposed say nay. No. no. The motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Frankie moves to amend Senate file number nine, the fourth engrossment. The amendment is coded A8. I recognize the author of the amendment, Representative Frankie. Thank you, Madam Speaker. That is my amendment. Members, um, as you will see, there's five amendments here. They are all similar. Um, I'll just start off by saying, you know, Throughout the session, I look to make a difference. I look to see how we can find solutions to problems that we have and, and discussions that we have. And um, I also feel that we need to be deliberate in the things that we say and how we write law and how we describe and give instruction to others with um, what we're asking them to do. One of the things I found in my research this year is a section of law. It's 148E. 0.10 subdivision 20. 140E.10 subdivision 20 states what an underrepresented community is. An underrepresented community means a group that is not represented in the majority with respect to race, ethnicity, national origin, sexual orientation, gender identity, or physical ability. Now I find that pretty all-encompassing and, and I always strive to and work towards providing help and assistance to everyone in the state of Minnesota, um, regardless. And, you know, we've heard a lot of talk about the systemic issues within this body, within our laws, with how we operate. And one of the things I've been trying to address is, you know, how do we work on actually, you know, we talk about throwing money at issues. Well, let's talk about how we actually fix the problem on how the way our laws and guidance is given. And our words matter. So what I'm asking you today is, through this amendment and the others, is to just give definition to underrepresented community. Now, this specific amendment deals with an appropriation for Propel. Great organization. All these amendments have to deal with money or assistance we are giving to organizations to help people. I want to make sure that we're giving the proper guidance to these organizations so that they know, because we also know that no matter what it is, whether it's the legislature, an organization, a company, there is that unspoken bias. So I feel that we need to give them proper guidance, proper direction with our words within our laws. Um, we need to be deliberate um, with these organizations and funds and, you know, I offered this amendment on House File 970, and I want to thank Representative Vang for working with me on it and accepting this language um, at the beginning of this session in one of my committees. And uh, this is just something I'm going to work towards. Um, 
like I said, these are all similar and same in scope, all of these amendments. And I apologize that there are five amendments, member, but I did not one, want one to encumber the other. This is something that I, I feel we can do. We can work together to make sure we're giving the proper guidance to our organizations. You know, I'll say another thing, that in this bill, when it left this House floor, to Chair Nor's credit and our committee, we're trying to revamp a little bit of the way we hand out money through the Workforce Development Fund. And, and a lot of these earmarks were not in there. And now when it comes back, we have 47 new earmarks. So that gave me the opportunity through reading this bill and through all these separate organizations. And that's why this word comes up so much. So once again, members, um, you know, we're coming to the end of the month of June here and, and we all know that June is Pride Month, so let's take a little bit of pride in the work that we do and how we represent others. And I would like to request a roll call, Madam Speaker. A roll call being requested. Seeing 15 hands, there will be roll call. Any discussion? Representative Noor. Madam Speaker, uh, Representative Frankie, I really appreciate you bringing this amendment forward. But this is clear, you know, I understand the challenges that we have in the state in regards to systemic racism and so many communities that have been left out. This bill, the way it's written, is as clear as it can get. The department understands what needs to be done in terms of addressing the groups that you've already intended under that section. So I, I do have an assurance. In fact, I double checked with the department as much as to get the clearance, how are they going to interpret that section? And they've assured me that they are understanding based on the reference that you just mentioned. So this is already in without needing to provide the reference in the statute. So uh, Madam Speaker and members, uh, this is just uh, not necessary at this point because it's as clear as it can get and I'll urge you to vote no on all the subsequent amendments on the same issue. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Representative Frankie. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Chair Nor, for, for doing that due diligence and checking on that. Um, once again, I would like to ask you for a green vote on this. I think our words matter. I think when we're making these decisions, writing these laws, we need to be able to give clear direction. So I ask for a green vote. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion. Madam Speaker, my hand is up. Representative Lucero. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I just wanted to thank uh, Representative Frankie, and I apologize for speaking after you. I, I, I did not mean to speak the, the final uh, speaker on this on your amendment. Uh, Representative Frankie, I just, uh, the, the speaker didn't see my hand. So the few words I would uh, echo members is that words indeed mean things. As we've been saying repeatedly uh, these last several days, words mean things. And I appreciate uh, Representative Norris' comments, uh, but I, I respectfully disagree that it is not very clear. Because when I'm reading the language, uh, the language in the bill that seeks to be amended, it says historically underserved cultural communities. A cultural community members is very ambiguous compared to the definition in statute that Representative Frankie is seeking to point to. We know the definition of race. We know the definition of ethnicity, nationality, religion, et cetera. But the definition of culture is not any of those. And members, let me just put forward just a quick look up for what the definition of culture is. Now, this is not from statute. This is from uh, uh, the internet. Culture equals a way of life of groups of people, taste in fine arts, humanities, human knowledge, beliefs, behavior, outlook, attitudes, values, morals, goals, customs, etc. Members, none of those culture can be very different from neighborhood to neighborhood. Cultures can vary greatly because they're influenced by the other aspects that Representative Frankie is attempting to point to. Culture is very much influenced by ethnicity, influenced by religion, influenced by those other uh, diverse 
meanings. But culture in and of itself is very ambiguous. So I have no idea what an underserved cultural community is attempting to reference. But I take Representative Nora at his word that he says the department is going to look to the definition in statute that Representative Frankie is seeking to point to. And if indeed that is the case, well, then there should be no, no opposition. If that's the commitment from the department, well, then let's vote green on this so we can make it very clear in statute in what our meaning is and eliminate the vague and ambiguous reference to the word culture. Please vote green, members. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the amendment. Those that are voting remotely, please vote. Will the clerk call the names of all those members who haven't voted yet? Bo. Bo votes aye. Bo aye. Franzen. Bo, uh, Franzen votes aye. Franzen aye. Garofalo. Garofalo. Grunhagen. Grunhagen aye. Grunhagen aye. Hamilton. Hamilton, aye. Hamilton, aye. Houseman. Houseman, no. Houseman, no. Hollins. Hollins, no. Hollins, no. Katiza with two and. Katiza with two and no. Katiza with two and no. Kreshaw. Kreshaw, aye. Kreshaw, aye. Mariani. Mariani. McDonald. McDonald, I. McDonald, I. Miller. Miller. Moran. Moran, no. Moran, no. Richardson. Richardson. Miller, I. Miller, I. Richardson. Schumacher. Schumacher. Have all those members voted who wish to vote? The clerk will close the roll. Garofalo votes aye. Garofalo votes aye. So you'll have to add that to the total up there. We'll add one to the aye. They can still change your vote before you announce it. So 62 to 68. There being 62 ayes and 68 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Frankie moves to amend Senate file number nine, the fourth engrossment. The amendment is coded A9. I recognize the author of the amendment, Representative Frankie. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, well, I was sad to see that happen. Once again, members, um, we need to, you know, be definite in, in what we say around here. Deliberative, um, deliberate. Uh, so I will not go through the motions of another roll call. So this amendment, same thing, just looking to define underrepresented communities so that we give a voice to everybody and make sure that um, none of these communities are marginalized and 
This has to deal with the juxtaposition art center um, and some appropriations we are giving to them. And I ask for your support. Any discussion? The member from Hennepin, Representative Noor. Madam Speaker and members, these organizations are fully committed. All these organizations that we are talking about, they really serve underserved communities. So this is also not necessary. As I stated earlier, please vote no. Any discussion? There being no further discussion, all those in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. No. no. The motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Frankie moves to amend Senate file number nine, the fourth engrossment. The amendment is coded A10. I recognize the author of the amendment, Representative Frankie. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, once again, sad to see that happen in that manner and lose that vote, but I can kind of see where this is going, members. And uh, once again, these remaining organizations, Pillsbury United Communities, Project for Pride and Living, and uh, YMCA of the North, all with that language within their appropriation. Um, I'm just gonna let you know, members, that you know going forward, I am, and I would hope that all of you, um, when you see that word of underrepresented community, we remember that it's more than just one or the other. We take time to reflect on the decisions we're actually making and the directions we're actually giving. So we're making sure to give everyone a voice. Um, and at this time, Madam Speaker, I will withdraw the rest of my amendments. Representative Frankie withdraws his amendment, his motion. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Baker moves to amend Senate file number nine, the fourth engrossment. The amendment is coded A21. I recognize the author of the amendment, Representative Baker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, was that the, uh, I just want to make sure this was A16? Is that right? Oh, that one. A21. Thank you very much. Okay. Jumping around a little bit here. So thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Um, one of the reasons why I was supportive of um, re-referring this back to our committee, Chair Nor, was there was just a whole lot of new stuff in the bill that came back, obviously, out of the conference or the lack of conference, but the, the, the smaller group that uh, decided on how this bill is going to turn out today. And one of the things that I know that you were very clear about during um, our committee hearings this year, Chairman, is your desire to allow DEED to kind of work through those um, business grants and, and uh, support through uh, the process through DEED and not not direct appropriations. So what that did was it, it, we didn't get to hear a lot of, a lot of folks, a lot of businesses, a lot of nonprofits that have been awarded things in the past and it, it provided a lot of questions uh, for me when uh, this came back with, from I think it went from five direct appropriations from the original bill that left to something like 47, 45, 47, something like that. And a lot of those organizations I had never heard of. One of them uh, gives me uh, really kind of a, a bit of a pause because I know that there has been some, some cloudy background on it. And I'm not saying that they are doing anything wrong, but the background has been questioned. I. I have been a member who has consistently worked with folks getting out of incarceration to give them support, getting back their lives. Um, once they pay their debt to society, I am one of their biggest champions. But what I didn't know is this group and who they were and just having heard of some of the, the exorbitant uh, 
I guess, salaries and some overhead that they were doing in that organization, I wished I would have had an opportunity to ask more questions. So I, I brought this forward, really, uh, members, because I, it was a reason to question this. It's a reason to say we needed more of this information, and I wish we would have had more than just one informational hearing between the time that the tribunal uh, made the agreements and made the arrangements for this, and uh, we w I wish we would have had more information. So uh, we needed to do that more. Um, we need to do this better next time around. Um, I don't want to belabor this issue. I'm not suggesting that this, this organization isn't doing what they should. I just want to make sure we are questioning and deliberately opening up uh, the inside of their spreadsheets and their backgrounds and their, and their business models so we can do what you wanted, I think, Chair Nor, what you wanted Deed to do, and that was to vet them through. Um, again, I wanted to put more money into child care because that's one of the small reasons why people are not returning to work is because they can't find child care. So with this, uh, Madam Speaker, I'm going to withdraw the amendment. I just wanted to make sure I spoke to this because I don't want this to just be overlooked like it was no big deal. We have to take a look at these organizations, but when you don't have the ability to see who they are and open it up, uh, this isn't the way we should be spending a whole bunch of money in Minnesota when it comes to uh, jobs and helping people and those kind of things. So Madam, Madam Speaker, I'll withdraw the amendment. Representative Baker withdraws the A21. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Post and moves to amend Senate file number nine, the fourth engrossment. The amendment is coded A5. I recognize the author of the amendment, Representative Poston. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Um, I would like to talk today about ProStart, the program, and about our hospitality industry. Our hospitality industry desperately needs our help. We've been in crisis for the last 15 months, primarily due to emergency powers mandates and co or COVID mandates. Um, restaurants are in a new crisis now. We can't find enough people uh, to work in our restaurants. I'm sure all of you have seen that uh, in your districts. I'm sure all of you have heard that from constituents. I'm sure all of you have seen some of your favorite restaurants close. I'm sure you've seen restaurants that are open fewer days restaurants that are open fewer hours, restaurants that have reduced hours of operation, and restaurants that have much smaller menus because they're struggling to find culinary help for the back of the house, so to speak. Um, chefs are, are kind of like we've been talking over the last couple of weeks. Uh, it's a great career. You know, it's like many of the trades we've been talking about, farmers, welders, um, electricians, et cetera. You know, if, if, you, if you love food and you're creative, becoming a chef can be a really a great career. And ProStart is a program that works in our high schools to prepare students to be restaurant ready. Really, really important. It gives them a head start in high school uh, on hopefully a culinary career. Um, this program is supported by industry, um, and it should be supported better by us. Uh, the big guys out there that are in the restaurant business are doing just fine. It's the little guys that are really struggling through this new crisis. Um, and, you know, I heard Representative Nor, Chair Nor, excuse me, refer to economic engines a few times in his opening comments. And every one of these restaurants or bars or whatever the hospitality sector they're in that has closed, they're all economic engines. All of these that could close because they can't find enough help and they can't be open enough to keep their head above water are little economic engines. They hire people, they pay landlords, they buy food uh, from food suppliers, they out buy alcohol from alcohol suppliers, uh, and I can go on and on with that list. So they're all little economic engines. We need to get them fully open again. Not open part-time, not open fewer hours, not open with small menus, but fully open and operating and you know, 
seeing that full potential of that economic engine. Uh, this program is being funded at a quarter of a million dollars. I know that my amendment is out of order asking for, for that amount to be doubled, uh, but I wanted to bring this to everyone's attention. This is something that I hope we can work on going forward. Again, this is a great program. It's in the high schools. Schools are equipped for this. It doesn't cost them additional money. Most of them have the facility to do this kind of training. And we have a lot of kids in the schools that are currently doing it that are getting a head start on their careers. This is really important to hospitality. Uh, this should be really important to all of us because all of us have hospitality in our districts. And all of us, I'm sure, have been working with somebody or talking to a constituent about this problem. You know, I hope we can fix this unemployment uh, extension and, and get that behind us because I think that's a big part of our problem right now. Uh, I hope we can make that a priority. Chair Knorr, I hope when we uh, get around to next session, uh, we can spend some time talking on ProStart and, and maybe we can get some more funds behind this and get some more schools involved and get some more kids uh, pointed in this direction as a great career opportunity. Mr. Speaker, with that, I'll withdraw my amendment. Thank you. Representative Poston withdraws the A5 amendment. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Baker moves to amend Senate file number nine, the fourth engrossment. The amendment is coded A18. To the author of the amendment, Representative Baker. And thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, members, I wanted to again um, sort of bring attention to um, a bill that I dropped at the very end of session last session, regular session, uh, House File 2648. Um, and I wanted to try to address the issue that so many of us are having in our districts about this lack of employees coming through our doors to look for work. And I know you know it's real. I know you are hearing about it. I don't know how you cannot be hearing about it, but uh, the uh, intent of this bill was to basically use that same funding of the federal dollars that the federal government thought was so critical to pay folks longer periods of time and still that extra $300 per week to stay home. Um, and I felt it was a win-win to really move that money to the front end and to give folks an incentive to just let's get a job by July 1st, show us you're ready to go. Minnesotans love to work. We're the best workers in this whole country. And I thought it was actually a, a, a reasonable bill for as outrageous as the world that we live in right now with paying people extra to stay at home. It just does not sit with me at all. And so I wanted to take another swing at this, members, to allow uh, this conversation to understand. Um, I want to go through with the vote. I'm not going to ask for a roll call, but I'd like to just make sure that um, we understand the purpose of this to tell the governor and tell the people that can make this decision unilaterally, you can make this change even if you just were to shorten the extension of the unemployment benefits, if you were to do a different kind of a bonus structure, because this is a really good deal for employees. Again, the idea was if they get a job by, say, July 1st, which was my bill, um, and if they stay with that employer for 90 days and they were on the unemployment rolls by this period, let's say it was June 1 or June, July 30th, they would get a check for 2,000 bucks in 90 days if they stay with that employer for 90 days. Because folks, what's happening right now is, and I just heard this yesterday when I went to uh, purchase some uh, nursery supplies, um, and the uh, owner had just said, I, I don't even know what to do anymore. Yesterday, uh, he called back somebody who had applied online with this, uh, you know, the indeed.com site that so many of us know about. And he called back this person who applied online. And he said, yeah, we'll use the name Johnny. Uh, I'd love to have you visit with us about a job that we have. Um, and Johnny would say, well, I'm sorry, who is this? Well, this is uh, Blankety Blank Nursery. Oh, well, I don't really have any intention of working there. I just had to do this to get my unemployment benefits. 
And so it was directly as that. He had no intention of coming in. And so what I want members to understand is when we get that, we pay for that service. Employers pay for companies like Indeed and others to provide us with applications. We take time to really load up the internet with good information. What are we going to pay folks? What are the hours, requirements, all those things. And so we actually take a lot of time in creating those. And we do get leads. We do get calls. But right now what we are seeing, which we have never seen before, is people literally are just checking boxes so they can continue to stay home and there's nothing more we can do. So the intent of this was to try to move that ahead and get people an incentive to know this is going to end someday. And I think we can do better with this. So um, I hope you support the amendment. Um, and uh, I hope you understand the purpose of this. And uh, if you have a better idea, please tell me. The state of Wisconsin today um, announced that they're putting $75 million into hospitality recovery. That's going to help out the hospitality industry in, in the state of Wisconsin. We're always competing with Wisconsin. Minnesota, we need to do more. And again, because the majority here is demanding the governor maintain his emergency powers for more time, all I'm asking then for you to do is to tell the governor in this area for business relief, will you please just sort of shorten it up or do something different than just ignoring the problem and letting the time run out, which is going to be in September, not even knowing if this is going to be extended one more time, which I, I can't imagine it would be. So, members, I hope you uh, support my amendment. Thank you. Further discussion to the A-18 amendment. Representative Dreskowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Representative Baker, for bringing the amendment forward. Uh, members, uh, we see a lot of frustration. Representative Baker's frustrated. I'm frustrated. Employers in my district are frustrated. Employers in everybody's district here are frustrated. We have government policy that is paying people not to work. Mr. Speaker, what are people going to do when they're not paid to work? When they're paid not to work, what are they going to do? They're not going to work. We got the government at the front of a social engineering effort here. And Representative Baker's frustrating. Representative Baker, this is as bad of an idea as paying people not to work. What your amendment should say is let's stop paying people not to work. And guess what? When that happens, the economy and the interactions, the natural interactions between employers and employees will take over again. People will go back to work. They will work and endeavor to fill the freezer up, pay off their loans, and do the things that they need to do. But instead, this is another piece of socialism to combat socialism. This would put the foot on the brake and the gas at the same time. All we do is burn smoke, and then we'd have Representative Hansen bringing another government bill in order to clean up the, the smoke. Members, we got to stop this idea that government is the solution to everything that moves. Just throw some more money at it. Just develop another uh, policy that tells people what they have to do in their private lives or their interaction with their employer or their employee. This bill is full of this stuff. And it's full of a bunch of welfare as well. Underserved communities. I, Re Representative Knorr, I, I'd like to ask you later what underserved means. And I wonder who's doing the serving and who's getting served and what the serving's about. Because we don't know. And Representative Baker, I know you're frustrated, and I am too. This is just as bad of an idea as the one that's being placed on the necks of our employers throughout the state. We simply need the governor, this dictator in our state, to remove his foot from the throats of employers so employees and employers and employees can get back to work again. We should have a delete everything amendment for this bill that does simply that, Representative Knorr, and that would be the best workforce development bill we would have ever seen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.
I had Representative Miller next. Uh, Representative Miller, do you still wish to speak? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be real brief. Uh, uh, after I, I thank I thank uh, Representative Baker for uh, trying here, and I, I do really appreciate what Representative Drozdowski said. I, I don't support this notion, but I know that Representative Baker is trying to come up with solutions. Members, the the, the thing that I wanted to add is the very real stories that I hear. I have a restaurant in my district. I was talking to him about a week ago. I was there at the Capitol and he told me, he said, what do you think? We kind of share business ideas back and forth. And he said, he goes, I'm looking at just closing my restaurant for the next couple of years and then reopening when I kind of see the landscape and I'll redesign it and structure it in a new and different direction. And his primary reason for saying that was, is what you've been hearing all along. He had, he's had past employees that will not come back. He's had current employees that have recently quit because they were saying, I want my summer off and with unemployment, I can afford to take my summer off rather than work. This is not, this is not the dynamics that we need for the state of Minnesota. One of the one of the things, and, and this is a risky thing to say, but one one of the things that we talk about all the time is, is you know, we want to ensure that no one goes hungry. We want to we want to ensure that no one no one suffers, that no one has struggles. It seems like that's what government is becoming: is this giant dad that wants to just make sure that all the bad things go away. Members, the unfortunate reality is, is hardships drive people to become productive hardships drive people to strive for something better. And we seem to have taken that out of our system. And in, instead we've set up this system whereby we're having to come forward with ideas like this to say, we'll do anything to get people to work. You know why people should work? Because work is good, work is productive, and they need to be, they need to be making money for their family and for themselves. I don't think government has to prove to people that they should be working. And if we're doing policies that are driving people to that conclusion, that's a real problem. So, Representative Baker, I do appreciate the attempt. I don't like the direction that you went, but I know that you're trying to address a real problem that we're having in the state. Members, we have to stop incentivizing people from no longer trying. We need people to strive. The way that you strive is to have pressure put on you to do better, to be better, be better for your family. Now, we don't want to create those circumstances, but life has a way of creating those circumstances. We can't keep trying to cover up any struggle or challenge that people have, much less when government has created those problems. We can't have government then trying to fix it on the other end. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The representative from Douglas, Representative Franzen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. And I um, can empathize with the frustration that Representative Baker is going through as a job provider in the hospitality industry. Members, that this amendment that he is bringing forward is a reflection of the frustration that all employers are having around the state. The unemployment issue is a huge concern. Restaurants here in this area will put up signs during the day saying, well, we're closing early, we don't have enough food, and we don't have enough workers. Um, it's, it's something that I have never, ever thought that we would even be talking about today on the House floor. Government incentivizing people to not work. All around District 8B, you will find signs up on businesses hiring. My 14-year-old just got hired at a local a restaurant. He will be washing dishes. Members, he will be paid $11 an hour to wash dishes. Now, if you reflect back to your first job, it definitely was not $11 an hour. I think when I was in college, um, even in college as a student supervisor at the UMD kitchen um, and the dining services, I think I was making $8.75 an hour as a supervisor. 
my son at 14 years of age will be making $11 as a dishwasher. Wages are going up as well to also incentivize people to come back to work. $11 an hour to wash dishes. My mind is just, I mean, I'm just flabbergasted. I mean, good for my son, but also with these increasing costs, I also wonder how much uh, the businesses will be able to sustain the increased wages as well. Members, I too went back into the hospitality industry, not because I needed to, um, but a local business about 20 miles or 20 minutes away was short staffed and I volunteered, volunteered, haha, um, to uh, bartend for them every so often. Um, unfortunately I had to say these, you know, I was supposed to give my, my hours last week and through the fourth of when I could work. And I had to tell the job provider that I was not able to work because of special session. So that put them in a little bit of a bind. Um, but, uh, it is, it is just desperation galore out there. How do we get people back to work? You know, our economy is only as strong as our weakest link. And right now our weakest link is the fact that we don't have um, workers. So whether this amendment is the right approach, wrong approach that is for you to decide, but it is a reflection of the frustration that many are feeling around the state. So um, I thank you, Representative Baker, for for uh, trying to think outside the box here. I know this idea is something that Kentucky is putting forward. I think they're saying $1,500 uh, as a bonus if one goes back to work. There have been people working throughout the entire uh, 15, 16 months that haven't been on unemployment, that haven't received any bonuses either. So I would also uh, think about those people who have continued to go to work without complaining, but seeing many who are making more than them um, while they are sitting at home and now possibly um, getting a bonus uh, just to go back to work. So. It definitely is an unfair playing field, no matter how you look at it. But ultimately, we need to get our economy going. People need to get back to work. And um, I thank you, Representative Baker, and thank you, members. Further discussion to the A18 Amendment. Representative Noor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative Baker, for bringing this amendment forward. Members, we had a significant challenge of workforce before the COVID-19. And quite frankly, many people were sick and tired of dead end jobs. Jobs that don't provide a family sustaining income. So they moved on. They moved on to better jobs so that they can provide for their families. What they're looking for is an income that can provide for their families, a place where they can get family benefits to ensure that they can have a good living. This is not a solution to the problem that we have with the workforce shortage. The bonus for 2000 to, not, to only a few individuals does not address the workforce challenge that we have. Members, we can help individuals by reskilling them, by providing them with the tools that they need. This bill that we have will ensure that many workers, in fact, the Department of Employment and Economic Development is doing that as I speak to you. They're calling in individuals and asking them to seek the help that they need to find better jobs. And we will be able to prevail as we create better opportunities for all. So I, I urge you to vote no on this amendment. Representative McDonald, I see your, uh, your name popped up on the screen here. Do you still wish to speak to the A18 amendment? I do, Mr. Speaker. Representative McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll make it brief. I just, I want to thank uh, Representative Baker for the innovative uh, way and bill that would uh, entice workers to get back. I would have to say with trepidation, I'm not exactly sure if it's the right way, but it's on track. Right now we have employers, uh, and I won't uh, be 
uh, you know, continue uh, to repeat all what other members had said. But I just want to add this. Uh, we're all aware of the shortage of employees out there due to the fact they're being paid $900 a week to stay home. Uh, you know, we got close to 68% vaccination rates. We got herd immunity that is taking its natural God way form, uh, providing a, a, a natural way of uh, fighting this pandemic and the virus. It is time to get back to work. And companies, frankly, are doing just this without government intervention. It's the government intervention that is preventing our workers from going out and seeking jobs. For example, several businesses here in Delano are offering $2,500 sign-on bonus and good paying jobs, Representative Moore, good paying jobs that provide for their family, that will put food on the table and pay the rent or pay the mortgage, put gas in their uh, vehicles and uh, take care of their children. Good paying jobs with benefits. There's a couple trucking firms here uh, in the nation and in Minnesota that is offering, get this, members, $10,000 bonus to sign on so they can find truckers, drivers to move food. I won't say what company it is, but maybe I should. It would probably provide uh, some good income out there. $10,000 sign on bonus. I further investigated and in asking a friend who works for this company. I said, well, that's if they're there for a year. I'm sure they're not going to just give them $10,000 plus the 20 some dollars an hour to do the work. I think it's even more than that. They said, no, $20,000 sign on bonus once they're hired. He continued to say there's other companies that uh, are competition to that offering a $15,000 sign on bonus. Members, these are great jobs. Uh, I was up in Alexandria just last weekend, uh, Representative Franz's district for the national championship trap team that my son was competing in with Delano, who they took first place. The Perkins there had one waitress, poor, poor thing, one waitress for all that crowd. A couple of the restaurants were completely closed down because they didn't have workers. The Chipotle had no workers, so they closed down. A Casey's store didn't have fuel because the driver was not moving the petrol and delivering. We have created a state of emergency and a pandemic, unfortunately, with the results and the repercussions and the actions of politicians in keeping people at home and paying them. Uh, we need to end that $300 a month, uh, not in September, but today. Disappointed that that's not in the bill, that we couldn't get that done. So I support the concept of Representative Baker's uh, idea, and perhaps in the end it'll save taxpayers money because it'll entice people to get to work so they can support their families. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. To the author of the amendment, Representative Baker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. And I, I, I couldn't agree with all, I, I, I actually agree with all the comments made. Representative Draskowski, this was an absolute Hail Mary. Nothing short of that. Because we have a governor that's not listening. But we have a governor and a state philosophy right now that businesses are not important. They'll take the money, they want our money, they'll raise taxes any chance they get. But this was an absolute Hail Mary. And until I kept asking people, what's your idea then? Nothing was coming forward because I just knew our governor, who has the power to change this, wouldn't. So absolutely, this is a dumb bill. It's a Hail Mary. It's desperation because I think at least the employers whom I also wrote this bill with, large organizations like Hospitality Minnesota, the Minnesota Chamber, retailers, grocers, that's how desperate we are, is to put together a bill like this, and I put my name on it, as outrageous as it is. But it's important for us, folks, to talk about this. Every once in a while, you gotta throw one, and you maybe get lucky. But uh, we're in an environment that needs a more friendly executive branch that can make a decision now, so people can start coming into our businesses. Uh, Chairman Norr is right. Deed is making a whole bunch of phone calls to people saying, what are you doing? How come you're not working? What's going on? And they're giving them all the answers like, well, I'm applying, but I either don't want to go back because I can't afford daycare or I don't feel safe. Uh, nobody's really saying I can't afford to go back to work because I'm actually getting paid too much now to be off work. Talking to some Deed offices out in rural Minnesota, I have learned honestly with these people that have been very open and honest with us, with me, is that, you know, we get it. We understand. And there is no teeth in this law right now. 
Normally, when you have to apply for work, you got to show what you're doing. And if you get job offers, employers actually stood up and said, hey, we just, uh, we just offered Johnny a job, and he turned us down. Well, that normally would turn Johnny off of the unemployment. It's not that way today. So, folks, this is a different world we're in. We have got to get back to living and, and doing our normal business when it comes to helping people that have lost their jobs for no fault of their own. I'm a big supporter of our normal unemployment system. It has worked here for decades in Minnesota. We just got to get back to that as soon as possible. One final Hail Mary. Please vote green on this and a voice. Thank you. Seeing no thir further discussion, all those in favor of the A18 amendment say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. 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 The motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. Oh, I forgot to use my hammer. <clears throat> Draskowski moves to amend Senate file number nine, the fourth engrossment. The amendment is coded A14. To the member from Wabasha, the author of the amendment, Representative Draskowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, members, uh, this amendment would uh, change the length of the deadline to report work-related injuries to, um, to an employer for purpose of workman's compensation insurance. Um, I had a constituent that called me the uh, day before yesterday. Uh, she is a human resources um, person at a small employer in Rochester. And she said, Draz, um, employees have 180 days in Minnesota, 180 days to report the work-related injury to the employer under our workman's compensation pro insurance program. In South Dakota, it's three days. In Wyoming, it's 72 hours. And members, in 16 states, it's 30 days, including Wisconsin, New York, and California. 48 states have less time that they provide for this insurance claim or this report. 48 states have less time than Minnesota does. 45 of them have half the amount or less time, 90 days or less. In Minnesota, it's 180 days. Members, it's this type of policy we have in law that is killing business, that is smoking our employers, and is stunting business growth in our state. And we wonder why we're struggling to recover from the pandemic here in Minnesota. This is one other example. Members, I'm going to continue to dig into this area. This is an example of full throttle Democrat control over decades with their allied union representatives in the, non -pro in the uh, uh, public sector that have brought this forward and put this into law 180 days. And some states have 72 hours or three days. We're way out of whack here. I'll bring this forward as a bill in a future session, but I hope uh, I brought it to your attention. Uh, with that, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to withdraw the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Dreskowski withdraws the A14 amendment. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Baker moves to amend Senate file number nine, the fourth engrossment. The amendment is coded A16. To the author of the amendment, Representative Baker. And again, thank you, members. I, uh, I just wanted to take another swing at the bat um, and maybe um, talk about the jobs bill that everybody talks about every, every year, usually, if it's not every two years, with the bonding bill. You all know it's a jobs bill. This is a jobs committee. So when I heard uh, Representative Torkelson the other day visiting about how important it was um, on the housing bill, I think it was yesterday, if, if that was the one, uh, we need to take a swing at this, uh, the bonding correction bill, members. Again, and I'm hoping that, uh, you know, Chair Lee will have a chance to visit about this. I'd like to get his take on this. Because again, we're right at the end of session. Every day that we get some good news out of here, 
uh, we'll get things moving forward with the civil engineers, the mechanical engineers that are waiting for these projects to get moving. So we can get more people working, get them off unemployment if they're on uh, unemployment. This is a good bill that just needs to happen. We know it's going to happen. Let's do it today. Let's make it part of the jobs bill. So I really do hope that uh, Chair Lee will, will look at that in a favorable light. He's a good guy that I really enjoy working with, and I hope that he might consider it today on the jobs bill to get our bonding issues cleaned up uh, that I think most people agree with. So uh, um, with that, members, I am going to ask for a roll call, Mr. Speaker, on this. I want to do the, the uh, roll looking call. for a green. Roll call having been requested. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Thank Baker. You. Thank you. Mr. Speaker. Representative Wilgamont. Mr. Speaker, point of order. Uh, state your point of order. Mr. Speaker, under House Rule 3.21, motions and propositions must be germane. A motion or proposition on a subject different from that under consideration must not be admitted under its guise of its being an amendment. Mr. Speaker, the A16 amendment pertains to general obligation bonds and capital investment projects. It expands to the scope of the bill. It is a violation of Rule 3.21, and I respectfully ask that you rule it out of order. Advice. I have uh, heard advice from uh, Representative Wilgamont and studied the amendment. I find the point of order well taken. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Haley moves at Senate file number nine, the fourth engrossment, coded A7. To the author of the amendment, Representative Haley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The A7 amendment makes a minor change to our current workforce development fund uh, tax. This fund generates about $120 million each biennium by taxing every single employer in the state of Minnesota. At this time, what we all have heard today, we'll continue to hear this afternoon, the challenges that we have with our workforce shortages. And yet, this bill, I'll talk about it later on third reading, does not do a lot or if anything to address that challenge. But we continue to tax employers for workforce training. And yet, I don't think the problem right now is training. The problem is every employer, the, the bonuses and they will, they, the ads say, we will train you. They want a warm body to show up at the door and they will provide training. So my bill allows for a credit to be applied to employers that are doing just that. Instead of having the, the state tax them and pull money into a state agency and then go through a process of reallocating that money. And I want to give you an example. I bring this up again. I know I brought it up uh, in committee and I brought it up the first time we heard this bill. But just this month, one of the businesses in my di district announced an amazing program and an amazing investment. I want to tell you about it as an example of what employers are doing all over the state. This company is called Novelsdorf Electric. And they were sitting around their conference room table at Christmas time actually talking about uh, how they wanted to donate back to the community because they usually make decisions at the end of the year and what, how they want to give back. And the discussion went to uh, students and the short labor shortages and how they could really make an impact in the community. And they came up with a program that they branded called Operation Trades Awareness. And the company committed to $500,000 over the next 10 years. This is a small company in Goodyear, Minnesota. A Goodyear High School graduate who has built a business and wants to give back to our schools and our manufacturers all over our region. They will be taking eighth graders on field trips to introduce them to the trades. They are gonna give STEM toolkits to middle schoolers. They're gonna give learning kits for the summer to kindergartners. They're gonna pay for OSHA 10 training for any student in our region that wants to get an OSHA 10 training certificate. 
and they're going to give toolboxes, toolkits to graduating uh, high school seniors, and they're going to build a hands-on apprenticeship program. Again, an amazing commitment, 10-year commitment, because what the quote, what they said to me is, we can't wait. We don't need paperwork, we don't need red tape, we're not going to wait for the government. All we need is somebody willing to work hard. And we're going to put this money in to make sure that that happens for all the trades in the region. In 2021, members, the construction industry would need 430,000 professionals to meet current demand. 430,000. And yet, to Representative Baker's point, we're paying people to stay home. Now, this is a company that is stepping up in good you, Minnesota. So let's give, let's, the employers know how to do this. They're connected with the schools. They're connected with their workforce centers. They're connected with each other, all small employers. You know, they, they help each other, especially in the trades, right? The builders know the electricians, who know the plumbers, who know the welders. They know how to get this done. Let's stop taxing them for programs that we don't know if they're having an impact or not. So I really urge, I want to roll call on this, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I urge a green vote. Roll call having been requested. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Discussion, discussion to the A7 amendment. Representative Noor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker and Representative Haley. Quite frankly, this changes the purpose of the Workforce Development Fund, and I urge you to vote no. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll. Members, this is your friendly reminder to please vote. All right, let's do this. Uh, will the clerk please call the names of those members who haven't voted yet? Garofalo. <clears throat> Garofalo. Grunhagen. Grunhagen, aye. Grunhagen, aye. Hamilton. <clears throat> Hamilton votes aye. Hamilton, aye. Houseman. <clears throat> Houseman, no. Houseman, no. Heinzman. Heinzman. Hollins. Hollins, no. Hollins, no. Kresha. Kresha, aye. Kresha, aye. Liebling. Liebling, no. Liebling, no. McDonald. <clears throat> McDonald, aye. McDonald, aye. Miller. Miller, aye. Miller, aye. Morrison. Morrison, no. Morrison, no. Murphy. Murphy, no. Murphy, no. O'Driscoll. O'Driscoll, I. O'Driscoll, I. Richardson. Richardson, no. Richardson, no. Schumacher. Schumacher. Thompson. It's the same Thompson, one. no. Thompson, no. <clears throat> Garofalo, aye. Garofalo, aye. The clerk will close the roll. What? Heinzman, aye. Add that on to the total.
There being 62 ayes and 70 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. Mr. Speaker, point of parliamentary inquiry, please. Please uh, state your name and your point of parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's Representative O'Driscoll. Um, could you review for the body the process by which persons who are voting remote today can be recognized by the Speaker on amendments to be uh, recognized to speak on those amendments? Members voting remotely should be able to hit their uh, button on their... Okay. Representative Driscoll, I apologize for the delay. Yeah, so I, I believe you're asking a, a question in terms of how to be recognized. So just hit the uh, request blue button on your remote voting device. Mr. Rep Speaker, point Rep of parliamentary inquiry? Yeah, state your point of parliamentary inquiry. So if a member has done that and the Speaker doesn't recognize the member, but in haste moves to the vote, what recourse does the member have to be heard? There is no recourse, Representative Driscoll, but uh, again, I will do the best I can to uh, keep an eye on the board. And you are always welcome to join us on the House floor. Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, thank you for the uh, clarification, and I know you have a difficult job. I have been there myself, but I appreciate your willingness to uh, try to include all members. Thank you. Thank you, Representative, Representative Driscoll. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Baker moves to amend Senate file number 9, the fourth engrossment. The amendment is coded A19. To the author of the amendment, Representative Baker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the A19 uh, amendment, folks, is again uh, sort of the Hail Mary attempts to try to recognize an industry that has been beaten up the most, I think, of most industries in the state during this pandemic. Uh, what I'm attempting to do here before it gets called out of order is basically uh, take $18 million because that number came from the money that was returned to the general fund from the Department of Revenue that was set aside for business relief when Chair Knorr and I worked really hard on this back in December and January. We allocated uh, $220 million, about 65, 68 million went to the Department of Revenue as they had recognized that if these businesses with the certain NICS codes were down 30% from a year ago in sales tax collections, that they would fall into this category. So we took uh, 67 million there, we, gave, we took a chunk for our theaters and and uh, large convention centers. And the rest of it went to the counties, and the counties with that last bucket, we called it, uh, about 105 million, over half of it, went to the counties to give local relief. Our local uh, economic development offices and whoever they were working with, I think did a pretty darn good job getting it to the smallest little operators that maybe fell in the cracks but our local economic development offices actually did a really good job with that. $18 million came back from the Department of Revenue because they just didn't do the estimate right. So I felt that this $18 million was a reasonable number to try to circulate it back into the work that was intended by the legislature when we passed that bill back in December. And uh, I think that the bill intent here was, it was a two year, property tax relief uh, that Chair Marcourt allowed me to have a hearing, I believe, in the House on this one. Maybe not this one, it was the next one, excuse me. But and I've always enjoyed sharing these ideas with the Chair and, and he's been very open and I know he wants to help the restaurant industry. What this was was basically taking the property tax 
the general sales portion of, this, of the state portion of the property tax off of restaurants uh, that were uh, obviously negatively affected by the order 20-99 back in the day. Uh, and we were just trying to give them two year break for a property tax to the state of Minnesota. Uh, and that was the intent of my bill. So with this members, again, I am going to ask for a roll call if uh, it's not called out, but let's do that first, Mr. Roll, Speaker. Roll call having been requested. Seeing Thank 15 you. hands, it will be a roll call. I Mr. just Mr. wanted Speaker. to see, I just want to see the members who really want to kind of see how this is going to work out. And I uh, really do hope that um, the 18 million that came back to the general fund was intended to help people. It didn't reach its destination. And I'm hoping that this body will look at this in a favorable manner. And I know my good colleague from St. Cloud, I hope he, uh, he's gonna stand up and support this. So um, members, please get behind the hospitality industry. This is one of my last Hail Marys. We've got one right after this. So uh, looking forward to hearing from you, Mr. Wogamont. Thank you. Representative Wogamont. Mr. Speaker, point of order. State your point of order. Mr. Speaker, under House Rule 3.21, motions and propositions must be germane. A motion or proposition on a subject different from that under consideration must not be admitted under the guise of its being an amendment. Mr. Speaker, the A-19 amendment adds a new subject of taxes. It adds a new section of law, Chapter 275. It is a violation of Rule 3.21, and I respectfully ask that you rule it out of order. Advice. Having heard from Representative Ogamont and re having reviewed the amendments, I find the point of order well taken. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Baker moves to amend Senate file number nine, the fourth engrossment. The amendment is coded A20. To the author of the amendment, Representative Baker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last swing at the bat here, folks. This one I really did think was gonna pass. And this was the sales tax exemption for restaurants that has been actually in the pipeline for a number of years in the tax committee. Uh, restaurants are basically a manufacturing facility. They buy in raw hamburger, they buy in whole tomatoes, they buy lettuce and buns, and they actually buy them all separately, just like a manufacturing plant when they're making tractors. And when you buy equipment for that equipment manufacturing process, the state of Minnesota has deemed in manufacturing, you don't have to pay sales tax on that piece of equipment that's going to make more value of those raw products that you put together, and the state of Minnesota gets a higher sales tax at the end of the day. It's used already for a lot of other businesses, typically manufacturing. This is, this is real stuff. It'll, it'll help restaurants invest into new fryers, new wind ovens, new refrigeration, um, and in fact, the Minnesota Department of Revenue thought this bill was pretty reasonable and with a number of us, we actually got on the phone and we were talking about specifics. What would be included in this tax sales tax exemption and what would not be? So what we didn't include were things like silverware and dishes, but we were including things with stainless steel, chafing dishes for banquets and, and those kind of things, tables, chairs, those kind of items that you use to create a product from a low value to a high value was really there. I really was pretty optimistic. I know it had some hearings in the Senate. It did not make the cut. So members, again, this is a really good and important thing that the restaurant industry needs. It doesn't cost the state really that much money because you're, you're, you, we don't take in that much. This is not a big, big item. But for the restaurant industry, like a lot of other states do this, and like we already do with manufacturing, this is not creating some brand new thing that we aren't already doing. So members, I hope you can support this. Again, the $18 million is coming from uh, dollars that were um, um, sent back, were deleted. And I think that should have been uh, sent out, and it wasn't. So um, help me spend it in a way that will show the industry that they care, that we care. I uh, could really use your help on this today, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, and I will request a roll call again, Mr. Chair. I'm sorry, requesting a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Discussion. The representative from Goodhue, Representative Haley. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have to stand in support of my colleague, Representative Baker's amendment, and spent a lot of time with Representative Baker this year as we worked last Thanksgiving and Christmas on the first business relief grant, and, and Chair Knorr as well, a lot of time on those phone calls. Uh, so I, I know that you share this concern. I, I wish that the majority party as a whole shared this. This industry has been more impacted than any other industry from COVID. The hospitality industry has lost $10 billion, $10 billion in revenue in 2020. They were shut down by this governor, not just once, twice, I, and then under you know, numerous regulations that restricted their business. And yet in this bill, we are not doing enough. We are not doing enough at all. 58% of food service businesses and 57% of hotels remain in jeopardy of bankruptcy yet this year. And we have a $1.6 billion surplus. We've got $3 billion in federal aid. And we're going to pass a $52 billion budget. And yet we can't do these reasonable measures. Property tax relief. Paying property taxes when you weren't allowed to earn income. You weren't allowed to be open. Tax relief on things that you had to buy in order to meet government regulations. These are, this is common sense stuff to an industry that employs one in 10 Minnesotans. We do not do enough in this bill, members. Thank you, Representative Baker, for your tireless, tireless advocacy. One in 10 people work in this industry, folks. Please vote green on Representative Baker's amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Uh, Representative Wilgamont. Mr. Speaker, point of order. State your point of order. Mr. Speaker, under House Rule 3.21, motions and propositions must be germane. A motion or proposition on a subject different from that under consideration must not be admitted under guise of its being an amendment. Mr. Speaker, the 820 amendment introduces a new subject of taxes. It adds a new section of law, Chapter 297A, to the bill. It is a violation of Rule 3.21, and I respectfully ask that you rule it out of order. Advice. Representative Doubt. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker and members. Um, Mr. Speaker, I would encourage you strongly to accept this uh, amendment as uh, germane to the bill. I think it's pretty obvious that it is, and I would uh, encourage uh, my colleague on the other side of the aisle that we're planning to vote for uh, Mr. Congeniality in the chamber today, and you might help your case if you, yeah, it's not, it's not looking good today, so it might, you know, you might be able to do better, but we'll see. Any further advice? Okay. Having uh, heard from Representative Wolgamon and Representative Doubt, and having reviewed the amendment, I find the point of order well taken. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Oh. <coughs> List the guard moves to amend Senate file number nine, the fourth engrossment. The amendment is called at A15. To the author of the amendment, Representative List Lagarde. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, before I begin, I just, you guys know I don't talk a whole lot on the floor, but I sit and I watch. And uh, I see the passion, I mean, it, compassion amongst each other. Uh, yesterday was extremely touching. And uh, we're all here for a reason because we truly love people. And this amendment that I'm going to bring forward is one of the reasons that I ran. It is an amendment that is going to protect workers. Um, the, the, the straightforward safety provisions in this amendment have been narrowed to only impact petroleum refineries, which we all know that are critical to our society. They're critical to our daily lives, but it is extremely dangerous facility to work in. And that is why that we have to put in measures and criteria to make sure people have the proper training to do the proper job so people are safe, not only for themselves, but for their communities. Make no mistake about it, it's not that we can guarantee nothing will ever happen again, but we can ensure that we're putting our best foot forward as a state by putting these measures in. 
There's going to be other people to talk, and we all know that this has been in the House, uh, in the Senate, and it's got statewide news. And we're going to be having a discussion here. It passed, uh, an amendment passed on the Senate floor, 50 to 17. And then through discussions, it got pulled back. But 50 to 17, Democrats, Republicans, both in the House and the Senate, know that this is a real issue that we have to address. Everybody knows, and I identify myself as a John F. Kennedy Labor Democrat. But when this was brought to me by a labor individual, and he looked at me and he said, Dave, this isn't about union or non-union. This is about the safety of the people that work there, both directly and indirectly, in the communities that it surrounds. This is something that we cannot take lightly. And I know that everyone cares. Uh, uh, Representative Frankie, you've been a part of that conversation. You've been engaged with labor. I was disappointed. Um, I made an offer to the, uh, the companies. They sent an email. They did not join us. And to me, that speaks volumes to where they think this issue is in their priorities. It was made a comment a couple days ago that uh, Tommy Rucavina would be standing here um, yelling or screaming or whatever. I'll never be Tommy Rucavina, and I don't want to be Tommy Rucavina. I want to be Dave. But I am here because I care and I love for people. That's why I ran and that's why you ran because I hear you guys all say the same thing all the time. The passion is in each and every single one of us and this bill has to be addressed. And yes, it's probably going to have to go to conference and they may not concur. But it is our moment, both Democrats, Republicans, to stand together and do what's right for the people of this state. I hope you support it. To the Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, yeah, request a roll call doubt. vote. Oh, roll call vote? Yeah. Oh, uh, seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Uh, the representative from Washington, Representative Frankie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Representative Lisgard. Um, you know, I've been going over this in my head the last couple of days. I've been involved in this for a few weeks now um, on what to say how I can convince or give you input that's going to help you make a decision. So I have no notes because this is what I live every day. Um, if any of you watched the conversation that the other body had the other day, Senator Bingham uh, mentioned me. Um, I live stone's throw from the refinery. My businesses, both of them, a stone's throw from the refinery. My one business, probably from me to Dave over there, Representative Lizlegard, that's how far away their property is from mine. Um, so I not only stand in support of Dave and stand in support of this initiative, I stand here in support of my community. I stand here in support of those workers. You know, another thing I was thinking about, a lot of people don't understand, they don't realize when you're living next to such a high hazard facility. Now, over the years, from being mayor, city council member, state representative, I've had an opportunity to work with Marathon Refinery. Um, I will say that right now, it's owned by Marathon. A few years ago, it was not. And a few years before that, it was not owned by that company either. And a few years before that, it was not owned by that company either. The communications that we have gotten over the years have been good, bad, indifferent, um, and sometimes just downright radio silence, like right now. Um, I will say that since getting drastically involved in this, um, I have, been, have had uh, the refinery from Representative Hewitt's district reach out to me just yesterday. But the refinery that I live right next to, I have not heard from. Now, I'll point to, there's some things that, you know, going back to giving thoughts on this bill, and, and I know, and we all know, and, and if you haven't been paying attention, I'll inform you, there's a strike going on in my community with the Teamsters and Marathon. This bill, as I see it, is not necessarily about the strike. 
Would I rather have those trained and skilled operators on that side of the fence doing the job that I know they can do? You're dang right I am. There's times at night, members, now I don't know if some of you know what a burn is. The burn is when the, or a flare, it's called a flare. The big stack, when you drive by, I know some of you have been to my community, you've been down handing out food, helping on the picket lines, others have been down there supporting me. When there's an issue or an incident or, or something may have gone wrong, we really don't know what it is, that flare lights up and I don't know how high that flame goes, 100 feet, maybe more. All I know is I'll be sitting in my living room watching TV and this is how close I am. My entire living room lights up, lights up. And it was a, a couple months ago, but here we are in the middle of a strike. I don't know the quality of the employees that are on the other side of the fence. I'm sure the refinery will say that they're all trained properly and everything, but I start to have second thoughts, like what's going on? And I start to have that little bit of fear. Um, you know, it was just last week, members, so in my community, if, especially I say when we're new, people move into the community, every Thursday, one o'clock, in my community, the sirens go off from the refinery. And I have never thought twice about it. I've grown up there, I've lived there my entire life, and you just know, it's one o'clock on Thursday, the sirens are going off. But for the first time, and, and it kind of set me back a minute, for the first time a couple weeks ago, when that siren went off, it wasn't like, oh, it's one o'clock. My thought process changed to, man, is it Thursday and is it one o'clock? Because when that siren goes off, that means there's a problem. So that's the uncertainty that my community is feeling by not having the insurance assurances that we are not providing or making sure that the people of that community and the people behind that fence running that refinery and uh, are skilled, are trained. Now, once again, I gave you a proximity of where I live and where my businesses are, and you're all welcome to come down. I will probably be the one cooking you breakfast since I do not have enough cooks. Thank you, Representative Baker, for sticking up for my industry. There's one shout out. Um, you know, it's, and I will tell you that it's the workers inside that fence that make sure that, for one, everything is running properly and it's running safely. Nowhere in this bill can I find any information that it points to that this requires that they hire a union. Now, are the union guys trained? Have they been through this process? Yes, they have. But that's not the point of this bill. The point of this bill is to help make sure the people in my community are safe, help to make sure those workers are safe, Let's get back to the proximity. You know, the weird thing about this refinery, it's one of the smallest, I don't even know if it's the smallest in the nation, and, um, but just down the street, we have one school, just down the street, the other school. You know, it's, so we wanna do what we can. We wanna do everything possible to make sure that the people behind that fence are properly trained. I'll make one more point on that. Now, you can bring people in and hire them to run machinery. I can bring somebody in and hopefully teach them how to cook or walk away. But I explain it this way. In my restaurant or any restaurant I cook, I've been cooking there for years, I know my grill. I know that over here is a hot spot. I know over here is a cool spot. So if I need to get something done, it's all about timing, it's about rhythm. I need to get that food out fast and I need it to get cooked properly. It's the same thing, if not more severe, in an industry like refineries. Some of those guys have been there so long, 
they know where those hot spots are. Now I want to say that also in reference to we're hoping to get another bill passed, my bill, the fire safety bill, which requires refineries to have a full-time refinery. Now let's get back to the changing of hands of the refineries because it's not only about when a refinery changes hands, their ownership changes, their management changes, the process in which their culture changes, their ability or, or the way that they may work with the community, reach out to the community, all that changes. So you know what doesn't change? Those workers, because that's their job and they will go with the refinery. So members, I hope you can help me support this. Um, if anybody has any questions moving forward, I'll be more than happy to answer them offline. I want to thank Representative Liz Lagarde for working on this um, and, and just being a great partner in moving this forward. Thank you, members. The representative from Anoka, Representative Raleigh. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, members, uh, at the risk of um, plagiarism, I want to remind the body of something. The deal's the deal. We need to not accept this amendment. We'll send it back to the Senate to an uncertain future. We need to get the bill passed. We are not the Senate. Um, it was today, years ago, that I uh, heard these on the floor of the House of Representatives. And being a new member, I take a lot of notes, I read all the bills, I, I try very hard to pay attention to what's going on. And member after member has risen to remind the body that these are the negotiated bills and that we need not pay attention to the Republicans and the ideas that we're bringing up because the deal's the deal. So we've been reminded and reprimanded all special session not to break faith, not to enter into some of these bipartisan agreements because the deal's the deal. Uh, yesterday we heard about an amendment that Representative Nash brought up, and uh, it was brought up on the housing, and uh, we heard testimony from both sides. It was a great idea. It was a great bill. It was a great amendment. And it was something we should all consider. And as I've seen this entire special session, most people looked at their phones. And I, I'm pretty sure they were reading the bill on the phones to make sure that they were paying attention to Representative Nash as we were looking through the, the intimate details of what was going on. And I learned in the military intelligence um, branch a, a number of years ago that there's uh, something that you can do called the FUD factor, which is fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And I would tell you that there's so many good ideas that you've heard, and we've brought these up as amendments because when we were in these committees, we didn't get to bring them up. On this labor bill, what I heard was that we were gonna have another meeting and it was gonna be an information-only meeting. And Representative Munor, I really appreciate it. I mean, every time I've heard you speak, every time you've brought up these ideas, I appreciate your insight. I really like the way that you're approaching this because like you, we are trying on this side to do everything we can to help Minnesotans. And I appreciate the approach that we're taking to this thing, this thing being the legislation that we're doing. Whether or not you opposed or supported an amendment, we were reminded over and over again that the deal is the deal. And that we, if we do something about this, if we change it, uh, either even a jot or a tittle, and look those up by the way, they're actually real things in grammar. We were, we were told that it was gonna slow down the process and it'd have to go back to the conference committee. And now I'm asking why this is being brought forward. And I'm, I'm genuinely confused. And as a new member of this body, I, I would request or I'd ask uh, Mr. Speaker if the author of, this of the uh, amendment would yield to a question. He will yield. Representative Rowley. Um, Representative Lislegard, why would this amendment be brought up on the floor when it was stripped out of the Senate file and it's now part of the deal? Representative Lislegard. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker and Representative 
Where I come from, it's never over until it's over. When this opportunity came, I seized it. Representative Raleigh. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and thank you for the answer because that's what you voted against everything we brought up for the exact reason. No, I'm sorry, I'm confused still. And, and I know a little bit of this is theater, and I, I don't mean it to be too much theater, but we've tried very, very hard to listen. We've tried to learn from, from what's going on. We've brought reasonable bills. We've brought reasonable ideas and reasonable amendments. And I want to remind the body of what we've faced today. This is Amendment 1 through 21. Fail. 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 And then withdraw. Withdraw. Withdraw because we saw that it would be a fail and a fail and a fail. And then we were out of order. And then we failed. And then out of order. And then out of order. There's a pattern. And uh, like my dad used to say, I wasn't born, or I was born at night, but it wasn't last night. So I'm, I'm picking up the pattern that you guys are putting down. So let's talk about the workers. I get lots and lots of emails and phone calls asking about supporting the workers, and we do. Now I'm gonna tell you as a business owner, if I do things poorly to my workers, they're gonna leave. But we're in an environment and an economy right now where it's hard to get these workers, so of course we're gonna do everything we can to make sure that the environments are safe, that they're paid well, and that they're taken care of. I'm a supporter of the oil and energy sector. I absolutely am. I'm a supporter of safe workers. I'm a supporter of safe and environmentally regulated that are worker focused. I'm very much in support of legislation that is gonna help Minnesota. Legislation like the Line 3 pipeline. Legislation that's gonna support mining. Legislation that's gonna to contribute to the energy needs of Minnesota. Without the refinery industry, I don't think that our needs are gonna be met. We want to support the trade unions. We wanna support the workers. We wanna support safety and like I said, Line 3 and others. But we've been told that, we've been told, admonished. There's a lot of different words of, on what's happened. And you've spoken passionately about the fact that we cannot support amendments that have not been negotiated and are part of the deal. So, uh, Mr. Speaker, I would, I would ask one more time if the uh, author of the amendment would yield to a question. He will yield. Representative Raleigh. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, uh, Representative Lislagard. I want to know, have you struck a new deal with the Senate? Representative Lislagard. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker and Representative. Uh, the author is right over there, and I would uh, work out and negotiate uh, any time I could to make sure that workers are safe, and I would hope you'd do the same. Representative Raleigh. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So I, I, I don't know what to draw from that. I don't know if that's a yes or a no. So I'm going to have to draw the conclusion that you've not led me to, which is no. So with that, and because you've not renegotiated with the Senate, on behalf of the workers of, of Minnesota and on behalf of safety, I'm going to encourage the members of this body to vote no on this amendment for all the reasons that the majority leader has told us, that other members have told us. It's because the deal is the deal. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The representative from Carver, Representative Nash. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I will say, uh, when a freshman steals all your stuff, <laughs> you just have to make new stuff up on the go. No, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a quote, and it's, uh, it's Chair Hansen, and, and the freshman got it wrong a little bit, but he said, because I wrote it down, the deal is done, the decision is made, we need to get this done, otherwise it goes back to the Senate to an uncertain future. So that's one that we heard today, nice soliloquy. Yesterday we heard uh, both from uh, soon-to-be Chair Howard and uh, Representative Elkins, a version of, oh, Representative Nash, your amendment is so good and I agree with it, I agree with parts of it, he agreed with all of it. Uh, we talked about his love for the quadratic equation and then I heard the disappointing news that, well, 
there's a delicate balance. We have this deal with the Senate. Some might say with the devil, but we have this deal with the Senate, and we don't want to upset that delicate balance. So you voted my amendment down. So I'm counting, I think, at least three no votes from your side on this, because if you vote in favor of this, you are probably the most glaring hypocrite I've seen in, you know, a couple of days from your side. But you have said repeatedly, we can't put the, an amendment on because we have a deal with the Senate. Well, for those of you that are actually someone that likes to look in the mirror and say, I have integrity, this should be something that you should vote down. And for those of you who howl at members of the GOP party like you've stubbed your toe in the middle of the night over the temerity that we have to say, some of us, the right to work is a great issue. Your amendment is saying, well, the exact opposite of that. These all have to be union jobs. And this has nothing to do with safety. There are endless regulations around petroleum refineries, endless. I have friends who work in the petroleum industry. My wife is an industrial engineer. She's looked through page after page after page after page after page of regulation. But you are trying to be nepotistic for your union overlords to create mandatory jobs for them. And you are telling a private workplace, you can sit down, Representative Winkler, I'll, I'll back off. You're telling the, thank you, you're telling private companies that they have to hire a certain profile. That's reprehensible. And I, I just don't understand the double standard that you continually invoke under the guise of safety and this is important, but you're, you have this massive double standard and your measuring stick is not accurate. So if you've ever gone to a, a thing that they have these they set up in VFWs sometimes, or legions, and there are these tool sales. And you get excited, you're like, oh, I love shopping for tools, and I like to woodwork. So I went and I bought a tape measure. And whoever was, who was, whoever was laying out the tape measure, I think was drunk that day, because it was, it was wrong. A foot was not a foot. So it was not standard, and I, I'm measuring this stuff out on expensive oak that I was making something out of, and it was wrong. I'm using my new tape measure because I got it at a fantastic price. Turns out I ruined the entire, entire thing, had to go back and buy more wood. And what I'm telling you is your measuring stick that you have just been so sanctimonious about, well, Representative Nash, we can't take your amendment even though it's good because we have a deal. We wouldn't want to put an amendment on this because we would upset the Senate and we have a deal. We've brokered a deal all bow down to the deal, except when Representative Liz Lagarde brings his amendment for your union overlords. Look at yourself and realize that you should have some integrity on this issue. This should be an easy no vote for you for no other reason than you have voted down all kinds of amendments. Many of them you have said, well, it's a good piece of policy, but we have a deal and therefore we can't take it. You're prescribing a type of labor that has to work at a certain place. If we were to bring a bill, someone from over here, I don't know, one of the Republican members for a right to work, you would lose your mind. You're doing the exact opposite of that, Representative Liz Lagarde and you seem proud of that. You seem enthralled by the idea, and you're giving yourself a chuck on the shoulder. But your double standard is glaring. Your hypocrisy, once again, is rather odorous. And I gotta tell you, for those of you who have some integrity, vote no on this. There's acres of papers that are associated with the safety around these, these refineries. And what you're saying is that somebody who might come from another state that doesn't want to join a union, if they, have to, if they want to go and work in the industry that they've been trained to work in, now has to join a union, even though they don't want to. That's what you're saying, Representative Liz Lagarde. And that's outrageous. 
absolutely outrageous. So members, again, I encourage you to search yourself and realize that if you have some integrity, you will say, I'm voting no on this because, once again, Chair Hansen and others, I'm counting on you to vote no because you've actually lectured us about the deal. I'm, I'm looking on the board for your red votes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The representative from Carleton, Representative Sundin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you, Representative Melissa Gard, for bringing up, uh, this amendment up. I'd like to offer a couple different perspectives uh, uh, on this amendment here. Uh, about three years ago, we had uh, Chair Hornstein speaking to a uh, refinery explosion up in Superior, Wisconsin, just miles away from my home, and uh, there was a, a potential for catastrophic environmental damage. And he was passionate about uh, uh, revisiting some of the storage uh, protocol on, in refineries. And uh, I don't know where that actually ended up, but uh, that refinery is being re rebuilt right now. And, uh, but when the explosion did occur, a friend of mine, Bob, was just leaving the break room, going back to his work area. The explosion occurred. He was injured. He'll never work again. He'll never work again. He'll be on workman's comp or a settlement or whatever it takes. But uh, there's one productive worker. He was well trained, actually, but uh, it got him from behind. There's nothing they could do about it. But there are, are things we can do about uh, uh, workplace safety, particularly in, in those refineries. I speak from personal experience. I've been in that refinery. I've worked there. I've worked in other industrial settings. And the best safety device that I can think of is the person that's working next to me. If he's trained as well as I am, I feel a lot safer. I was in a work situation one time where I was in a tunnel, uh, about a 54-inch tunnel, about 200 feet in. It was dammed off. This is a fresh water supply for this facility. And it was dammed off to keep it dry, air, more, uh, air pouring through it, uh, we're using some really uh, caustic uh, material inside that pipe. So we had all the safety protocol. We had uh, oxygen sensors. We had fresh air pumping through. We had uh, ropes tied to our uh, bodies um, just in case there was a, a failure of some sort. So nothing could go wrong. The only thing that could go wrong is if there was a power failure and everything shut down. Well, Murphy's Law kicked in. I was 200 feet in with a partner, and the lights went out, the fans went off, and my buddy Pete, he said, uh, Mike, uh, what, what happened? There's some loud crashes. What happened? I, I says, well, we lost our power. We're going to lose our air. And if we don't get out of here in time, that uh, dam is going to break, and we're going to be flooded out. Let's get the hell out of here. He goes, yeah, man, let's go. So uh, as we were crawling out of this tube 200 feet out, there was a man up on top hoisting the ropes or, uh, that were tied off to us and got us out of there. That's a trusted work friend. I knew he was there. That's the best safety device I've ever seen is a, a trusted workmate. But uh, anyway, there was uh, no environmental damage with that uh, initial blast. Uh, we came out of that uh, threatening situation okay because we were well trained. Okay, uh, these are all dangerous settings. We need to make them as safe as possible for our workers. But that's not the only uh, consideration. A number of years ago in industrial settings, the contractors that we all deal with and uh, work on our facilities switched their uh, uh, bidding practices and the comp companies that hired them. It's not always the lowest bid. You have to have a safety record. So the company that's hiring you isn't uh, tied into the liability issues with you and your workers. So uh, this is a good measure for our contractors. It's going to put money in their pockets. It's going to keep their workers safe. So I don't know what it takes to make people realize that we can do business in a better way. These 
refineries, these industrial settings are so very, very dangerous. Every pipe, every vessel you look at is either hot, pressurized, or uh, caustic or uh, dangerous chemicals within. There are no paper cuts in refineries. When there's an injury, it's a serious injury. And I don't want to see Representative Lessigard's constituency injured, any, anyone in, injured in the state of Minnesota. If this measure, this amendment goes on, is observed and practiced, we have worker safety in all of our refineries in the state of Minnesota. Thank you, Representative Lissagard. Again, the best safety device is a well-trained work partner. Thank you. The representative from Hennepin, Representative Robbins. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Um, I rise in opposition to the Liz Lagarde Amendment, and I um, have a couple points I'd like to make. First of all, with regard to your discussion, Representative Sundin, about safety, and has been, as has been mentioned by some other members, this amendment really is not about safety. This amendment is about requiring contractors to have, who can work at refineries to have registered apprenticeship programs. Anyone who works at a refinery has to be a licensed contractor and have fulfilled all the safety requirements of that license. So the workers are licensed. So this is just about an added layer of they have to be licensed and they have to have a registered apprenticeship program. It's not about the safety, it's not about the license. That's, that's there, status quo. So that's not um, really relevant to whether or not this amendment is necessary. And secondly, um, as regards safety, even licensed union apprenticeship program trained contractors can still have a mistake. And that was what happened when there was the gas explosion at Minnehaha Academy members. That was a union contractor, local 455, who was very well trained. I have the NTSB uh, accident report right here and I could read to you from it, but it honestly is fairly upsetting. Um, and I'm, I, I just encourage you to read that because that was a licensed union contractor with an apprenticeship program and mistakes happen and it's unfortunate. And the refinery you referenced in Superior, that was not the mistake of a pipe fitter or a contractor. That was because there was erosion that caused a hole in a valve. And that was um, from a study uh, by the US Chemical Safety Hazard uh, Board. So, so that was a different issue that caused that explosion. So I just wanna make sure we're talking about apples to apples here. Um, but if Representative Liz Lagarde would uh, yield for a question, thank you. He will yield, Representative Robbins. Thank you. But my bigger concern about this, members, is that it's um, going to be found uh, to have been struck down already. So Representative Liz Lagarde, are you aware of uh, Eighth Circuit decision dealing with a similar uh, statute that Minnesota had back in 2001? Representative Lisselgard. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Speaker, and no, I am not. Um, but I would like to address um, your comment about mistakes happening. You called out a, a union member. It doesn't matter if you're union or, or, or non-union. You want the best training possible. That's what this is about. It's not about union versus non uh, un union versus non-union. It is about putting in place measures that we can track to make sure people have the best training to put our best foot forward to exactly what Representative Sundin said. You want the person next to you to know that he's going to use the right tool for the right job. That's what this is about. So I don't know whatever you're referring to. There's probably a, lots of lawyers in here that they probably could look that up. I'm not one of them, and I didn't stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. But I will tell you that this truly is about worker safety, taking care of it. And if we can't do this and you don't want to support this amendment, that is your choice. But it is our moment on this floor, Democrats and Republicans, to come together and show that you truly care about people and communities. Representative Robbins. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Representative Lagarde. I really do care about safety. I absolutely do. And as I already stated, this amendment has nothing to do with safety because the license requirements for all contractors at refineries are already in place. So they're already licensed to fulfill the safety requirements. This is just adding an additional layer to also require them to have registered apprenticeship programs. And right now, that's a voluntary thing in our state that's worked very well. And so this is just an added barrier, and I don't think we need that to have safety. But, but to my point about the Eighth Circuit members, um, so many years ago, I worked on ERISA law. It was a long time ago. I'm not an expert by any stretch of the imagination. When I heard about this, it, it made me think about preemption, which is, I think, as everyone knows, the, the main um, power of ERISA. And so uh, I looked into it, and back in 2001, the Eighth Circuit um, made a decision about a law that Minnesota had in the statutes that they overturned that was almost exactly on point for this. So I've got the decision here in front of me and I'm just gonna read for a, a quick minute what the Eighth Circuit found. So it says that um, referring to the statute that they were considering, it says one of the statutory provisions of the sprinkler filter licensing statute was the requirement that only licensed journeymen and registered apprentices could perform the fire protection work. The law required apprentices to be actively enrolled in a registered apprenticeship program and registered with a federal or state agency that approved the apprenticeship programs. Representative Liz Lagarde's amendment does exactly that. I will not read you it, but you can refer to the amendment yourself in lines 113 to 118. It does exactly that. So, so we're running afoul of the Eighth Circuit here. The other thing that the circuit found was that the Minnesota statute and rules do more than merely encourage or provide economic incentives to contractors to hire apprentices who are registered in approved programs. The Minnesota statute and rules absolutely demand it, which is exactly what Representative Liz Lagarde's amendment does. It absolutely requires it. So members, this will be found in violation of this 2001 statute, which is still the precedent. So I have a lot of other stuff here I could talk about, but that's the main point, members, is that it has nothing to do with safety because the contractors have to be licensed and meet all the safety requirements. And it's in violation of the existing precedent from the Eighth Circuit. Thank you, members. Vote no. The representative from Washington, Representative Jurgens. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And after listening to Representative Frankie, I'm not sure if there's much I can add to this. Uh, as most of you know, Representative Frankie and I are from the same Senate district. He's got the A side and I have the B side. And when I go to the Park Cafe to get chicken, I drive past the refinery and see the workers that are on strike. When I drive past the Super America gas station, I see them out there. When I drive in here to the Capitol on Highway 61, I see them on the overpass. Those workers want to be working. They want to be back on their jobs. Now, Somebody said that the, the workers that are there um, are trained, and, and I'm sure that's true, but they don't have the institutional knowledge that Representative Frankie talked about, 10 years in the facility, 20, some, maybe even 30 years at that same facility where they actually know the ins and outs. Now, my house isn't as close as Representative Frankie's is, and, and he's right. I mean, if you step out the back door of his cafe. I don't have a very good arm anymore, but I know I could throw a rock into the refinery property. It's that close. And while I can't see the, uh, the stacks when they're, when they're flaring from my house, I have employees that live in my side of the district too. They've been contacting me. Now, I don't honestly know if the language in this bill is the exact right language, but I think it's something that we need to do. I think we need to get guys like 
that have contacted me, guys like Craig, Darren, Randy, Chris, Brian, and John, those are all employees of the refinery that have contacted me about this. So it is a matter of safety. I don't know if this is the right approach or not, but I think it's something that we need to do. And I urge a green vote. The representative from Candy, Ohio, Representative Baker. And thank you, members. Just a quick question, I think, for Representative Lizagard, if he would yield. He will yield, Representative uh, Baker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, you know, I watch the business mandates and the labor laws and things like that. I, I want to make sure I read the bill correctly, Representative Lizagard. Are you saying that again? If you're not in a government-sanctioned and registered apprentice program, you cannot work at a refinery. Is, am I reading that properly? Representative Lissagard. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker and Representative Baker. There are non-union apprenticeship programs that meet the very criteria that you're talking about. That is a correct statement. Representative Baker. And your, your bill does not stop non-union workers from working at a refinery uh, for the safety level? Because, again, they all have to be licensed. But this is a kind of a very unprecedented state mandate. I just want to make sure I have this clear, because it looks like we're going down a program or a, 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 a tunnel we don't want to go down. I just want to make sure you're on the record getting that clear for me. Are you asking? Yes, Mr. Speaker, okay. would you yield again? And he will. Representative Lissagard. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, Representative Baker. You're 100 percent correct. It doesn't matter if you're union or non-union. As long as you have these apprenticeship programs put in place, there's checks and balances and oversight, you are uh, correct. Representative Baker. So, Mr. Speaker, and again, um, final, final question for Representative Lissagard, if he would yield. Uh, yes, he will. Representative Baker. Are there, is there anything, are there apprentice programs under non-union companies or non-union places that will do this? Because I want to make sure that I'm clear, because I'm getting maybe some bad information to make sure that this is really telling employers who they can and cannot hire for this. And I just want to make sure we're not, we're not involving sort of this collective bargaining unit language too much in, ingrained into state statute. So I need to know if that actually exists, Representative Lissagard. Representative Lissagard. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker and Representative Baker. There are programs all over, and if in this, there is a time frame and there is a ramp up, and it gives opportunity, if they don't have one, to develop one. It doesn't stop um, a contractor, whether union or non-union, to create an apprenticeship program. Anyone can do it. The criteria is there for them to move forward. Representative Baker. So they, okay, so I think I got it. They don't exist yet, but they're there to do it if they want to, is what I'm hearing you say. So again, we're going down a very, very slippery slope here. This is, does not belong in this state statute. I will probably uh, assume, and I'll take in more time, that not a lot of the industry was at the table when you discussed this amendment. Um, because if it was, I think that we would have heard a lot more too. Um, so I'd love to have that clarification because when you work on anything dealing with labor laws with unions, as I've learned, is we need to make sure that we have everybody at the table when we're trying to make any kind of statute changes like this. It's a really big deal. And so uh, I can't support this as well today. I think this is really going down the pathway that Representative Robbins was talking about. This is going to be probably uh, ruled out of order from the, from the courts. Um, and I can't do that because I'm in the minority. So anyway, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The representative from Hennepin, Representative Davney. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, Representative Frankie, I hope you're still on the floor. There you are. Thank you for your, your support of this measure, if I heard you correctly. But you, you, you inadvertently touched on a sore point with me. So I'm going to take issue with the sore point. I'm not going to take issue with you. You talked about the refinery workers in your district as being on strike. They're not on strike. That refinery has locked 
those men and women out from their jobs and chosen to put scabs in their place and endanger your community. That's different than a strike. Some days when my kids were little, we'd be driving around doing whatever. And every now and then we'd come across a picket line. And I'd always honk and wave in support. And they'd say, Daddy, what, what, who, who are those people? What are they, why are they on strike? And I'd say, I don't know what the issues are, but what I know is that there are people who are standing up for themselves and their families. And people who stand up for themselves and their families deserve our support. And the kids would nod. That's a far cry from a company that chooses to use its power to hurt its employees. Every company always says our most important asset is our employees until they lock them out and attempt to crush those families' well-being in the interest of company profits instead. And Representative Nash, you didn't like that Representative Lislagard's amendment tells employers who they can hire. That's exactly what we do to protect public health and safety. Capitol Barbers, the, the nice folks over in the basement of the uh, state office building, closed Fridays if anybody's interested. We tell them they have to hire only licensed barbers and cosmetologists. The local hospitals, we tell them that those registered nurses need to be licensed for what they do. Your side's repeated focus on law enforcement, we tell those law enforcement agencies that they have to hire licensed peace officers. We tell lots of companies, in the interest of public health and public safety, that we've got standards and expectations for who they employ. Because at the end of the day, we're all better off when we look after health and safety. And members, underqualified scabs don't do that. Vote green on the List Lagarde Amendment. Thank you, members. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The representative from Kuchiching, Rep Representative Eklund. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We kept this bill front and center the entire time going through our conference committee and our work group. I'm just asking members to vote green on this amendment. It is to ensure the safety of the folks that live in and around refineries. I've been to Representative Frankie's bar. Nice, nice place, Keith. It is literally kitty corner from the refinery. He's in the danger zone where his place of business is. Please vote, please vote green. The representative from Hennepin, Rep Representative Knorr. Did I? Okay, yes. Representative Knorr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you so much, Representative Liz Lagarde, for bringing this amendment forward. Members, this is about safety, not only for the refinery workers, but also for the communities around the refineries. We cannot give any more excuses on this issue. We've had enough conversation about it. When it comes to safety, it should be our number one priority. Members, it's always the right time to do what is right, and this amendment is doing the right thing, and we should be supporting it. I ask you to vote green. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker and members. To the author of the amendment, Representative Liz Lagarde. And, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the robust conversation um, with these guys. I know everybody's passionate, but uh, right results the right way is how I grew up, and this is the moment uh, for this body, both Democrat and Republicans, to truly put 
people before politics. You have policy, you have politics, and you have people. You can't have policy if you don't cut through the politics with the people in this room. Please vote green. Clerk will take the roll. Members, this is your chance to vote. Okay, uh, will the clerk please call the names of those members who have not voted yet? Becker Finn. Becker Finn, I. Becker Finn, I. Bernardi. I. Bernardi, I. Bo. Bo votes I. Bo, I. Christensen. Christensen, I. Christensen, I. Grunhagen. Grunhagen, no. Grunhagen, no. Hamilton. Hamilton votes no. Hamilton no. Houseman. Houseman I. Houseman I. Her. It's going to be ready. ready. Right there, Melissa. Members, uh, if your name is not being called, please mute yourself. Her. Hollins. Hollins I. Hollins I. Cresha. Cresha no. Cresha, no. McDonald. McDonald, no. McDonald, no. Miller. Miller, no. Miller, no. Moran. Moran. Morrison. Morrison. Morrison, I. Morrison, I. O'Driscoll. O'Driscoll, no. Morrison, I. O'Driscoll, no. Richardson. Richardson, I. Richardson, I. Scott. Scott. Bo changes from I to no. Bo changes from I to nay. Have all members voted that wish to vote? Her. Her votes I. Okay, the clerk will close the clerk will close the roll. There being 73 ayes and 57 nays, the motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Grossel moves to amend Senate file number nine, the fourth engrossment. As amended, the amendment is coded A1. Before we get to the author of the amendment, Representative Kosnick. Mr. Speaker, I rise for a privilege of the House. Uh, please state your point of privilege. Uh, Mr. Speaker, members, earlier in the debate, uh, there was uh, some distress, dis, dis, disrespectful words uh, used to describe many of our constituents. Under Section 92 in Masons, 
uh, it's appropriate Point to call order, to Mr. attention Speaker. disorderly conduct or disorderly words in debate. Representative uh, Dabney. Representative, order, Mr. Uh, Speaker. Representative Winkler, state your point of order. Mr. Speaker, Representative Kosnick is not rising to a point of personal privilege, as he stated. I didn't. You're correct, uh, Mr. Speaker. He's correct. I am not rising at a point of pri personal privilege. I'm rising to a privilege of the House. This body uh, must conduct itself in as uh, respectful manner as possible. Representative Davney calling our constituents hard workers. Uh, scabs is completely out of order. And uh, I think the respect that we treat each other with uh, also should extend to our constituents. And Mr. Speaker, uh, thank you for the time to uh, the privilege of the House. Representative Grossel. Mr. Speaker, members, um, the A1 amendment is uh, to put five point or five million dollars of forgivable loans program to remote uh, recreational businesses. Um, this bill is patented after a bill offered in the House of Representatives, in the U.S. House of Representatives. There are 11 resorts on the Northwest Angle, and everybody has probably heard about the border being closed between the United States and Canada, thus cutting off a section of our state, cutting our citizens off from being able to do business and letting, having their businesses thrive. Now, the 11 resorts on the Northwest Angle adjoining the islands, these businesses have been severely hurt by the closed international border with Canada because the Canadians will not let Americans drive through Canada to get to the Northwest, North, Northwest Angle. Customers cannot get to the Angle Resorts. One resort on the mainland of the uh, Northwest Angle collected a total of $3 in sales tax during the months of June, July, and August last year. That is how much business they have lost Due to, the, due to no fault of their own. The resorts in mainland, uh, however, they had a good year. And that was because the, uh, the people that were usually going to Canada could no longer go there. So they stopped in the United States. One of the businesses up there, you know, they're reporting 80 to 85% losses. Now because the resorts have been isolated from their customers, the forgivable loan grant program was proposed. The money would come from the Federal CARES Act and or the American Recovery Act plan. The bill language lays out the process and amounts that can be given to the, each business and family. The bill proposes a total of $5 million for this program. Now, if you're not familiar with with uh, the Northwest Angle, and a lot of people, you know, they're, they're not, and that's, that's all right. But the only way to get there overland is about 60 to 70 miles of roadway, a sparsely populated portion of Manitoba, from either the port of entry in uh, near Roseau, Minnesota, or War Road. Right now, they cannot use that road. They can bring groceries in for the folks, but they cannot do business. The only way tourists can get there right now is to go over 50 miles of open water. 30 miles of that, you cannot see land in either direction. And that's in the summertime. Or in the wintertime, you go over the ice road. Both are very questionable and very dangerous. As a lake in the summertime can become very volatile, it is the shallow end of the Lake of the Woods. It can become very volatile, very dangerous, if a wind blows up or a storm comes in. And if you're not in a large enough vessel, it is life-threatening. In the wintertime, you have to drive over the ice, and that ice is constantly cracking, moving, shifting continuously to where there are sometimes uh, holes or cracks that uh, you, could, you could lose a truck in. So these are, these are not the ways that, uh, to make 
People who want to go and visit the Northwest Angle have to get there. Put a little bit of risk of safety, of life and limb. So a lot of people are, are holding off. Now the Canadian government keeps talking about, keeps talking about uh, reopening, but even if they reopen, they're still months off of, they're still months away from letting tourism come through again, letting these businesses finally have a breath of fresh air. Now the effort to get this, uh, the border reopened has been bipartisan from the start. Urging Canada to reopen the border and allow tourists to travel to the Northwest Angle. Senator Klobuchar, Congressional members uh, Fishbach and Stauber, Governor Walls, Minnesota Senator Utke and Bach, Minnesota House members uh, Grossel, myself, and Eklund. We've all been in support and trying to work to get the border open because it affects everybody along, uh, along that northern border. And I know uh, several, uh, Representative Marker has made attempts to get some, get some uh, help to them. Senator Utke has attempted to get some help to them, but those, those uh, did not work. We can, we can complete this piece of bipartisan work to help the citizens of Minnesota, U.S. citizens, who are, who are being isolated due to no fault of their own because the Canadian government wants to keep the border closed. We can help them survive by reopening. And so what I did was take the opportunity to reach across the aisle like we're supposed to do. I asked Representative Noor, Chair Noor, if there was any chance of getting this in to help those citizens up in the Northwest Angle, to help them to survive. And if through just a brief discussion of, of working together, Chair Norris said, yes, we can do this. We talked to our leadership, got the things moving on the, on the front side of this. So from what, uh, from what Chair Norris said, told, told me was that this would be a friendly amendment to add on. And that we'd get it to conference committee and try to help get these citizens. And I gotta tell you, you know, the people that I went up there and visited last winter over that ice road, they're Democrats and Republicans, folks. They're citizens of this state. They're citizens of this country. And to do some, to do some bipartisan work to move this forward, it's, it's just the right thing to do to help these people who have only been, they've been shut down by not only the pandemic, but by uh, an international border crossing being closed. But I know the politics. I know the politics that will come about. We'll get this done. And I ask, I ask Majority Leader Winkler, I gotta ask you, keep the politics out of this. Let's do, let's help the people that, uh, let's help the people that up, uh, up there that need the help. Let's not use this piece of, uh, this amendment as leverage. Let's just do the right thing. There is a time and a place for politics, but we all know there's a time and a place just to do what's right. So I ask for your support on this amendment. I ask for a green vote. Further discussion to the A1 amendment. Representative Noor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you so much, uh, Representative Gressel, for bringing this amendment forward. For those who believe that we cannot work together, you are wrong. When Minnesotans need help, no matter where they are, or where they live, or who, who they look like, we stand up for one another. We support one another. Members, I commit to taking this bill to the conference because we have already done so. And we'll keep on working to make sure that we support Minnesotans like this bill is doing right now. And I urge you to vote green. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Speaker. To the author of the amendment, Representative Grossel. Mr. Speaker, 
Thank you, Chair Noor. I ask you for your support. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. No. The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. There are no further amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. <clears throat> third reading, Senate file number nine, as amended. Third reading. Discussion. Representative Erdahl, you're first on my list. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker and members. As we are concerned about jobs today, I just want to uh, raise concern about an issue that is particularly impacting us in greater Minnesota. Um, we have housing projects in greater Minnesota that are being put on hold because we can't get people to bid on doing the projects. And the reason is that the money allotted does not cover the increased cost brought about by prevailing wage. Now, I am certainly not going to advocate uh, today for making any reductions in prevailing wage, but this is an important issue. And I'm going to urge uh, that we bring together uh, people from the trades, union members, contractors, to discuss this issue in Greater Minnesota and what can be done to make sure that the system is adapted enough to allow us to get these projects done so that we can have more housing in Minnesota, in Greater Minnesota, which is certainly needed. So with that, uh, just wanted to make those comments. I do have some plans uh, for over the interim trying to bring some people together to work for a solution to this. Thank you. The representative from Dakota, Representative Berg. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. I rise in support of this bill. First, I want to thank our incredible chairs, uh, Chair Noor and Eklund, for the tremendous work they did on negotiating this bill. Uh, I'm not a fancy lawyer. This speech isn't going to be polished because what I am is a worker. And I've been a labor leader for well over a decade and a half. And those of us in labor would almost like to render ourselves obsolete. Because that would mean that every worker on every work site is safe. That would mean that every worker gets to take care of their family because of earned sick and safe time. Where they don't have to choose between caring for a family member or a paycheck or discipline. It means that we would have paid family leave for workers who need to take an extended period of time to care for a sick loved one. But we don't have those provisions in this bill, no matter how hard we fought for them. We have a good bill, but it's not enough. We continue to fight. Please support this bill. Thank you. The representative from Candy, Ohio, Representative Baker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I was, uh, I was going to go a while today because uh, I had a, a lot of things to, that I wanted to share with you about how we got here with our jobs program and how, again, I've, I've mentioned a hundred times how frustrated the hospitality industry is and for the reasons I wanted to share with you today. But I'm going to cut it short because, and I kind of came in this bill wanting to support the bill. I really did. There's an amendment on here that I really have some problems with, with uh, understanding this business mandate thing. That's a huge turnaround for me. I think this bill's coming back. So uh, members, I'll save my speech because I think we're gonna see this come back and I'll, we'll talk about why the industry got slighted so badly on a different day because I think it's Friday and I wanna go home. So members today, I wish I could support it, but I can't, thank you. Okay, moving right along. Uh, representative uh, from Sibley, Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Uh, yeah, I uh, have some concerns with the bill, too. I, you know, out in my district, too, I know uh, businesses, even my Dairy Queen. I went to go to the Dairy Queen one evening when it was so hot, and it was closed. And my daughter had gone there during the day, and she said that the owner of the uh, Dairy Queen can't find help and can't get any help. So, members, I think government can make things worse you know, uh, rather than better. 
I think we've seen this in healthcare. We've seen it with all the reforms in education. You know, they call, like in healthcare, they call it the Affordable Care Act. They really should name it the Unaffordable Care Act because that's really what it was. And I could go uh, on education too, but we'll leave that for another day. But members, uh, the other thing I have to do with the shortage of workers, bring an analogy from uh, my school board days, okay? Uh, you know, I, I served on a school board and they, um, we had declining enrollment. And as the enrollment went down, we went further and further into SOD, what's known as statutory operating debt. We were headed toward the million dollars at one time of, uh, of uh, statutory operating debt or SOD. And I used to say on the school board when they'd share the numbers about every three months, I'd say, you know, members, this is one of the reasons I'm pro-life. Because you, when you kill unborn children in the mother's womb, they don't show up in the classroom. And then we don't get the money we need to do the programs we want to get. Okay. And since I like to repeat myself, I said that a number of different times uh, during the years. Anyway, members, when we look at a workforce shortage, we have to understand that when we promote the killing of unborn children in the womb, they don't show up in the classroom. But guess what? They don't show up in the workforce later on. So whether you're pro-life or pro-choice, one of the things you have to understand, when a state and nation kills its unborn children, it's killing its economic future. And we've killed thousands of unborn children in this state and 63 million, over 63 million nationwide. There's an economic consequence to that, members. So if you want this nation to prosper, one of the things you should do is become pro-life. Because if when we kill these children, kill these unborn children in the mother's womb, there's a severe economic and even educational consequence to that. Uh, for that uh, behavior, besides the reprehensible side of it. Anyway, members, with over 47 earmarks, increase in spending, and some of the concerns here, I'll have to be a no vote on the bill also. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. The representative from Goodhue, Representative Haley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, there's a lot I want to say on this bill, and like Representative Baker, um, I might hold it because we're going to see this bill again. Um, but chiefly, I want to point out Minnesota's economic recovery is lagging behind 41 states. And this is a jobs bill, and it doesn't do enough to get us back on the road to recovery. I particularly uh, want to ask Chair Knorr uh, at a later date about uh, these funds and the amount of earmarks in this bill. I know there's been work from the department to reform the Workforce Development Fund. Uh, some of that reform is good and some met a against a a quite a bit of opposition. But we cannot let, continue to let years go by without addressing what needs to be done with that fund to make it more effective and to have some real accountability measures in how we're spending millions of dollars. And in particular, I don't know that we know of those dollars how many people are getting employed, how many people are getting certification, how many of those jobs are people being retained on the job uh, for six months or a year. So a jobs bill needs to be a jobs bill, and we need accountability for the money we're spending. And earmarks to pet projects do not do this bill justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The representative from Wasika, Representative Petersburg. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'll, I'll be a brief because uh, there's a provision in this bill that does talk about workforce development, and it's in my community of Oatana. Uh, our workforce development center actually had to close uh, quite a few years ago, and I've been working to get the funding back for that. This bill does have that, and, and I appreciate that. Oatana is growing, and it's got lots of new jobs, but we don't have personnel uh, that are qualified for it. So this should help very much. And I thank the chair for including it in this bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The representative from Douglas, Representative Franzen. Thank you, members. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So I found it very interesting that the List Lagarde Amendment uh, was attached to this jobs bill because every amendment that the minority has offered, we have been told, 
that there's been a deal. We cannot accept any amendments. Members, I heard um, one member say that when it comes to safety, we need to do the right thing. I brought forward a few amendments that would have allowed this body to do the right thing. And on a party vote, those amendments dealing with slave labor and child labor in places such as um, the Congo and Xinjiang, China, fell on party line. We are told time and time again that the, that the bills that we pass off the House floor are moral documents. Every time you had the opportunity to stand up for children in the Congo and people being held in concentration camps in China in order to uh, make green energy products for America, you voted against those morals. We have, uh, it, it appears that members of this body have the have the um, thinking of not in my backyard while the refinery issue is in your backyard. And so you voted in favor of that amendment. But when it comes to child labor issues, slavery issues, you said not in my backyard. I don't have to deal with this. I prefer the green energy over human rights. I am actually, um, I am just absolutely dumbfounded at, at what transpired today uh, with the Liz Lagarde Amendment. That's all I have today. Thank you, members. The representative from Kuchiching. Boy, that's, that's fun to say. The representative from Kuchiching, Representative Eklund. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The pandemic has been devastating for workers, families, and small businesses. It exposed numerous struggles they faced even before COVID-19 arrived, which the pandemic only served to compound. I'm incredibly proud of the bipartisan solution within our jobs and labor budget to help all Minnesotans experience the success and prosperity we all deserve. It includes strong investments in small businesses, recognizing the last that last year's numerous challenges. It delivers unemployment insurance for high school students who in many cases help put food on the table for their family as well as our seniors. It includes overdue workplace protections for nursing and pregnant mothers. It invests in workplace training and apprenticeships to help more people enter rewarding careers. It contains investments to enhance the safety in the workplace. It also leverages federal funds to help expand access to high-speed high broadband across the state. This is a key priority I've been working on for many years, and during the pandemic, we saw how important this is to our state. It's the year 2021. Members, it is unacceptable that we have pockets in this great state that still do not have adequate broadband access. This isn't to say there weren't disappointments in putting this bill together. During the early parts of the pandemic, people were repeatedly urged to stay home when they're sick. Yet too many Minnesotans in some of the lowest wage sectors already don't have access to any paid time off. Workers shouldn't be forced to choose between getting well and getting a paycheck. While they aren't in this budget, the fight for strong, earned sick and safe time Paid family medical leave doesn't end today, and DFLers remain committed to ensuring every worker can care for themselves, care for the family members, and have economic security. The biggest win in this bill for us, for the DFLers, is there was no change to wage theft. Thank you. Overall, this is an impressive piece of legislation that will help create opportunities for Minnesotans. It's a budget that has solutions for both businesses and workers so they can coexist and succeed in a post-COVID-19 Minnesota. Members, Mr. Speaker, I urge a green vote. The representative from Hennepin, Representative Daphne.
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And thank you to Chairs Eklund and Knorr for this bill. It's an important step forward because all Minnesotans deserve an opportunity to thrive economically, particularly as we come back from the pandemic. And Minnesota is coming back. The first quarter of this year, our state GDP grew at an amazing 7.5 percent. That's coming back, and that's coming back powerfully. I want to thank you both, Chairs, for the changes in our unemployment insurance systems, because it's key to allowing Minnesotans who have lost their jobs through no fault of their own to live lives of dignity and to be prepared and positioned to come back and thrive. You chose, frankly, my favorite approach. I call it the seniors and seniors approach. The high school students and the so Social Security recipients. They both get the unemployment insurance that they're fully eligible for, that their employers paid for, that their coworkers would receive to allow them to better live lives of dignity. Thank you for that. I will say I've got two disappointments. One, I know you worked hard on this, but you were unable to bring back the smallest of provisions, the one that says that tips earned by an employee in the hospitality industry belong to the employee. That's, in fact, what our state law says. They're the property of the uh, tipped employee. But some businesses, by no means all, but some businesses in the hospitality industry choose to take their employees' tips. Taking the property of someone else is wrong. And to employers in the hospitality industry who are having a hard time finding employees, I'd urge you to start by looking in the mirror. And lastly, Chairs, I appreciate the funding you were successful in securing to support small businesses recovering from COVID. It's critical. But there's a small hole in that. Businesses along the vital, and vi vital economic corridors of University Avenue, West Broadway, and Lake Street were doubly hit by COVID and civil unrest. In past years in this legislature, when towns like St. Peter were da heavily damaged by a tornado, we came forward as a state. When areas in the Red River Valley were flooding, we came forward as a state. We were specific and intentional in delivering the aid that those communities need needed when they needed it. We didn't say, well, all storms matter. Or, you know, all floods matter. We said, St. Peter, you need a hand up. We said, Red, Red River Valley, let's help you out. We say, hey, neighbor, this is what Minnesotans do for their fellow Minnesotans. I'm sorry that we came close, but that the businesses on those vital economic corridors weren't given the same respect and consideration by the Senate. I'll take what's in the bill as a down payment because I know that we as a state are better off when every Main Street is active and thriving, employing and selling and working. Thank you, Chair Noor. Thank you, Chair Eklund. I look forward to casting a green vote. To the author of the bill, Representative Noor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. 
Members, on this day, on this floor, to hear the statements, take your leg off our neck, was really offensive. Knowing that today was the sentencing of the former Minneapolis police officer for the killing of a black man, George Floyd. Words matter. What we say on this floor makes a difference. We can no longer continue to be blinded by our own statements. We got to believe that we can come together. That statement was made today on this floor while we were discussing this bill. We can't take it anymore. The fight for justice, the fight for equality, the fight to stand up for every worker will continue no matter where you are. In these extraordinary times, we're taking extraordinary steps. To be more inclusive to the essential workers, we see you, we hear you, we appreciate you. We didn't get the funding to support the essential workers for the time that they have done. They put their lives on the line for us. While we were able to stay at home and continue with our lives, they were on the front lines. Whether you're a grocery worker or a nurse in the hospital or any other essential worker, thank you. We did not forget about you. Rest assured, because we've been notified that essential workers will be made whole for the PTO time that they've used because they were never allowed to receive it. That they were never appreciated. Imagine a grocery worker helping us through the grocery line, but guess what? They can't even afford the food that you are purchasing. They can't. It's shame on us that we don't recognize those who have done the work while we were sitting behind. Can you imagine the emergency worker or the nurse or the healthcare professional, no matter who they are, can you imagine every day coming to this place and you see how the sparkling elevators were and every place that we were touching, the janitors who put their lives at risk to keep us safe? You will receive a benefit, and we will fight for you to the end and make sure that our leaders who made that promise keep their promise. Members, we, we understand the challenges before us. To supporting our economy means supporting every business, no matter where you, you are, whether you are in Cochichin County, from my friend's county in uh, Chair Eklund, for the amazing work that we were able to do, or if you have got a business on Lake Street. The time to invest, the time to develop an economy that works for all is now. Members, we do have a great opportunity. It's not that we're lacking resources, it's because we're not creative in creating those opportunities for who need the most. Like last time, as I stated, if we dream big, we can achieve big. And we can't continue on a path where those who need the most are looked down upon. The workers are the ones who make a difference. The employers need the workers, and the workers need an employer. That is a fact, and we need to continue to supporting our businesses, which we're doing in this bill. We need to stand for workers no matter where they are. This is a good bill. And if you are senior and a senior, we recognize you. We're creating that equity that needed in the UI benefits. To the young people who advocated for this, kudos to you. You have made us make a difference. 
to the hourly workers who work in the schools, I'm sorry we could not get that piece in. But the fight is never over because we will keep on fighting for that justice. And that's what we will plan to do as we continue to sit in this chamber and fight for every Minnesota, no, ma no matter where you are. I urge you to support this bill. Please vote green. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the bill. Ah, okay. Members, this is your chance to vote on the bill, so please vote. Okay, will the clerk please call the names of those members who have not voted yet? Kernhagen, no. Hamilton. Hamilton votes no. Hamilton, no. Houseman. Houseman, aye. Houseman, aye. Hollins. Hollins, aye. Hollins, aye. Cresha. Cresha, no. Cresha, no. McDonald. McDonald, no. McDonald, no. Miller. Miller, no. Miller, no. Pearson. Pearson, no. Pearson, no. Richardson. Richardson, aye. Richardson, aye. The clerk will close the roll. Becker, Finn, aye. Becker, Finn, aye. Adder, 71. There being 71 ayes and 61 nays, the bill is passed as amended and its title agreed to. Motions and resolutions. There are copies of the non-controversial motions at the House desk and online. If there is no objection, uh, we will take action on these motions first. Hearing no objection, the motion prevails. Without, without objection, we will uh, resort to mo uh, messages from the Senate. Message from the Senate, Madam Speaker. I hereby announce the passage by the Senate of the following Senate file herewith transmitted. Senate file number two, an act relating to state government operation. The message assigned Cal R. Ludeman, Secretary of the Senate. First reading of Senate files. First reading Senate file number two, an act relating to state government operation. The bill is being referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. Announcements. Representative Eklund. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This will really be brief. Uh, in International Falls, Kuching County, it's an end of an era. Newspaper that was over 100 years old is closed down. Its last publication was yesterday. For all of you that live in small towns, we need to watch and make sure that the source of local news continues and do what we can to keep our, our, our news sources operating. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Announcements. Rep Representative Winkler. 
Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> I move that when the House adjourns today to adjourn until 10 a.m. Saturday, tw June 26, 2021. Representative Winkler moves that when the House adjourns today, it adjourns until 10 a.m. Saturday, June 26, 2021. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed aye. say no. 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 The motion prevails. Representative Winkler. Mr. Speaker, I move that the House do now adjourn. Representative moves. Representative Winkler moves that when the House adjourn, the House is, gosh, it's, you say so many words. Representative no. Winkler moves that the House do now adjourn. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. no. The motion prevails and the House stands adjourned until 10 a.m. Saturday, June 26, 2021.